about this book. In the latest action-packed thriller from the award-winning novelist who writes with the pace of Lee Child, in the heart of Harlan Coben, ex-military bodyguard Ryan Locke plunges into the nightmare world of sex trafficking. When 14-year-old Kristen Miller goes missing from her quiet home in the San Fernando Valley, her desperate family turned to ex-military bodyguard Ryan Locke. Along with his partner, Marine Corps veteran Ty Johnson, Locke sets out on a journey that takes him deep into a dark, disturbing and violent world, where young women are selected, groomed and then exploited by ruthless predators. With law enforcement's hands tied, Locke dispenses his own brand of street justice as he tracks down Kristen, taking revenge on anyone who stands in his way. Will he reach her in time? 1. No one had called her pretty before. She looked away, not sure how to react or what to say. Then, when he didn't look away but kept staring, taking her in, actually seeing her, she looked down at the floor and kept her eyes there, studying the broken pattern of cracked linoleum next to the restrooms. You're really pretty, he repeated. His voice made her feel restless. It was unsettling and thrilling and a little frightening, all at the same time. She was hoping he'd move on, get his coffee and leave. It felt like this was some perfect moment that had arrived, and if he stared long enough, she would have to look up, and he would see that she wasn't pretty at all. Then the spell would be broken. And Kristen so wanted the spell to hold. Now she'd heard them she wanted to take those words home with her. To maybe believe they were true. That she was pretty. That she was worth a boy looking at. Hey, he said. His hand reached out, pinching her chin between the soft pads of his thumb and forefinger and gently tilting it up. She looked at him. Up close, he was even better looking than she'd thought when he'd first walked in. In fact, if anyone deserved to be called pretty in this place, it was him. He had curly brown hair and huge brown eyes and delicate features with a perfect white smile. Good looking enough to be in a boy band. If she'd had to pick another word to describe him, it would have been kind. Thank you, she finally managed, taking a single step back and lowering her chin again to resume staring at the cracked linoleum. What's your name? She told him. Hey Kristen, I'm Andre, he said. How do I get to see you again? This time she looked up. Being called pretty was one thing, but this question was too much. She glanced around to see which of the girls from her school were watching this unfold. They had to have put him up to this. It was the only explanation that made any sense to her. It had to be a joke. But when she looked around, she didn't see anyone that she recognized. Not unless you counted the mostly elderly regular customers and the two tired-looking women serving people coffee and donuts from behind the counter. I don't know, she said, looking at him. He dug a brand new iPhone from his pocket, the very latest model, released only a few weeks ago, and handed it to her. Here. At me, he said. It came as an instruction, and somehow that made it easier for her, although she didn't know why exactly. Suddenly conscious of her nails, bare and bitten down, she tugged her sleeve over her hand and tapped quickly at the screen, hoping he wouldn't notice them. He took the phone back. You maybe want to hang out some time? Sure, she said, resuming her laser-like study of the linoleum. Cool. Then he was gone. As fast as he had appeared. A mirage. Never expected Kristen to be heard from again. 2. Trust me. It's always the ones who look away or start staring at the floor like they're looking for change. The ones who look like they've never been given a compliment in their sad sorry lives. Those are the little fishes you want to scoop out of the pond. The others. The ones that are fine looking. The ones that look straight back at you and smile and walk off or tell you to get lost or look like they hear that shit all day every day. Those ones are no good. Always remember Andre, a hoe is born not made. Although they sometimes need a little shaping. He had hanger speech down pat. He'd heard it enough times. Like a lot of things that hanger said, it never varied. Not even by a word. 
Hanger had speeches for young bucks like him, he had speeches for bottom girls like Sooth, and he had more than a few speeches for his hoes. He had speeches for the police. Speeches for Johns who damaged the goods. Speeches, if it came to it, for a judge, although that had only happened once as far as Andre was aware. Hanger had introduced him to the game. Or rather for Hanger and men like him, to the world of pimping, which was the game within the game. Sometimes it got called the life, although that was more what the women called it. The life had its own rules, and it had its own language. Ducks. Swans. The track. Track hose. Carpet hose. An entire world within a world, what a bullshit sociology college professor would call a subculture. Andre didn't go out looking to recruit girls for hanger. He'd found that hunting rarely, if ever, worked. Instead, he just lived his life and kept his eyes open. He'd even come up with a name for what he did. He called it Pokemon Ho. Not Pokemon Go. An H instead of a G. Ho for, well, he assumed it was short for a whore, not that he ever used that word around the girls. Pokemon Go was this game you played on your phone, only you played it outside. You'd point the screen at things outside, and these little Pokemon characters appeared, and you could capture them. Just like a treasure hunt. And thought Andre, so was this. Only the little Pokemon hoes he captured were real, and he could exchange them for actual money. A lot of guys tried to find them over the internet, but Hanger had turned him on to the real-life hunt early on. Hanger was the last of the old school, and he told Andre he wanted to pass on his knowledge to one last generation. For a start, Hanger had explained, real-life recruitment saved time. You might talk to a girl online for weeks and get nowhere. But out here you could tell pretty much immediately who a suitable target was, and who wasn't. Andre thought of it as part science and part art. And for every girl he handed off, he got 500 bucks. 200 came up front, and the other three came after Hanger put her to work. If she was white, a swan, it got bumped up by another 500. Hanger also showed Andre how the pimping game worked. Andre had already seen the money that could be made from pimping. It was crazy off the charts loot. A single girl might be worth a couple of hundred grand a year to Hanger. It was almost all profit too. The girls didn't keep any of it. Not a single cent. Everything got handed over. Hanger clothed and fed them, bought them drugs and booze, but that was it. The rest was pure profit. At home in his mom's basement, Andre fired up a blunt. He spent the next few hours poring over the girls' social media accounts. With each scroll down a page, more and more dollar signs appeared in his eyes. Kristen was young and white, two qualities that made her worth a lot more out on the track. For a moment he actually considered keeping her for himself, putting her out there to earn for him. But he knew he didn't have the game required, not yet anyway. From what he could tell, his instincts had been right. She was ripe for someone like Hanger. She only had her mom and a grandpa. No father that he could see. Hanger had told him that girls without a father were easier to turn out. Plus they were less risky, easier to deal with if their family came looking for them. As he kept swiping and scrolling, moving back into Kristen's past, he felt a twinge of guilt pull at him as she got younger. He quickly brushed it off, reminding himself that this was business. There was no room for sentiment in the game. When he followed her on Instagram, she messaged him almost immediately. He didn't reply. He would, but not right away. He needed her to do her own scrolling, to look at his pictures, to start to develop those feelings that girls who'd been ignored their entire life always had. He pulled up the latest picture she'd posted. It showed her standing in front of a Christmas tree, smiling shyly at the camera. He copied the picture and sent it on to Hanger. I want two for this one, was the message he sent with the picture. Hanger messaged him back. Two. You must be tripping. Andre didn't respond. A half hour later, Hanger came back. She is fine though. I'll go to two but only if she works out for me. Andre smiled and tapped out his reply. Deal. 3. 
Ryan Locke perched on the edge of the couch and took the framed photograph from Joyce Miller. He studied the face of the girl in the picture for a moment. She had brown hair cut into bangs that almost reached her eyes and soft brown eyes. She stared out from the frame at Locke, her expression suggesting that having her picture taken was something to be endured rather than enjoyed. Locke didn't take too long over the photograph. He studied it more as a courtesy than anything else. He doubted it was the image he'd need to track down Kristen. Rather than risk offense by immediately giving it back, he handed it off to the woman sitting next to him, Angie Garcia. Mrs. Miller, he said. Would you have something taken more recently? Kristen's mother looked confused. She glanced over to Kristen's grandfather, who was sitting watchman-like by a chair near the window. His head turned towards them, his face angled side onto the street. That was taken last month, said the grandfather. I might have something more recent, said Joyce Miller, getting up and bustling over to a credenza. No, that's fine, said Locke, trying to keep the shock out of his voice. How old did you say your daughter is? She's fourteen, she said. Just turned. Her birthday was last month. Locke's expression didn't change. Inside, all he could think was fourteen. How the hell did a quiet, studious 14-year-old girl from a lower-middle-class family in the San Fernando Valley, a girl who had seemingly never dated and studied hard, a girl with dreams of becoming a nurse, end up in the hands of sex traffickers? And why had it fallen to the likes of Angie Garcia to find her? He kept those questions to himself, at least for the time being, and tried to focus on the task at hand. First and foremost, taking the emotion out of it, this was a missing person's case. The first task was to locate the missing girl. To do that, he needed as much information about her as possible. Joyce Miller seemed to anticipate his need. She opened the top drawer of the bureau and pulled out a slightly worn-looking tablet computer. She took her phone with her but she left this, she said, handing the tablet off to Locke. I don't know any of her passwords, but I thought you might be able to hack into it or something. That's great, said Locke, taking the tablet. He doubted he'd be able to crack the password himself, but he knew plenty of cybersecurity people who would do it for a fee with no questions being asked. If they were going to find Kristen, her computer was almost certainly their best shot. If it had her social media accounts, then it was likely a treasure trove of information. Teenagers lived their lives online. That had its downsides, but it also made tasks like this substantially easier. There was a chance that if the social media accounts on the computer were linked to the apps on her phone, which they almost certainly were, that they'd be able to get a precise location that would take them straight to her. He decided not to mention that as a possibility. Not until he knew more. The last thing he wanted to do was raise the family's hopes. But if everything went smoothly, he might have Kristen back with her family in less than 24 hours. When we spoke on the phone, you mentioned something about Kristen perhaps having met a boy just before she took off, prompted Angie. She was in love, said the grandfather, making no attempt to conceal the mix of scorn and sarcasm in his voice. Like anyone was going to fall for Kristen. Locke traded a look with Angie, both of them momentarily taken aback. A boy's never even so much as asked her out, her mom added, trying to smooth things over and move on. She doesn't get invited to parties or out on dates. She goes to school, she comes home, that's about it. Did she mention this boy's name or give you any details like how old he was or where he was from, said Locke. Andrew. Andre. Something like that, said the grandfather. You get a last name? He shook his head. She didn't really talk about him that much, said Joyce. But I got the impression that he was older. Maybe like 18, 19, somewhere in there. Way too old to be taking an interest in a girl her age. That's usually how it gets worked, said Angie. An hour later, Locke and Angie said their goodbyes to Kristen's mother and grandfather and walked back to Locke's car. As they were about to get in, Angie stopped, her hand holding the open passenger door. You still sure you want to do this? She said, staring at him. Locke paused. Even from the brief sit-down with Kristen's anxious family, he knew he was about to enter an evil world. 
he was hardly naive. Years of military service, followed by over a decade in high-end private security, had seen to that. Like most people, when he heard the phrase sex trafficking, it had conjured images of women spirited into America to be exploited. Or perhaps young women in far-flung places kidnapped from the streets, spirited away and set to work. What he hadn't been prepared for was a world that was, according to Angie, herself a former victim of trafficking, hidden in plain sight. A world where young girls and women, almost all of them American, were carefully selected and groomed, online and in real life, before being coaxed, coerced or outright forced into selling their bodies. Just like the first time he'd stepped into a real live war zone, Locke sensed he was stepping through a door into a place that would change him. He was old enough now to know that the change something like this brought wasn't always a good one. Yet if people like him didn't help Angie Garcia to help the Kristen Millers of this world, then who would? Law enforcement did what it could. But the line between a runaway and a trafficked victim was often a blurry one in the eyes of the law. And often the victims did not see themselves as victims, which made prying them from the pimps, if not impossible, then frequently thankless. Even when traffickers were caught, Angie had informed him when they'd first met, conviction rates were depressingly low. Victims disappeared or got cold feet or didn't want to sit in a courtroom and relive the months or years of trauma they were trying to leave behind. Defense attorneys had a bewildering array of delaying tactics. And more than anything, the trafficking business was driven by a sick but almost insatiable demand for product. One pimp was convicted and sent to prison, only for two more to step up to take their place. It was a billion-dollar business in a world where money often counted for more than people, especially people deemed by polite society to be disposable. Locke turned the question over for a second more. If he was in, he was all in. That was how he operated. The only difference with this situation was that he wasn't taking payment. Yes, he said finally. I want to do this. 4. The refuge halfway house that Angie Garcia had set up for former victims of trafficking lay on a quiet street in Sun Valley. For security reasons, there was no sign outside. Nor did the address appear anywhere on the organization's website. There were no pictures. A street view on Google Maps would only turn up the address, in an image of a nondescript two-story building that looked like a youth hostel. The dozen or so girls and women who lived inside were sworn never to reveal the location to anyone, not even a family member or close friend. A breach of the rule led to immediate exclusion. None of the women who had passed through had ever been excluded. They all knew, often from bitter experience, the consequences of one of their pimps finding out where they were. Locke had come to the refuge a week before Christmas to review their security. He'd got talking with Angie, and she'd mentioned that they also helped families locate trafficked girls and women, and always needed additional help. The more Angie had told him about her story, and then the stories of the women she helped, the angrier Locke had become. He'd returned home to the beautiful apartment in the marina that he shared with his attorney fiance, Carmen. It had been Carmen's suggestion that he do a little pro bono work to keep his mind sharp. Angie's details had come via one of the investigators that Carmen's law firm used. He'd agreed to review her security with no idea that it would lead to anything else, never mind tracking down a likely trafficked 14 year old. Yet here he was. He watched Angie walk inside and got back in his car. He pulled the tablet computer from the glove compartment and turned it over in his hand, wondering what secrets it contained and whether it would lead him straight to Kristen Miller before anything truly bad happened to her. One thing he knew from talking to Angie. The time between a girl being handed to a trafficker and being put to work wasn't long. Sometimes a few days. Sometimes less. It had seemed almost surreal when she'd told him. She had assured him it was how it worked. He looked at the time. It was late. He dug out his phone and started to make calls. There had to be at least one tech geek out there who wouldn't mind making some extra money on Christmas Eve. 5. Locke pulled up outside a storefront on a near deserted block in Santa Monica. Next to the storefront was a blue door. He rang one of five buzzers. 
He stood back so that his face was visible to the camera mounted off to one side of the doorway. Seconds passed before the door clicked open. He walked into a narrow foyer with an unmanned reception desk and a single elevator. He rode the elevator to the third floor and made a left. A petite young woman in her early twenties opened a door. She wore thick black-rimmed glasses and her black hair was tied back into a ponytail. Jenny Chu was an IQ off-the-charts tech Stanford dropout hacker used mostly by private investigators. She was popular because she was fast, reliable, and she didn't ask too many questions about the legality of what some of her hacking missions involved. Hey Mr. Locke, what's up? You make me sound ancient when you call me Mr. Locke. She smiled. You are. Thanks. You're very welcome, she laughed. He followed her through another door and into an office with a desk and a long workbench that was covered in computers, cell phones and all kinds of other gadgets. Thanks for agreeing to take a look at this on Christmas Eve. She hopped up onto one of two stools. Hey, you know us Chinese people, always ready to make a buck regardless of what day it is, she said. What you got? He handed over Kristen's tablet computer. Belongs to a 14-year-old who's gone missing from her home in the valley, believed trafficked. We need to access her social media accounts and whatever else is on there. Whoa, trafficked is in. Yeah, as in what you're thinking. Jeez. Okay, well in that case I'll get straight to it, but there is a no one else is working right now premium of an additional $500. Not an issue. I thought you'd quibble. Nope, said Locke. I just want to find this girl and get her back to her family. Jenny had already propped the tablet on the bench and plugged it into another computer via the USB port. She clicked and tapped at her computer as they talked. Hey, so how come the cops aren't out there looking for her? She asked him. They are but they get a lot of calls about runaways, especially this time of year. I'm just trying to expedite matters. The tablet computer flashed and she was into the main screen. Password protection's really basic on these things. Now let me see what she has on this. If we can get into her Instagram or Snapchat, then you're probably home and dry. Great, said Locke. Hey, do you mind if I step out to make a call? Of course not. He walked back out into the corridor. He'd called Carmen on the way here and left a message, and now he was getting worried that she hadn't called him back. She should have been home a couple of hours ago. If Jenny managed to somehow magic up a location, he didn't plan on waiting until tomorrow to get her. He couldn't imagine a better Christmas present to Kristen's family than her safe return. But closing this up tonight, or more likely in the early hours of Christmas Day, would make him even later, and he wanted to let Carmen know what his plans were. Thankfully, this time she picked up. Hey, it's me, everything okay? Yeah, fine. You headed home? Not yet. He explained a little about the situation, and the time pressure. He could tell Carmen was disappointed that they likely wouldn't be able to spend Christmas Eve together, but that she didn't want to guilt him into coming home. I'll be home as soon as I can. Ryan, it's fine. But promise me one thing. What's that? Be careful. The people involved in this kind of thing are, she said before trailing off. Don't worry. I don't plan on kicking down any doors. If I find her, I'll let the LAPD handle that part. Good. Hey, one more thing. You want me to pick up takeout on the way home? That would be good too, but that I was going to say, I love you. I love you too, Locke smiled. I'll call as soon as I'm finished up. He walked back through to find Jenny hunched over the workbench, tapping even more furiously at her keyboard. What's the good word? Jenny looked up. It's been wiped. The whole thing. When did you say she split? Locke's heart sank. So much for a Christmas reunion. Like a week ago. Maybe a little less. 
Yeah, right around then would be about right. But you can still recover the date. I can try, but I'm not going to get it done tonight. Locke looked through the window to the quiet street below. If it goes faster than you thought, can you call me? Sure. He got back into his car and sat there for a moment, drumming his fingers against the steering wheel. There was nothing he could do tonight. He'd pinned most of his hopes on the tablet computer. Who was he kidding? All of his hopes. Jenny might recover what had been on it, but that wouldn't be until tomorrow or later. He told himself he should call it a night. There was no harm in sleeping on it and getting some fresh ideas about how he might find this kid. Plus, he was a 15-minute drive from home. He put the car into drive and pulled out from the curb. He stopped, pulled back over to the side of the street and grabbed his phone. Kristen's mother answered immediately, as he'd known she would. You got little sleep under these circumstances. Not for the first few weeks, anyway. It took exhaustion to overwhelm the parent of a missing child before they could find some rest. Anticipating the first question the only question, Locke quickly said, I haven't found her and I'm sorry for calling so late but I wanted to ask you about Kristen's cell phone. I've tried it. Over and over. I think it's switched off. It doesn't even go to voicemail. No, I just needed the number, Locke said slightly embarrassed that he hadn't already collected what was fairly basic information when he'd sat down with the family. Oh sure, she said, rattling off the digits. Locke made a note of them, and then repeated them back. That's it, she said. There was a moment of silence between them, Locke in his car on an empty street, and Kristen's mother in the living room, or maybe in the kitchen of her small house in the valley. I was so happy when Angie told me you were going to help find my Kristen. I'm going to do my very best, I promise you that. It was a bad idea to make promises or offer guarantees. Locke had already spoken with Angie enough to know that these weren't straightforward situations. Not by a long way. With a regular child abduction or any kidnap or abduction for that matter, once you had located and extracted the person, that was it. Trafficking wasn't like that. That was what made it so difficult for law enforcement. What did you do with a victim who didn't think they were a victim? Or worse yet, with a victim who had fallen hard for their trafficker or someone close to their trafficker? Right now though, that was a problem for down the line. He still had to find Kristen. The faster he tracked her down, the less deep they would have gotten their talons into her. Mr. Locke? Yes. If you do find her, will you call me straight away? No matter what time it is. I don't care if it's four in the morning. I will, he said. Rather than call her back from the car, Locke went back inside to give Jenny the number. Whatever software she was using to retrieve the data on Kristen's tablet was still working overtime. You want me to hack her phone records? Jenny asked him. Yes. That's at least another two grand. There's a lot of operational security involved to make sure no one knows I hacked into the account. The money's not an issue, said Locke. Jenny tilted her head. Who's paying for all this? I am, said Locke. Why? Locke hadn't actually thought too hard about the why. He guessed it was partly because he was already invested in a way he hadn't been in a long time. Most of his work over the past few years had been solving the problems of rich people. Problems that were often self-inflicted and a direct result of people with money having either acquired it in shady ways or flaunting it to such an extent that they made themselves a target. This was different. These people didn't have money that he could see. If he didn't help them, who would? I don't know, said Locke. I guess it feels good to finally be helping someone who really needs it. The young hacker shrugged, seemingly satisfied with his answer. That doesn't mean I'm going to give you a discount, okay? She said. Locke laughed. I wasn't looking for one. Jenny turned back to another computer further along the workbench. You don't really know much about all this tech stuff, do you, Boomer? 
Boomer. Never mind, said Jenny. Anyway, you can do a lot more with a phone number than see who the person called or who called them. A lot of times they link to social media accounts. Like you can plug a number into Facebook, and depending on how they have their privacy settings set up, it will give you their account. Look. Locke stepped over to the bench. Over Jenny's shoulder he could see pictures of Kristen on one of her, no doubt multiple social media accounts. Some photographs looked recent, very recent. Do you mind if I take a look at that, said Locke. Be my guest, she said, moving out of the way. Locke clicked on the most recent image. It was a selfie of Kristen. In contrast to the pictures he'd seen in her home, in this photograph she was wearing makeup and a tight-fitting top. That right there is a thirst trap, said Jenny. Locke did his best to try to keep up with social media, but he had to admit that right now he was starting to feel his age. A thirst trap, he said, feeling even older than his chronological age. Yeah, Boomer, it's when a girl posts a sexy image to get guys to like or comment. They're usually a lot more explicit. Locke began to scroll down the other images she'd posted. Only a few were of Kristen herself, and they were either old photographs of her as a kid or images presumably from school, and things like soccer practice where she looked like any other 14-year-old kid. None of them, apart from the final one, fell into the category of thirst trap. Jenny jabbed a finger at the screen. And look at this. This guy liked her post. Jenny leaned past Locke and clicked. It opened the guy's account. It was set to private, but there was a username, a short bio, and a profile picture of a young man in his late teens or early 20s. He had his shirt off to reveal a toned and chiseled torso, complete with eight-pack abs and boy band good looks. Can you get into his account? asked Locke. Probably yes, but I don't want to send a request from my own account for obvious reasons, but yeah, I can set up a fake account and we can probably catfish him. Locke was relieved to at least know what the phrase catfish meant. He'd caught an episode or two of the TV show while channel surfing with Carmen. Catfishing was the practice of creating a fake internet persona, often with stolen images from another person's account, to deceive other people, often into forming some kind of virtual relationship. You think that'll work? asked Locke. Jenny shrugged. It's worth a shot. Might take a little time though. Time was one thing Locke knew he didn't have. Is there any other way you can get an address for this guy in the meantime? he asked. Sure I can try. People are lazy about usernames. They tend to use the same handle all over the web. Same goes for passwords. Let me see what I can find. Locke stepped away, leaving her to it. There was a small kitchen area in back. He made them both coffee. He was running on the energy of the investigation and of finally catching a break, but he could feel his energy beginning to flag and he needed an extra jolt. By the time they were both on their second cup of strong coffee and he had looked at his watch, it was close to one in the morning. Got something, said Jenny, as a color printer over in the corner whirred into action. She hopped off her stool and grabbed a couple of sheets and handed them to Locke with a flourish. This, she said, pointing at the first piece of paper. This looks like it's his car. Locke took it from her. It was a Buick Grand National GNX with a fairly distinctive paint job. The image didn't show the license plate, but it was a good start. There couldn't be many cars in the greater Los Angeles area that looked like this one. And this, she added, handing him the second piece of paper. This looks like it's his house. Or somewhere he hangs out. See how the edge of the porch in the picture of his car matches the porch in this one. In the second picture she'd printed, Andre was posing on the sidewalk with a couple of buddies. They were throwing signs with their hands that looked like they could have been gang signs. Having grown up black and poor in Long Beach, Locke's partner Ty had more of an insight into street gangs. He would send the pictures onto him. Jenny, is there any way you could get an address from that? She grimaced. There are limits even to my superpowers, but I can try. Then I really have to go home and get some rest though. 
as she busied herself seeing if she could use Google Maps Street View to match the image of the house, Locke paced to the window. One thing he was certain of was that Andre was the same Andre or Andrew that Kristen's mom had mentioned. Find Andre, and he was certain he would find Kristen. 6. Locke pulled slowly to the curb and killed the engine. On the opposite side of the street was a house that matched the one in the photograph. It was a little after 3 in the morning, and there were no lights on at the front of the property. Locke couldn't see the distinctive 1987 Buick Grand National GNX, but there was a car parked in the house's driveway that was covered with a tarpaulin. He got out and walked quickly over to the house. He eased the gate open, wincing at the creak of the hinges, and moved directly to the car. He lifted the cover at the front and caught a glimpse of the cherry red he'd been looking for, along with a telltale pop-up headlight. He was in the right place. Not wanting to surrender the element of surprise just yet, he moved down the side of the house, measuring each step with care, keeping his footfalls as soft as he could. At the back of the house was an unkempt yard. A couple of mismatched lawn chairs were arranged around a homemade fire pit that was filled with snubbed out cigarettes and roaches. There were two windows at the back. Locke walked over to the nearest one, cupped his hands against the glass and peered into a kitchen. The sink was full of unwashed dishes and the counters were the same. He moved to the next window. The blinds were drawn but something told him it was a bedroom. He checked the window. It was locked. That was probably for the best. No matter the motive, finding Kristen wouldn't be helped by him being arrested for breaking and entering. In any case, he had an alternative plan. One that was just as good, although a touch riskier. Locke popped the collar of his jacket as high as it would, dug out a ball cap from the pocket and put it on. He walked none too softly to the back door, making sure to kick away an empty beer can on the way. He knocked softly at first then when as he expected, no one responded he knocked louder. Hey Joe open up dude, he called out slightly slurring his words as he went for a drug and drink addled idiot who stumbled into the wrong backyard. A few more seconds passed. Finally came the sound of someone stirring inside. Then a voice. Young male half asleep. There's no Joe here. You have the wrong house. Where'd Joe go? said Locke, staying in character and keeping his head angled down so that the cap obscured his face. There's no Joe here. Oh sorry bro. Listen, I really hurt my leg coming over that fence, said Locke, pausing for dramatic effect. And my old lady took my phone. Could I maybe make a call? More movement from inside, accompanied by no small amount of cursing. There was the thud of something large and wooden, likely a baseball bat, being picked up inside the kitchen. Locke made his move, stepping off to the side of the back door that led into the kitchen. He knelt down pretending to tie an errant lace. The door opened. Locke could see a pair of bare legs and fat end of a baseball bat. He figured as long as he could see the bat close to the ground, he was good. He raised his hand, fingers fanned out in a I come in peace gesture. Listen bro, there's no Joe here, and I ain't letting you do shit apart from giving you three seconds to get the fuck out of my yard before I beat the shit out of you. Andre wasn't exactly a good Samaritan, thought Locke. That would make whatever he had to do next a lot easier. Locke's hand slid down to his ankle. He came back up with a .38 snub-nosed revolver, pointed it at Andre's chest and took three steps back. Andre had started to raise the bat, ready to take a swing. He saw the gun, then Locke's face which was focused rather than confused, and decided that taking a swing might not be the next move. Let's go inside Andre, before we wake your neighbors. Andre didn't appear to like that idea. He didn't move. Put the bat down, said Locke. If you think I won't shoot you, then you're very much mistaken. Still no movement. Count of three, said Locke, staring him down. I don't want to kill you, so I'll probably try to wound you. But I can tell you from experience that's kind of an imprecise art, even at this range. That and Locke's unblinking stare seemed to do the trick. Without taking his eyes off the barrel of the small handgun, Andre crouched down and placed the bat on the lawn. Let's go talk inside, said Locke. 
it was fairly obvious that Andre was pissed. Pissed at being woken up. Pissed at having a gun pointed at him in his own backyard. Pissed at not being able to take a free swing at someone. What's this about? he asked, his teeth barely parting as he spat out the question. I'm here for Kristen Miller. That drew a smile from Andre that chilled something inside Locke. She ain't here. You can look, said Andre, stepping off to one side. Oh, I intend to, said Locke, motioning for Andre to move back into the kitchen. 7. Kristen freshened up her makeup like Sooth had shown her. Sooth was like an older sister, a mother and best friend all rolled up into one. She was older, maybe early twenties, and to Kristen's eyes impossibly glamorous. Andre had introduced them. He told Kristen that Sooth was a singer. That he was going to produce her debut album. He'd said that, seeing as how Kristen was arguing so much with her mom about seeing him that she could go stay with Sooth. Kristen had snuck out that night, putting some bundled up clothes in her bed so that if her mom peeked in, it would look like she was sleeping. Andre had been waiting for her at the end of the block. He'd whisked her away to go meet Sooth. How come I can't stay with you? she had asked him. You know why, he told her. You're too young. This is better. This way you can stay with Sooth, party and have fun, and I can come over whenever and hang out. It had turned out to be a lie. She hadn't seen Andre since. But he was right about the fun. The first few days with Sooth were so much fun that Kristen had become lost in it. It had left her so breathless that she had barely missed him. Sooth's place wasn't all that nice, in fact it was kind of crummy. But there was no school, and no bedtime, and no one nagging her about every little thing like her mom did. There were cigarettes and weed and pills and wine, even fancy cocktails with names that made Kristen giggle, like Sooth's favorite drink, a porn star martini. There was music and dancing too. Sooth loved music, she played music from the moment she got up until the moment she went to bed. They slept late, which suited Kristen better than getting up to catch the bus to school. They went to bed late too. Sometimes it was three or four in the morning before they crashed out, lying next to each other in Sooth's huge bed. Just like sisters. Kristen had always resented being an only child. She had always wanted a big sister. Now she had one, and it was the best thing ever. On the first morning, Kristen was in the kitchen when Sooth started asking her about Andre. You're sweet on him, right? she asked Kristen. He's cute, conceded Kristen, trying to be cool about it. Yeah, he's real pretty, said Sooth, turning to look at her with this big grin plastered all over her face. You and him do it. Kristen blushed. Come on, girl, Sooth prompted. I wouldn't blame you if you had. He's fine. Sooth pushed aside some dirty glasses and hopped up onto the counter. Come on, girl, spill, give me all the nasty details. Kristen told her everything. How it had all happened so fast. How the first time had hurt, and how it hadn't hurt so much after that. She hadn't enjoyed it exactly but it had been okay, and because it seemed to make Andre happy, it made her happy. She had felt older too. Like she was a woman. That part she hadn't shared with Sooth. Sooth had been a woman for so long that she would have felt silly telling her that part. When she finished, Sooth had hopped down off the counter and given her a hug. She smelled of French perfume, or what Kristen imagined French perfume smelled off. When Sooth finally broke away, she looked serious. I'm glad your first time was with Andre, she told Kristen. That's going to make this a whole lot easier for you, girl. Make what easier? Sooth's face hardened. It was like a mask had dropped down. She swept a hand over the kitchen, long nails slashing the air. Girl, all this cost money. I can't have you freeloading. You're going to have to earn your keep. This ain't your mama's house no more. Kristen had started to ask her what she meant, but the hard mask had dropped, and happy big sister Sooth had come back into the room. Sooth put her finger to Kristen's lips. Don't worry about it now. I'll hold your hand. Show you how the game works. Then she kissed her on the cheek. You're in the life now. 
Kristen hadn't known what Sooth meant by the life. She'd guessed from the way she'd said it that it wasn't regular life. That it was something more. She'd assumed by the way the sweep of Sooth's long fingers had taken in the apartment that it meant living like this. No rules. No job. Partying all the time. Going to bed late and getting up in the afternoon. Rolling down to Mickey D's to eat and ordering whatever you wanted to order. Over the next day, Sooth had started to explain that it was more than just that. Sooth had a daddy, a boyfriend who paid for everything. But it was a boyfriend she shared with other girls that she called wives-in-law. Kind of like Mormons, was how Sooth explained it. Only they don't party, and we party hard. In return for everything being paid for, Sooth had to work. And so would Kristen. If she wanted to stay. Or said Sooth she could go home. Only Kristen knew that she couldn't go home. Not now she had seen all this. And not after all the arguments she'd had with her mom about sneaking out to see Andre, and how when she had gone to school how the other girls talked about her because she had a boyfriend who was a man. Kristen could feel her world start to constrict. Something told her that none of this was good. Not Andre. Not Sooth. Not the life. But she told herself she was in too deep. It was like she had stepped from one world into another, like in a movie or a fairy tale. It was like this movie she had seen with her mom about these kids who had found a magical wardrobe that took you into a magical land called Narnia. Sooth was the queen, and Kristen guessed that all the alcohol and weed and music and excitement were like the magical Turkish delight that the queen in the movie used to cast her spell over one of the children. Only now she had tasted it she craved more, and the queen wasn't so bad after all. Not scary like she had been in the movie. Not yet anyway. 8. A solitary floor lamp slashed a triangle of light across Andre's bloodied face. Slumped on an armchair in the living room, his hands tied behind his back, a strip of towel muffling his screams, he had spent the past half hour in varying degrees of pain. His nose was broken. One eye had started to swell shut. A gash, deep enough that it would require stitches, ran from the edge of his left temple, down past his eye, finishing an inch short of his chin. Before he took his leave, Ryan Locke had decided that he should decommission the pretty boy good looks Andre had deployed to ensnare Kristen, and who knew how many others. Given that there was almost zero chance that Andre would see the inside of a prison cell, Locke had decided to dispense a little jail justice of his own. In the California prison system, on the high security yards, someone involved in a crime against children would be marked up by other prisoners. It was a way of signaling to others in the system that they were all bad. Even criminals didn't like those who messed with children. Locke agreed, and to his mind a 14-year-old like Kristen was exactly that, still a child. Locke stood in front of him and counted through the cash he'd scooped from Andre's wallet. He folded it up and pocketed it. Hey, that's my role, Andre protested. I have expenses, said Locke. You weren't cheap to track down. Now where do I find your buddy hanger? Over the course of the past half hour, Andre had already coughed up most of the details Locke required, and quite a few that Locke didn't but chimed with what Angie had told him about how trafficking worked. As bedtime debriefs went, it was one Locke would gladly have missed. Andre's role was that of recruiter for a pimp with the street name Hanger. Andre claimed he didn't know Hanger's real name, and that part Locke believed. In the normal course of his day as a part-time DJ, drug dealer and all-round piece of shit, Andre stayed on the lookout for vulnerable young women. When he found one that he thought he could peel off from the herd, he sweet-talked them, showering them with compliments, affection, and small gifts. Nothing too expensive, this after all was a business for Andre, and he needed to keep his costs down. Overpowered by Andre's love bombing, whatever guard they had up was lowered, and Andre went to work persuading them to meet his friend, Hanger. If he felt like he needed extra leverage, he would get them to send him compromising photographs or videos. Or if they were of legal age, he would make a video with them. Then he would threaten to send the pictures or video clip to their family or friends if they didn't do what he wanted. At first, he claimed not to know what happened to them after the introduction. 
With some additional persuasion from Locke, he confessed that he knew exactly what the next stage of the process was. It involved violence, both sexual and physical, as well as some psychological mind tricks worthy of a cult such as sleep deprivation, drugs, and one of Hanger's other girls playing the good cop to Hanger's nightmare cop. They were broken. First physically, and then mentally. Because they had been pre-screened and selected by Andre, and were already vulnerable to low self-esteem, the process did not take that long. A day or two, maybe a week or two. Never longer than that. Then they were put to work. If Locke felt any guilt about what he was doing to Andre, it immediately dissipated as he got to that part of the conversation. The only reason Andre was still breathing was that Locke needed more information. And he wanted Hanger to know that he was coming, and that when Locke found him, if he hadn't already returned Kristen Miller to her family alive, if not well, that it was going to get very ugly indeed. If Hanger's tactic with the girls he pimped out was shock and awe, Locke planned to return the favor. With interest. You really think Hanger is going to cough up a fine young swan like that? I don't think I know. Because it won't be worth his while to keep her. I don't know who you are but pimps don't give up girls. The last bitch that someone tried to take back ended up face down in the LA River. Locke took his time responding. Drawing his main weapon, his Sig P-226. He pressed the hot end into the center of Andre's forehead. That happens, and I'm coming back for you. Ever been out to the desert, Andre? Sound really travels. Only there's no one to hear it. I'll keep you out there for a couple of days before we're done. Locke reached into his pocket and pulled out Andre's cell phone. He scrolled down the recent call list and found the contact he was looking for. Now you talk to him and tell him you need to meet up. Don't say why, just set the meet. Try to tip him off and we're taking a ride together. Locke hit the call icon, put the call on speaker so he could hear both sides of the conversation, and held the phone up to Andre's ear. It went to voicemail. No personalized greeting, just the robotic default message asking the caller to leave a message after the tone. Locke pulled the phone away and killed the call. I'll keep this safe. Sure, there's a bunch of stuff on here that the feds might take an interest in. What do you think? That drew a rare smile from Andre. I think there's nothing on there that counts for shit in court. All I do is make the introductions. You think these hoes ain't doing anything they don't want to? Locke drew back a clenched fist and delivered a heavy overhand right to Andre's broken nose. Andre yelped with pain as fresh blood sputtered from his nose, running down his chin and onto his already soaked shirt. On the way out, Locke stopped to slash the tires on Andre's prized possession. 9. Cold air from the Pacific whipped through the cabin of Locke's car as he drove back down the 10 freeway, heading for home. He set the cruise control so he wouldn't exceed the speed limit and risk being pulled over by CHP. This time of year was prime DUI season. While all he had pumping through his bloodstream was caffeine and rage, there was enough blood spatter on his clothing to make for a potentially troublesome encounter. Turning Andre's phone over in his hand, Locke pushed through the front door and through the deadbolts. Before he'd left, he'd extracted details of where he might find Hanger. It was a long list. He was hoping to use the phone to finesse a meeting via text or messaging. Failing that, he would start running down the list of locations. But first he needed to get some rest. The home he shared with Carmen was quiet. He took off his shoes and left them by the door before padding through into the living room. He took a moment to admire the Christmas tree they had decorated together. A silver angel, an heirloom passed down by Carmen's grandmother, sat at the very top. They had decorated the tree together, drank some wine, went to bed and made love. It had been set to be a perfect Christmas. Then Locke had decided to help Angie Garcia. He stood in the middle of the living room and stripped off his bloodied clothes. He wasn't sure if he should wash his shirt or burn it. Probably burn it, he thought, letting it drop onto the polished wooden floor. He doubted there was enough stain remover in the house to leach out that amount of blood. One thing he wouldn't do was lie to Carmen about what had happened. That was something they had agreed from early on. 
no secrets. Sometimes she would ask him to invoke his right to take the fifth, to not tell her something, but that was always her call to make. He stretched his arms up above his head. He could feel a couple of knots forming in his back from the day's unresolved tension. He doubted they would loosen up much until he found Kristen Miller. Pulling out Andre's cell phone, he dropped a quick text to Hanger. He'd left Andre tied up, but he would free himself, eventually. Then he would alert his buddy. After that, if he was in any way smart, he'd patch up his tires or buy new ones and get the hell out of Los Angeles for a time. Hanger would know Locke was coming. That was fine. It might be enough for him to throw Kristen back into the ocean of victims that Andre had pulled her from. It might not. Locke prayed for the former, but he was primed for the latter. In the kitchen, Locke filled the sink with hot water, poured in half a bottle of stain remover, and threw his clothes in. Naked, he walked through into the guest bathroom and took a long hot shower. He finished with a 30-second blast of cold water that would lower his core temperature and help him get to sleep quickly. He got out, dried off, and set the alarm on his phone to wake him in five hours. Five good hours of sleep was plenty for someone used to long draining months who had spent the last few months getting the most sleep he had in years. His battery, he figured, was charged enough that he could keep going on full tilt for the next few days. Naked, he walked into the bedroom. Carmen stirred. She rolled over onto her side and smiled sleepily. Damn she was beautiful, he thought, reminding himself how lucky he was to have found her and have her in his life. You find her? Carmen asked. Not yet, said Locke, deciding that he'd explain the clothes soaking in the sink in the morning. Go back to sleep. She gave him another goofy sleepy smile. Okay. He pulled back the sheets on his side and got in, wrapping a protective arm around the swell of her pregnant belly as she scooted her body into him. Hey Ryan? Yeah? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now go back to sleep or Santa Claus won't leave you anything under the tree, said Locke, kissing the top of her head, taking in the smell of her as he closed his eyes, thinking of this time next year when they'd be celebrating their first Christmas with a daughter. 10. Kristen tugged at the ultra-short skirt Sooth had given her to wear and shivered in the cold. The buzz from the porn star Martini and the joint they'd smoked in the car on the way down here was starting to wear off. She shivered again. You want to stay warm you keep walking, said Sooth as they turned a corner onto a downtown street. It's not easy, said Kristen lifting one foot. As part of the outfit that Sooth had provided, she was wearing five-inch heels that made it hard to walk without rolling her ankle. Back in the apartment, as they drank and smoked and listened to music, it had all seemed fun. The vibe was like they were going out to a club, not to stand out on a freezing cold street corner in the middle of the night. Kristen knew what was expected of her. Sooth had spelled it out. A handful of condoms crammed into her purse left no ambiguity. Remember, Sooth had explained. Guy doesn't want to use a rubber, that's extra. On the drive down here, Kristen had tried to block out what was next. Sooth made it seem normal, but the thought of what she would have to do made her feel physically sick. She'd never even so much as kissed a boy until Andre, and now she was expected to get in strangers' car and have sex with them. Sooth tugged at her arm, pulling her closer to the edge of the sidewalk. A car slowed down. The driver, old, old enough to be her grandpa, leered at them, most of his leering attention reserved for Kristen. Thankfully, he didn't stop. From somewhere Kristen found the courage to blurt out, I don't think I can do this. Sooth's nails pinched into her bicep as she pulled Kristen back into a doorway. Her face had changed again. Fun big sister Sooth was gone replaced by someone who scared Kristen. Listen to me. You owe me. I've put you up, fed you, bought you clothes, given you everything. So you are going to get out on that track and do what you have to do to make the money you owe me. You feel me, bitch? Kristen swallowed. She was scared. She measured her fear of Sooth against getting into some stranger's car and having to do whatever he wanted her to do. Sooth's hand came up and grabbed Kristen's hair. She yanked it hard enough that her head snapped back. 
You want me to cut you, ho, said Sooth. Because I will. Kristen fought back tears. No. Sooth let go. That's what I thought. Now listen to Sooth, first time on the track is always the worst, but I'm here. And I'll be watching. Now take off your panties. What? She said it without thinking. Sooth slapped her face. You heard me. Take them off. You won't be needing no panties tonight. Kristen looked into Sooth's eyes. They were dead, devoid of humanity. She knew Sooth carried a knife. Sooth had shown it to her and told her stories of how she'd used it, either on Johns who wouldn't pay, or on other girls who encroached on her territory. Something happened in that moment. It was like Kristen was no longer there anymore. It was like she was up above, looking down, watching herself, as if she had somehow left her own body. She reached down and steadying herself against the older woman, she did what she's been told, took them off and put them into her purse. Half pulled, half shepherded back onto the street by Sooth, Kristen walked over to a car that had pulled over. It was the old man who had been checking her out when they arrived. Her stomach churned, almost pulling her back into the present, before she sunk back into a terrified daze. You date, he said. She followed his gaze down her body to see that Sooth had pulled up her skirt so that he, and everyone else on the street, could see everything. She dates, said Sooth. Get in, he said. Go on, girl, said Sooth, letting go and pushing her off the sidewalk and toward the open passenger door. Before she knew it, she was sitting next to him. His hand reached over, pawing at her leg. Drive around the corner, she heard herself saying. You got it, he said. 11. Woken by his alarm, Locke rolled over. Carmen was already up and out of bed. Patting her side to check for warmth, he guessed she'd been up for a while. He really must have been exhausted, because he usually woke when she did. Even if he went back to sleep afterwards. Reaching over, he checked the phone he'd taken from Andre before his own, hoping there would be a message from Hanger. There wasn't. Just lots of notifications and messages, mostly from young women that Locke presumed Andre was working some kind of an angle on. Glancing at his own phone, he hoped for a message from Jenny telling him she had a GPS pin location for Kristen. No luck there either. He got out of bed, threw on some shorts and a faded old t-shirt, and went through into the kitchen. Fresh baking and freshly brewed coffee with some kind of cinnamon Christmas spice hit his nostrils, making him suddenly hungry. The sink was empty. He guessed he was going to have to have that discussion, and as Carmen walked in wearing a robe and with her hair up in a messy bun, he guessed it was going to be now. She looked at the sink. It's Christmas morning so I don't want to know what all that blood was from. Believe me, it should have been a lot more. They're still breathing, she asked. For now, he said, pouring himself a mug of coffee. She came up and behind him and rested a hand on the small of his back. Just don't end up in prison, okay? Locke took a sip of coffee. The only good thing about this, traffickers usually don't go to the cops. Listen, I may have to go out a little later. Guess we'd better open presents then. Thank you, he said, meaning it. I know this isn't a great way to spend the holidays. I would be mad, but I was the one who suggested you help out. I should have known only you could turn checking a few cameras into something like this. There was no edge to her voice, no sense of disappointment or recrimination behind the words, but he still felt bad. The problem was that the alternative, not spending the day trying to find Kristen Miller, would leave him, and Carmen feeling infinitely worse. They opened their presents and their stockings, drank coffee, and ate a little. Then Locke showered, got ready, and kissed her goodbye. Carmen was going to her sister's. Locke would join her there later. He kissed her again on his way out. Be careful, she said. Always, he smiled. I'll see you later. If you need me for anything, then call. I shouldn't be more than an hour away. The streets of Los Angeles were even quieter than the night before. 
Save for people heading to visit family or friends, the freeways were as close to ghostly as they would get all year, barring another stay-at-home order. People were in their homes, enjoying time with their families, but not Kristen Miller and therefore not Locke. As he drove, Locke imagined that this must have been what it was like 50 years ago, before the city bulged at the seams with people searching for fame and fortune, or simply blue skies and sunshine. He wondered if things like trafficking had gone on back then, and concluded that they surely must have. Just maybe not on the industrial scale, it happened now. His cell rang with a call from his business partner, Tyrone Ty Johnson. He and Ty were like peas and carrots, not just partners in justice but friends at a level most people rarely had. Merry Christmas asshole, said Ty when Locke answered. Right back at you, said Locke. Just wanted to wish you a happy Christmas, said Ty. Thanks. How's Carmen? At her sister's place. And you're not? Ty knew a little about Locke's involvement, but he hadn't yet brought his partner up to speed with the latest developments. Locke didn't want his partner to think he had to get involved when this was something Locke had taken on off the books. Be careful, Ryan, said Ty when Locke had finished giving him the broad brush strokes. Yeah, everyone keeps saying that. You haven't heard the name Hanger, have you, said Locke. Doesn't ring a bell, but I can make some inquiries if you like. Only if you have time. What's your next move, said Ty. Well, I have his number so I'll keep trying that, and in the meantime, I have a couple of places I can start looking. Christmas Day or not, just holler if you need someone riding shotgun. And by riding shotgun I mean. Sitting next to me with a shotgun, said Locke. Ty laughed. You got it. Okay brother, appreciate it. I'll make some calls. See if anyone I know has heard the name. Thanks. Locke's first stop was a diner near one of the main tracks in downtown. A track was an area where sex workers solicited. Andre had said that Hanger could often be found holding court in a booth here with his girls. The girls would check in every few hours and hand over the money they had made out on the track. As Locke got within a few blocks of the diner, he noticed the streets became busier. Driving through the rest of downtown he'd been lucky to spot three or four cars driving on every block. Here it was four or five times that number and there was something else that stood out. Almost all the cars on this block had a solitary male occupant, and they were all moving slowly. They weren't passing through, they were cruising, checking out the scantily clad young women who were walking slowly up and down the sidewalk. Locke guessed that he'd found the track, or at least the start of it. Embarrassed, even though he had no reason to be, he found himself slowed to a walking pace by the car in front, the driver of which was almost leaning out of his window, as he catcalled a young black girl who teetered over to him on impossibly high heels that lent her the gait of a baby giraffe. A hand tapped the glass of Locke's window. Hey cutie, looking for a date? For the first time since this started, Locke questioned what the hell he was doing in a place like this on this day of all days. He waved the woman off, and she walked down to the next curb crawler. Locke pulled around the car in front and kept moving. He could see the neon sign of the diner up ahead. There was a parking lot sign just before. He'd pull in there and get his bearings before he headed into the diner to see if he could spot Hanger or ask the people who worked there if they'd seen him. Just as he pulled into the lot, the cell phone he'd taken from Andre rang. He pulled it from his pocket. The caller name read, Hanger. Locke hesitated. Should he let it go to voicemail? Hope that hanger texted him, and he wouldn't have to give away the fact that someone else was answering Andre's phone. Or did hanger already know about what had happened, and that Locke was in possession of Andre's phone? That had to be the more likely of the two scenarios, in which case it was a call Locke had to take. He tapped answer. 12. Hanger had never embraced pimp chic. He never strolled anywhere with a cane like a lot of them did. Rather than a garish, brightly colored fedora with feathers, the only hat he ever wore was a black or gray woolen beanie. Suits. Nope. A white Cadillac. Nope. He drove a black BMW. He kept his dress simple. 
jeans or jogging pants and a t-shirt, a jacket if it was cold. His only visual signatures were tightly braided cornrows and his rings, one on three fingers of every hand. Even then, they were both functional. The cornrows were to show he wasn't some regular white boy that another man could mess with. The rings? Well they were for any time he needed to throw hands or keep one of his girls in check, although that was rare. You lost your temper and hit a girl in the face, marked her up, and that put off the customers, which was never good for the bottom line. Rings did the same job as a knuckle duster, but they were legal. Nastier too. All points and ridges and diamonds that would slice through skin. You couldn't be arrested for wearing rings, and thought hanger they added that little dash of swag that every pimp had to have. You just didn't want to make it too obvious. To hanger the old school pimp style was like having a big ass neon sign over your head for the feds to see. A sign that read, Arrest me. So far in his 10 years pimping, Hanger had never been sent to prison. Jail yes, prison no. He was too smart for any charges to stick. He did what he had to do to stay on the streets. That was one of the reasons he wasn't overly concerned about the guy tracking down this new girl. He'd had family come after him before. It had never presented an issue. He knew the game better than they did. He had a thousand tricks up his sleeve that he could use to either throw them off the scent or simply wear them down. Usually, in his experience, they gave up. Once or twice, when a girl was already used up, he'd throw her back. He had no plans to do that with Kristen. She was a gem. The kind of girl that came along once every three or four years. Young White, and with the help of his bottom girl, a 7 out of 10, maybe an 8. If he played it right, she was a million dollar baby. That was why there was no way he was letting her go. Now all he had to do was make his position clear. I heard you were looking for me, he said, watching the guy in the Audi who had just rolled past him and into the parking lot. Let's cut to the chase. You're going to return Kristen Miller to her family. Today. In fact, you have two hours and the clock just started ticking. Hanger smiled. Tough guy talk. He'd heard a lot of it in his time. It didn't faze him. He'd once had a dude pour gas over him and threatened to set him on fire. He told the dude to go ahead, laughed while he said it. He'd meant it too. Hanger wasn't afraid to die, he was prepared. He sucked on his teeth as he scoped the guy out. He was lean muscular, looked former military, one of those types. If this had been about some older duck, an asset he had already sweated, maybe he would cut his losses. But not with this girl. I don't know who that is. I've never heard of any Kristen Miller. But I don't much like threats. Oh it's not a threat. Hanger stopped speaking. He wanted to see if this dude would fill the silence. He waited for him to start looking at the phone to see if Hanger had hung up. He didn't. The dude in the car stared straight ahead, scanning everything around him. If Hanger hadn't been behind tinted glass, that meant no one could possibly see into his vehicle, he may have started to worry. A few more seconds ticked by. It was weird. It was like this dude knew Hanger was here. Like he knew he was being watched. It was, Hanger wasn't going to lie, more than a little unnerving. I still don't know what you're talking about, he said. But here's the thing, I don't like dealing with anyone when I don't know their name. You feel me? The dude holding Andre's phone smiled at that. It wasn't a nice smile, either. Wasn't a regular Joe smile. You don't need my name, he said to Hanger. Okay, said Hanger. That's cool. But I don't know no Kristen Miller or anyone called Kristen, so I can't really help you. That's too bad. Guess it is. You don't want to know why it's too bad? Hanger choked back a laugh. He was starting to enjoy this little back and forth. It tickled his funny bone. I have a feeling you're going to tell me. It's too bad because we both know that you are a lying sack of shit. And it's too bad because if by some miracle you happen to be telling the truth, then I'm going to kill you regardless. Choice is yours. He hung up. 
Hanger stopped laughing. Now he was pissed. Super pissed. No one hung up on him. Not ever. It was beyond disrespectful. Part of him wanted to pop his door open right there and then. March over to this dude and introduce him to the rings on his hands. See if he could back up the threats he'd made. But something held him back. There was something about this dude that was off. Like he was psych ward crazy. Something like that. He pulled up Sue's number and hit call. She answered immediately. What's up daddy, she said in that little girl voice she used with him. You with the new girl, he said. Yeah, she's here. Get her off the track. Take her back to your crib. You sure? It's really busy. Am I sure, he said, anger rising up in him. You got it, Sooth hurriedly corrected. We're leaving now. 13. Locke pushed through the door and into the diner. It was busy, the customers a mirror of the people outside, minus the men in their cars. Locke guessed that they scuttled off home after their seedy liaison with one of the girls outside. A couple of people looked up as the door jangled shut behind him, then went back to their food or their conversation. He took a seat at the counter and used the mirror on the wall facing him to scan the space for any sign of Kristen Miller or for anyone who'd seen him and decided to make a hasty exit. Angie had told him that this track was a popular place for traffickers to put new girls to work. Not as Locke assumed because it was somehow safe, but for the opposite reason. They chose it because it was both seedy and dangerous. Angie explained that when traffickers were breaking a new girl, they often put her in the worst possible situation first. It served two purposes. The first was to shock and traumatize them, making them more malleable. Following on from that, it made them grateful when they were moved to work on a nicer track or inside, usually a motel room. What can I get you? Locke looked up at the waitress. She looked short on patience. He asked for coffee and a menu. She dumped coffee in a chipped white mug and pointed to the menu on the wall without saying anything. Locke thanked her and went back to scanning the booths and tables behind him. There were a couple of teenage girls in short skirts and low-cut tops, their faces plastered in heavy makeup, who looked underage. None of them were Kristen. Mostly the girls and women sat in small groups of two or three. In a couple of booths, pimps sat alone or with girls. They hard stared Locke when they made eye contact. He returned the favor. A couple of them looked away, obviously taking him for a cop. The waitress came back. You ready to order? She asked him. He slid his paper napkin across the counter, a $20 bill tucked under it. With his little finger, he slid his cell phone with it. The screen was facing up, and he had it turned around so the waitress could look down and see the picture of Kristen he'd made his screensaver without having to pick the phone up. You seen her? The waitress flicked her eyes down, pulling the money out from under the napkin and sliding it over the edge of the counter and into the pocket of her apron. Nope. Take another look, said Locke. One second, she said walking down to the other end of the counter and filling up another Patron's coffee cup before reaching in and producing a black ring binder. She dumped the binder in front of Locke. It was bulging. He opened it. There must have been a hundred clear plastic sleeves. Inside sleeve was a missing person poster with a picture and a phone number. Some had a reward for information. Locke flicked through. A couple posters featured teenage boys and young men. Most were girls, some who looked and were even younger than Kristen. The waitress came back. If you're not eating, then you have to leave. It seemed a strange house rule, given that most of the customers were busy stirring a hole in the bottom of their cup. But Locke knew when to take a hint. Closing the binder, he tapped his fingertips on the front cover. Maybe you should put these up somewhere so people can see them. The waitress gave him a tired smile that seemed laced with sarcasm. Yeah, we tried that. We got complaints. I bet you did, thought Locke. He jotted down his number on the napkin. If you see her, give me a call. 
the napkin went the same way as his $20. He put another $5 on the counter to cover the coffee and an extra gratuity. Merry Christmas, he said, heading back outside. He walked to the end of the block, gathering more than a few solicitations. Hey, sugar. You looking for a date? He thought about showing some of them the picture, but decided against it. His continued presence was already drawing more unwanted attention from the pimps. That wasn't his reason for avoiding asking any of the women on the track. For one, he was unlikely to get a straight answer when everyone could see them talking to him. For another, like it or not, and regardless of his own morals, they were working. Finally, canvassing here was a task better left to Angie, who knew many of the women and had already built trust with them. Locke took a sharp left into an alleyway. Even by the standards of downtown alleyways, it smelled bad. The cold took a little of the edge off the odor. He could only imagine how bad it was at the height of summer. He kept walking, senses on alert in case someone had followed him. Since he'd arrived here, his sixth sense told him he was being watched. Movement behind a dumpster. His hand moved to his Sig Sauer P226. A woman's head popped up from behind the dumpster. She had an electric blue wig on and nothing else. A guy stood up. They both looked at Locke, saw he wasn't a cop, and went back to what they'd been doing. Locke kept moving until he reached the service entrance at the back of the diner. A couple of the kitchen staff, heavy set squat Latino guys, were having a smoke break, while less than 10 feet away, a guy leaned against a wall while a woman knelt down and unbuttoned his pants. The guy sighed and stared straight ahead as she went to work, Locke glad he'd passed on breakfast. Locke showed the two kitchen staff the picture of Kristen, explaining himself in the little broken Spanish he had until one of them said, I speak English. You seen her around here? The guy sighed glanced down both ends of the alleyway. She's 14, said Locke. The guy rubbed at his chin. Yeah, he said. Last night, well, it was more his morning. She came in with one of the regulars. A guy. No, a woman. Locke reached into his pocket and pulled out another $20 bill. The guy waved him off. I don't want your money. I have a daughter not much older than that. Locke felt bad for making the assumption that it would take a bribe for this guy who worked for minimum wage to help him, when common decency was all that was required. Locke guessed that he had been around rich people for too long. Not everything in life came with a price tag. The guy finished his smoke. He ground the butt under his boot, walked back and pulled the door behind them closed. These people keep us going, know what I'm saying. Locke nodded that he did. You didn't speak to us but the woman's name is Sooth, she's the bottom girl for a dude by the name of Hanger. What does she look like? asked Locke. The guy gave him a quick description. Real tall. Like 6'1". Skinny. Black. Maybe early 20s. Real pretty. He looked over to his co-worker, who added something in Spanish that Locke didn't catch. She has like this big silver fur coat. Real fur. Real long hair. Oh and she carries this big ass knife. I've seen her use it on a john out there. Slice this dude from here to here, he said, slashing his hand all the way from his groin to his throat. She was with Kristen? If that's who that is, he said, looking at the picture on Locke's phone, then yeah. And what about Hanger? What does he look like, said Locke. The kitchen worker shook his head. I don't play with that dude, he said, opening the door behind him and signaling that as far as he was concerned their conversation was over. And if you're smart, you won't either. He started to hustle back inside. Locke thought about pressing him but didn't. The man had done the decent thing. He didn't owe Locke anything. I hope you find her, I really do, he said. The girl's down here. It's about as messed up as it gets down here, he added with a sad shake of his head. If you see her again would you text me, said Locke, handing off his number. The guy took it but didn't answer. The door closed. A few feet away, the John was already pulling up his zipper. 
Glock would have to take another shower when he got home. Maybe use some bleach instead of soap. He walked back down the alleyway. If Kristen had been here with Hanger's bottom girl, then it was safe to say she wasn't here now. In truth, he'd probably gathered more intel than he could have reasonably expected in such a short period of time. He guessed this was why cops referred to the Golden 24 or the Golden 48 when it came to major investigations. It was easier to gain traction when things were still fresh. He stood where he was, pulled out his phone and called Angie Garcia. As he brought her up to speed, he could hear merriment in the background. She was at the shelter. They had just opened presents, and they were busy preparing a meal for later. Everyone sounded happy. As he looked around the alleyway, he could imagine the relief the women she helped felt, trading a basic room at the shelter for what they had come from. An hour down on the track had been 60 minutes too long for Locke. He couldn't imagine spending months or years in a place like this. Angie told him she'd ask around about Sooth. The name rang a bell. He thanked her and called Joyce Miller. I haven't found her, he said as soon as she picked up. But I have some strong leads on who she's with. You think you'll find her, she asked. I don't want to make any promises or raise your hopes, but I'm hopeful, yes. Oh, thank the Lord, she said. Where are you anyway? As he told her, shadows fell across the end of the alleyway. Locke stopped as three of the pimps he'd seen out on the track turned into the alley, headed for him. They were laughing and joking, trading a joint, the pungent aroma of weed pushing out the smell of filth, seemingly paying no attention to him, but their intent was obvious. Mrs. Miller, I have to go, he said, killing the call immediately as he drew his gun and stepped into the middle of the narrow passage. 14. Hey fellas. What's this, said Locke. Meeting of the sex traffickers and badly dressed assholes Local 541. His jibe drew an acknowledgement of his presence. The conversation they'd been having died away. They looked down the alley towards him. Locke heard the service door into the diner slam shut. He made a quick appraisal of the three men. One was short and squat, neck fat pushing its way out at the top of his shirt collar. He was on Locke's left. The guy in the middle was tall and lean and the most garishly dressed of the three. He was wearing a green suit that gave him a demonic leprechaun vibe. The third guy was carrying a cane and wearing of all things, an old-fashioned monocle that was attached to a chain. Three guys walking toward you in an alleyway when there was only one of you was rarely a good thing. Unless of course you had not just one gun but two. In which case, the odds swung back strongly in your favor. One of you wouldn't happen to be called Hanger, would you, said Locke, taking this as an opportunity for further intelligence gathering. The leprechaun shook his head. Don't know that name, he said. There's a surprise, said Locke. You come down here, it better not be to disrupt business, Nekfat chimed in, his voice surprisingly high for such a heavily built man. Unless you want to catch yourself a beating, said Monocle. Oh come on fellas, it's Christmas, said Locke. And I was just about to leave. That drew a few chuckles. Oh you were, said Nekfat. That's right, so if you wouldn't mind turning back round I'll be on my way, said Locke, his hand moving to his gun. Oh you gonna shoot me, said Monocle. Locke took the question to be rhetorical. There was a sound from behind Locke. He threw a fast glance over his shoulder. The service door opened, and the two kitchen staff he'd spoken to a few minutes ago stepped back out. You okay? The more helpful of the two said to Locke. Yeah, I was just leaving, Locke told him. As soon as these gents get out of the way. Now that the numbers were even, maybe he wouldn't need the gun after all. The two kitchen staff walked up behind him. The three pimps seemed to hesitate. Monocle took a step back. Okay, said Leprechaun. We just wanted to warn you that Hanger don't like people asking questions about any of his girls. You feel me? Oh, you mean the trafficked 14 year old, said Locke. Ain't no hoes out here on the track who don't want to be, said Nick Fat. Locke took a step forward. You know I'm really growing to dislike that word. 
That's so, said Nekfat. The two kitchen staff guys reached Locke. They stepped in front of him, flanking him on either side. Looking down he saw one of them holding a cleaver, the other one had a large kitchen knife with a razor-sharp seven-inch blade. With the odds suddenly even, the three pimps seemed to lose their resolve. Monocle jabbed his cane in Locke's direction. You'd better not come back down here, he said. They turned and walked slowly away. Locke watched them go. He's right, said one of his newfound friends. Those guys don't mess about. None of them were hanger, were they? Locke asked. The men shook their head. He thought about pressing them for more details, but he already owed them. They had to work down here, and he was merely passing through. We'll keep an eye out for her, said one of the kitchen workers. Locke thanked the two men for their help, walked back down the alleyway and onto the street, scanning the girls walking up and down, but knowing that if Kristen had been here, she'd be long gone by now. As he walked back to his car, he passed Neck Fad and Monocle. They ignored him as an LAPD patrol car cruised past. When it turned at the end of the block, Monocle called after him. Keep walking. Locke did. Now wasn't the time to get sidetracked. There would be plenty of time for recriminations once he'd located the girl. 15. As he reached his car, he noticed it sitting low on one side. He walked around, having to squeeze down the side of a pickup truck that had been parked too close to his Audi. The rear passenger side tire had been slashed open. Locke smiled to himself at the lack of joined up thinking of these bozos. They wanted him to leave. They'd asked him to leave. Yet they were doing their best to make sure that he couldn't leave. Not immediately, anyway. To make it funnier, they hadn't seemed to realize that these were run flats. Even with a hefty slash the tire was still good, for a few miles anyway. He could change it here, but the pickup truck would make it awkward. Plus, he didn't want to give the local wildlife the satisfaction of watching him sweat. Locke decided to drive to the nearest gas station and change it there. Hunkering down, he made a final inspection of the damage. Suddenly he tensed. There was movement from behind him. He started to stand back up, catching sight in the passenger side mirror of someone appearing directly behind him, from behind the tailgate of the truck. That it had parked so close was no coincidence. He saw only fragments of the person behind him. White skinny male with cornrows. There was a sparkling flash of rings as their right arm arced up high and then came down hard, catching him flush at the base of his skull as he was in the process of shifting to face the attack. A sudden flash of light filled Locke's vision as he went down, losing his balance and tumbling forward, barely able to get his hands out in time to break his fall. Landing prone, he started to roll onto his back so that he could upkick and by the second he needed to clear his weapon. His stomach lurched from the impact and he struggled to hold on to consciousness. The sudden, unexpected nature of the blow had almost put him out cold. As it was, everything around him was blurry and out of focus. Maybe two seconds had passed but it felt like ten times that. The scuffle of shoe leather from behind. The white guy with the cornrows was looking down at him, his face a mask of violent intent, eyes dead, lips peeled over teeth. A boot swept through the air behind Locke's head. The kick missed his head but caught his shoulder. Steel toe caps crunched against his left clavicle. As the guy in front drew back a ringed fist, Locke brought his leg down, catching the guy hard in the chest. If he was going to take a beating, he planned on doing some damage of his own. Lying flat on his back, one attacker in front and one behind, his options were limited. Getting back to his feet was low percentage. He'd take any number of blows on the way back up, likely ending right back where he'd started, on his back taking a kicking. He reached down feeling for his sig. The guy behind him must have noticed because next thing Locke knew, his hand was trapped under the sole of the guy's boot. He ground it around, like he was stubbing out a cigarette. Meanwhile, the guy in front managed to grab Locke's ankle. Pushing Locke's leg out of the way, he moved past Locke's legs and began to rain down blows. His hand still pinned, all he could do now was bring up his left arm to shield his head from the worst of it. The guy was breathing hard. 
he was windmilling, most of his punches missing. There was a shout from behind, as sweet a sound as Locke could remember. Hey! What's going on back there? The blows kept coming. The rings made their mark, opening up Locke's face. Blood began to pour into his eyes from a gash across his forehead. The guy behind him removed his boot from Locke's hand, but only long enough to bring it crashing back down full force onto Locke's head. He scrambled again for his sig. His hand on the butt, he started to draw. He didn't think to aim. All he needed was his finger on the trigger, and enough strength on the trigger to discharge as soon as he cleared it. Another fist flew, catching him painfully flush just above his right eye. Locke's fingers closed around the butt of his gun. The boot came flying back down, catching the back of his head as he lifted it up to get a better view of where he was about to aim the sig. This time the stomp came accompanied by commentary, the fuck high-pitched and recognizable as monocle from back in the alleyway. Merry Christmas, asshole. Next came darkness complete and profound. 16. Locke woke to the coppery tang of blood at the back of his throat, in no idea where he was or how he had gotten here. Next came the pain shuttling in from all points of his body, first dull then intense. He looked up at the blue sky through his left eye. His right eye was swollen shut. No amount of his own effort would open it. He tried to move his head to the side. It wouldn't move. He tried the other side. Nope. A woman's face came into view, upside down. Okay, you just take it easy, said the EMT staring down at him. You've had quite the morning. Before he could speak, he was lifted up into the air. There was a metal click as the gurney legs dropped and he was wheeled backwards. Reaching down with his hand, his gun was gone. Slowly, he began to process his situation. He was alive. Generally, that had to be regarded as a plus. He was injured, but he wasn't sure where and how badly. He took a gradual, almost philosophical inventory of his body, as he was experiencing it. Fingers moving? With pain but yes. Toes moving? Yes and not as much pain. Breathing? Painful. Everything else varied from aching to sharp jabs of agony. It was pretty much what he'd have expected from spending multiple minutes on the ground, being used as a punch bag. He started to piece together the beating. He guessed he must have blacked out after the last head stomp, and his two attackers had either decided they'd made their point, or been scared off by whoever was shouting at him. Likely, it had been a combination of both. Locke cursed himself for falling for such an obvious come on. A come on being close protection lingo for an obvious distraction, in this case the slash tire that he'd bent down to inspect. It was bodyguarding 101 stuff. Rudimentary stuff. In some ways falling for it hurt worse than any of his physical injuries. His mind flashed to Carmen. Oh brother, he said to himself, she is going to be pissed. 17. Come on get you stank ass up and help me clean this place up before daddy gets here. Soothe yanked the blanket from Kristen. Come on bitch. Hurry. Wiping away the sleep rocks from her eyes, Kristen got out of bed and followed Soothe through into the kitchen where Soothe was manically throwing empty bottles into the trash and emptying the ashtrays. She hauled open a cupboard under the sink and produced a cloth and some kitchen surface cleaner. She handed them off to Kristen with the instruction to wipe down the counters. As Soothe scraped plates and loaded the dishwasher, Kristen helped her clean. She was sore from the night before and she desperately needed some coffee but she didn't dare ask. She'd never seen Sooth like this. By daddy she guessed that she had met Hanger, Sooth's pimp. Kristen hadn't met him properly yet only caught glimpses of him when he came by to collect money from Sooth. He hadn't seemed like Kristen had imagined a pimp would look like. Sure he wore a lot of jewelry and he had a lot of tattoos and cornrows, but so did a lot of people. One thing was for sure though, Sooth seemed to be besotted with him the same way that Kristen had been with Andre. She was also scared. Daddy hates the place being a mess. 
you're going to have to clean yourself up too, girl. Kristen looked at her. Why? Why'd you think? Kristen didn't know. You're some kind of dummy girl. He's coming over to see you, and then we're going out. Sooth put a hand to her temple. I need an aspirin. A knock at the door sent her into a fresh panic. Go on clean up and put on some makeup, Sooth said, shooing her out of the kitchen. Kristen emerged from the bedroom to find Hanger sitting in the middle of the couch sipping a drink. Even though the shades were closed, he was wearing sunglasses. Sooth sat quietly next to him. As Kristen walked in, he raised his sunglasses, looked at her appraising L.Y., and then dropped them back down. He didn't say anything. Neither did Sooth. Kristen flattened down the dress Sooth had given her to wear for his visit. You like it, she said to Sooth. Hanger took his sunglasses off. Why are you asking her? His voice was soft with menace. He had ice blue eyes that never left her. She shuffled her feet and said, I don't know. Come sit down, he said, pointing her to the armchair across from the couch. She did as she was told. The vibe was strange, like being called into the principal's office. She felt like she'd done something wrong somehow, but she couldn't think what it could have been. She'd done what Sooth had asked her to. She'd made money, and she'd handed it over every last dime. Seconds passed. Then a minute. Hanger just stared at her. She wasn't sure where to look. Finally he smiled. So you turned on to the life now? It took a moment for Kristen to comprehend what he was saying. Sooth had said the same thing after Kristen's first night out on the track. Yeah, said Kristen shyly. I guess so. So who was it, said Hanger. This time she didn't follow. Who was what? I know it wasn't Andre, said Hanger. Now she knew what he meant. She looked at Sooth. Had Sooth told him? Had Sooth shared her secret? Her cheeks burned hot, flushed with blood and shame. It don't matter, said Hanger. You hear now. You like this place? You like being with Sooth? Happy that the conversation had moved on, Kristen smiled. Yeah, she's like a big sister. Hanger let out a rasping laugh. Yeah. I can see that. The laugh faded. His eyes locked onto her again. So girl, you ready to choose up? Choose. Sooth had told her what it meant. Did she want Hanger to be her pimp? To be the one who took care of her? It was a strange word. It implied two options. One was to stay here, and the other was to go home. But she didn't know how going home would even work now. She had been here less than a few days, but it felt like weeks, months even. Like the kids in the story who had stepped into Narnia, she wasn't sure how she could find her way back. It was like she had been in one world, and now she was in another. Like she died, only she'd felt dead before. This was a different kind of dead, that was all. I think so, she said, hesitant. Hanger laughed again, but this laugh seemed a little more dangerous. His head turned, and he looked at Sooth who was chewing at the edge of a nail. Suddenly Hanger reached over and slapped Sooth's hand, bringing his ring knuckles down so hard that he drew blood. Bitch, what have I told you about doing that, he shouted. Sooth shrank back into the couch, eyes down, her body folding in on itself. Her reaction scared Kristen. Sooth had always seemed so confident, almost superhuman in her lack of fear. Not now. Not in front of Hanger. Sorry, said Sooth. Hanger rattled the ice cubes in his empty glass. He handed it to Sooth. Freshen that up for me, he said. Head down, she got up and disappeared into the kitchen to make Hanger another drink. Kristen wondered if she could excuse herself to go to the bathroom, but she didn't want to do anything that might incur his wrath. He patted the couch where Sooth had been sitting. Sit here. She did as she'd been told. He waved his hand in the air. Relax, that wasn't anything. You don't have to be scared of me. I have to be like this so I can keep all y'all safe. 
You understand? She didn't, but she nodded anyway. Sooth hustled back in with his drink. She took the chair where Kristen had been sitting. Hanger took a sip and made a sound of quiet satisfaction. He looked at Kristen, then over to Sooth and back again. So what is it, said Sooth. You staying with us? Sooth had already explained to her that without someone like Hanger, she wouldn't last any length of time out on the streets on her own. It was too dangerous. And she'd gone on this way, she didn't have to worry about anything. No school, no bills, they could party as much as they wanted as long as they worked. And once Hanger deemed her ready, she could move off the track. She could move inside, and ultimately, there would be the casinos in Vegas and Atlantic City. She'd also told Kristen that while there were other men like Hanger, they could be far worse. More violent. More demanding. It had all seemed to make sense to Kristen. Yes, said Kristen. I'll choose up. All right then, said Hanger, raising his glass in a mock toast. You're in the pocket now. For real. He got up, beckoning Kristen towards him with his finger. She got up and walked over to him. He turned, and she followed him out of the room and into the bedroom. Sooth trailed behind. Get up on the bed, said Hanger. We're going to need us some pictures, and we're going to need to get you a name. 18. Locke's prediction about Carmen being less than happy about his having been beaten up, proved unerringly accurate. Standing at his bedside, he was treated to a good five minutes of English and Spanish that tested the limits of his vocabulary in both languages. At one point he thought that she might need some oxygen to keep going. Finally her emotions seemed to subside, and she sunk her face into the pillow next to him. Oh my god, Ryan. I'm sorry. I just saw you and... You could have been killed. You should see the other guys, he quipped, every word that passed his lips hurting his chest. Not a mark on them. That's not funny, Carmen shot back. It kind of was, he thought, but he didn't exactly blame her for not seeing it. You speak to anyone? What's the verdict? Anything broken, he asked. Mercifully, no, she said. Although you were concussed, so they're going to want to do some more scans. He was going to make a joke about brain damage and not having much of one left to damage, but decided against it. He doubted she'd be in the mood for laughter in the dark for a while yet. He'd slipped. No question about that. He'd made a rookie mistake and paid a price that could have been higher, but a price nonetheless. At the same time, he hadn't regretted going down there. Not even a bit. His body would heal. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't mean to ruin Christmas for you. She reached out and took his hand in hers. The curtain was swept back, and a hospital orderly stepped into the bay. Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but I have to take Mr. Locke here for his scan. Carmen stood up, not letting go of his hand. She bent down to kiss him on the cheek. Even that hurt. They'd got him good, he'd give them that much. I'll see you later, okay? said Carmen, tearing up slightly. The sight of her upset stung him worse than anything he'd felt so far. Maybe this had been a bad idea. But he was in it now. Going down there and seeing what he had, there was no way he could give up. To do so would be a betrayal, not just of this young girl and her family, but of who he was and what he stood for. 19. A blast of freezing air whipped through the diner as the door opened, and the six-foot-four-inch African-American Marine veteran walked in from the icy darkness. Ty Johnson stopped for a moment, his gaze sweeping the room. Finally his stare, colder than the December air outside, settled on the corner booth. Ty walked over to it, looming over the dandily dressed man pressed into the corner, surrounded by three of his stable of girls. Ladies, said Ty politely. If you wouldn't mind leaving us for a moment. One of them made the mistake of looking at Ty. Bitch, keep your eyes down, Monocle chided as she scooted out of the booth. What the fuck you want, he said to Ty. Ty didn't answer. 
He reached down a huge hand and closed it tight around the man's neck, lifting him directly up and pushing his head against the wall. I want you, said Tai. No one in the diner was going to call the cops. Not unless he beat the shit out of this guy right here where people were sipping their coffee. Even then, he doubted it. Not that he had any intention of beating the guy up here. More than Locke, Tai knew the etiquette of places like this. He'd grown up around them, if not directly in them. Monocle's hand reached down, feeling for a weapon. Tai grabbed his wrist with the hand that wasn't around the man's throat and snapped his wrist back until he heard a pop. He fished into Monocle's waistband and pulled out a knife. He tossed it onto the table and eased the man out from the booth. Monocle's feet dangled in the air as Tai lifted him up by the throat, his thumb pressing into his mandibular nerve. As everyone went quiet, Tai set him down, spun him round and shoved him hard towards the swing doors that led into the kitchen. Moving at speed, he pushed Monocle through the kitchen. The cooks and dishwashers and busboys ignored what is happening. This seemed to be a private matter, and as long as no one was killed in their kitchen, it wasn't really anything that concerned them. You're making a big mistake, said Monocle, who seemed to have recovered a fraction of his composure. Ah, ah said Tai, giving him a fresh shove into a narrow corridor stacked with boxes. A stack of boxes tumbling over, drawing a shout from one of the busboys. Sorry fellas, said Tai. We're just leaving. Tai grabbed Monocle by the scruff of the neck. He used his head to open the fire door that led out into the alleyway. The sudden appearance startled a couple behind a dumpster, the girl glassy-eyed, the guy dressed in a business suit staring defiantly at Tai. Returning his stare with interest, the John decided to beat a tactical retreat. Monocle got to his feet, turned around and squared up to Tai, falling back into a boxing stance. He just faced the moment that every pimp feared, public humiliation, which was precisely why Tai had done what he had so publicly. Now no doubt Monocle figured that he had nothing left to lose. Tai intended to disprove that theory. Monocle circled to Tai's outside throwing a sharp jab his rings flashing through the air. Tai kept his feet planted but moved his upper body and head back. He wanted Monocle to stay close, to think that he had a measure of the distance. As Monocle threw another jab, Tai sunk down, dove forward and wrapped his arms around the top of Monocle's legs. He picked him up, carried him the short distance across the alley to one of the metal dumpsters and slammed him into the side of it. He let out a sharp gasp as the air rushed from his lungs and lay there, his back against the dumpster. Tai reached down, grabbed his throat again and swept his legs out so that he was lying flat. Then he knelt a knee on Monocle's solar plexus. The impact of the takedown seemed to have taken the last of the fight from him. Tai spoke slowly, keeping his voice low and calm. Listen up, you fucked with the wrong people. That can happen. You weren't to know. So I'm going to give you one chance to make things right. Tai took the man's right hand and began to yank off his rings one by one. He drew back his hand, resisting. Tai sunk his knee harder into Monocle's chest. Don't fight, said Tai like he was talking to an errant schoolboy. Now you are going to tell everything about your buddy Hanger. His real name. What he looks like. Where his crib is. Where else he hangs out. The name of all his girls. Whether he prefers Wheaties or Captain Crunch cereal. You're giving me the whole nine. And in return, I'm not going to take you somewhere quiet and torture you. Monocle looked up at the huge marine, eyes wide. There was nothing in Tai's tone to suggest that he wouldn't make good on his promise. Now, said Tai, if I can't appeal to your own sense of self-preservation, look at it as a business decision. A smart one. Hangers out of the way, and you can scoop up his girls. How many has he got? Four or five girls? Seven, said Monocle. Tai let out a low whistle. Seven, huh? Impressive. Obviously Kristen's going home, you understand that much, don't you? Monocle nodded without saying anything. Good, said Tai. So you get six more girls out there making you money. Think of it as a mergers and acquisitions move. Okay, said Monocle. 
Ty was struggling to slide Monocle's pinky ring from his finger. It wouldn't move past the knuckle. There's always one tricky one, isn't there? said Ty, reaching into his pocket and producing a pair of small gardening scissors. Monocle's pupils widened. See if you can get that one off for me, would you? said Ty. Monocle grabbed the ring and worked furiously to release it from his finger. They ain't worth anything. Most of them ain't real diamonds, said Monocle. Don't you worry about that. You just start telling me what I need to know. Ty grabbed his phone and set the voice recording app he had to record. Monocle started talking. It seemed like once he started, he couldn't stop. Details spilled from his mouth. As Ty recorded, he started to put some of Monocle's rings on his own fingers, casually and without explanation. Most wouldn't go on. He had to take the widest ones and put them on his pinky and ring fingers. The others he discarded. No one knew Hanger's real name. Ty accepted that. It wasn't all that unusual in criminal and general scumbag circles not to know given names. But he did cough up a lot of other intel that they would be able to use. He prompted Monocle a few times, but ten minutes in, he'd gotten the bulk of what he was going to get. He had the street names of the girls who Hanger pimped. He had some of his favorite hangouts. He had one address, an apartment where Hanger sometimes crashed. More than enough to keep them going. So, said Monocle. We good? Ty cocked his head to one side. Are we good, he repeated. Almost. Hey man, I told you everything I know. You know what he'll do if he finds out I snitched. Hanger's like the devil. He's pure evil. Different level. Ty said nothing. You want my rings? Take them. Take my wallet too, said Monocle. There's one more thing, Ty said finally. Oh yeah? What's that? This, said Ty, drawing back his fist and punching Monocle hard in the face. The prostrate man tried to cover up as Ty pounded punch after punch into his face. When he couldn't land as well as he wanted, he moved to Monocle's body. Monocle flailed like a fish on the deck of the boat. Ty kept going until the man's was a bloodied pulped mess and his teeth lay on the ground. After a while, Ty got up. Slowly he took the rings off one by one and tossed them in the dumpster. Then he knelt down, hauled Monocle up over his shoulder in a fireman's carry, and threw him into the dumpster. Ty walked deeper into the alleyway where his car was already parked. He got in, gunned the engine and took off, roaring past the dumpster and whipping a hard left turn out onto the street. 20. Kristen was fast asleep when someone shook her awake. She startled as her eyes opened and standing over her wasn't soothed but hanger, his eyes wide and bloodshot. Get up and pack your shit. Wait. What's going on? She propped herself up on one elbow, still thinking she might be dreaming. They had only gotten home an hour before. Exhausted and sore from a busy night on a different track, she'd crawled into bed and was fast asleep seconds after her head hit the pillow. His hand grabbed her wrist, twisting it hard. His other hand reached over and grabbed her by the hair. She almost fell out of the bed. He let go and kicked her hard in the side, knocking her back against the side of the bed. Don't ever make me repeat myself. You hear me? She nodded, tears starting to stream down her face. He left. She stood up, clutching her side, and started to look around. Mercifully Sooth appeared with a suitcase in each hand. She opened the closet and started throwing stuff into one suitcase, seemingly at random. The other suitcase she tossed onto the bed. Kristen began grabbing whatever she could see and stuffing it into the suitcase on the bed. She had no idea what was going on. She wasn't about to ask again. So she just did what she'd been told to do. Sooth threw one of her jackets. Here put this on. We got a split. With a random assortment of clothes and makeup jammed into the suitcases, they stumbled out of the apartment and into the hallway. Sooth locked up. Hanger was nowhere to be seen. 
The building was quiet as they hauled the suitcases to the elevator, down to the lobby and out into the cold night air. A black BMW sat, engine idling at the curb, hanger behind the wheel. The trunk popped open and they threw their suitcases in. Sooth walked around to the front passenger seat. Kristen got in back. It was a nice car. The leather interior smelled brand new. She had been inside more cars in the past few days than she had in her previous 14 years. Most of them, like the men who picked her up in them, smelled bad. She was still too shocked and frightened to ask what was going on. She couldn't say why, but she sensed it was something to do with her. Hanger glared at her in the rearview mirror, confirming her suspicion. You're going to need to make me a whole bunch of money to make up for this. She wanted to ask what he meant. Before she might have, but she knew better. Sooth had explained to her the rules of the pocket. You didn't speak to Hanger unless he asked you something. You never made eye contact with another pimp. Ever. That would get you a beating. Maybe worse. You did what you were told when you were told. Hanger lapsed back into a gloomy, spiteful silence. Kristen couldn't think of anything she had done wrong. She stared out the window as they drove. They reached the freeway and kept driving. She had no idea where they were, but they seemed to be heading east, out of Los Angeles. The car was warm and still exhausted from working, Kristen fell asleep. The car coming to a stop woke her up. They were outside a motel. Sooth got out, pulled on sweats and walked to the manager's office. Hanger lowered the window and smoked a joint. He seemed calmer but Kristen kept her eyes half shut so he'd still think she was sleeping. Five minutes later, Sooth was back. Hanger drove around to the back of the motel. They all got out. Hanger opened the trunk without getting out. Sooth and Kristen had to pull the luggage out and stagger up the stairs to the room. Halfway up the stairs, Kristen saw the BMW reverse out of the spot and screech out of the parking lot. Kristen was glad to see him go. Maybe now she'd be told what was going on. Inside the room was basic. Two double beds. A TV. A desk. A wardrobe. A bathroom with a toilet, sink, and a shower. Finally as they unpacked, Kristen found the courage to ask, How long are we going to be here? Sue shrugged. Get some sleep. You're going to be real busy. Kristen's stomach turned over at the thought of what that meant. 21. Just don't go getting yourself arrested, said Locke, his head propped up by several gleaming white hospital pillows. Ty waved away his concern. People like that don't go to the cops, and even if they did, what are they going to say? I helped my buddy beat the shit out of some dude that was looking for a child, my buddy's pimping out. In any case, fuck that guy. He's lucky I left him breathing. I still can't believe they caught me like that. Rookie error. It happens, especially when you're retired, said Ty with a hint of a smile. You get rusty. It's not gonna happen again, I'll tell you that. This asshole hanger, he's mine. So what else did you get from this guy? Ty gave him a quick summary of the information that Monocle had coughed up. Can you pass me that? said Locke with a nod to the locker. Ty picked up the glass of water and handed it to Locke. He took a sip, grimacing with the pain of even this most basic of actions. What they giving you for the pain? Vicodin, said Locke. Think that's what it is. Nice sprint, Ty. Just don't go getting hooked. Opiates can be kind of moorish. Don't worry. I'm checking out later. You sure that's a good idea? said Ty. Nope, but no one's going to find that girl with me lying here. I got you covered. Ty, this is my crusade, remember? And now it's mine too. You know it's a pro bono deal, said Locke. He was sure he'd mentioned this part to Ty before, but he wanted to make sure. There would be no payment, only costs, and he doubted many of them would even be tax deductible. Yeah, I'm not a fan of working for free, said Ty. But I guess I can make an exception just this once. 
Block took another sip of water. It is just this once, right? said Ty, his face clouded with concern. I'm not sure Carmen would be happy with me doing this full time. Not if it means this, said Locke, taking in the hospital room. Yeah, I know, said Ty. Kind of ironic. All the situations we've been in, and you end up catching a beating on something low end like this. Thanks, but you don't have to remind me. Ty stood up. He patted the end of the bed. I got some leads to follow up. Don't go doing anything crazy. Rest up for a few days. I can take up the slack until you're back on your feet. You sound like Carmen, said Locke. I mean it, said Ty. Give it a few days before you get back in the game. Don't worry, I'll take it easy for a while, said Locke, noncommittal. 22. As he got out of his car and headed for the entrance to the apartment block, Ty thought about the scene in the movie Pulp Fiction, where Samuel L. Jackson's character talked about how his girlfriend being a vegetarian meant that he had to be one. This situation, he reflected, was a little like that. Because Locke had got bored and decided to go on a crusade, now Ty was on one too. On the other hand, Locke had saved his ass more times than he cared to count. So what the hell, he guessed a few days tracking down this kid wasn't the end of the world. They'd find her, take her with them, and then he could get back to paying clients. Apart from the height of hostilities in Afghanistan and Iraq, Ty couldn't remember a time when the security business had been so in demand, not in America anyway. People were scared. Especially rich people. Having spent time in actual war zones, he didn't get it. He assumed it was down to reading the news and watching TV, and the constant consumption of social media, which often painted a picture of the nation he didn't recognize. All that said, fear was good when you were someone who sold safety and reassurance. Timing his jog up the short flight of stairs to coincide with someone coming out, he held the door open as a woman came out carrying a tiny dog on a leash. She looked at him but didn't say anything, which figured. The apartment building was a little down at heel, and given the person he was looking for, Hanger's bottom girl who went by the name Soothe, Ty figured that male visitors might just be a regular feature. In the lobby he checked the mailbox and the apartment number. 203. Second floor. The mailbox for the apartment looked to be empty. That was good news, a sign that Soothe and possibly Kristen might be up there. Ty's plan was simple. Get inside somehow. If Kristen was there, make sure she didn't leave and call the cops. If they didn't respond fast enough or things got heated, he would put her in his car and drive her home himself. Locke had already given him the Miller family address. The elevator was, unsurprisingly, out of order. The building reminded him of a lot of people in LA, something that the sunshine made look fine from a distance. He took the stairs two at a time, taking the opportunity to work off some of the turkey and sweet potato pie he'd owed it on. He pushed out into the corridor, turned a corner and there it was. Apartment number 203. With a loud rap of the knuckles, he stayed close to the door to see if he could hear movement, his hand pressed flat against the peephole so no one looking out could see him. Nothing. No response. No sound from inside. He tried again. If anyone was inside, they were staying quiet. He wondered if Monocle had coughed up a fake address, but doubted it. Monocle may have backed up his buddy when they beat up Locke, but Ty had put some real fear in the man. It was more likely that he'd tipped off Hanger. There was only one way to find out. Stepping back, Ty launched a heavy boot at the edge of the doorframe. Cheap door. Cheap lock. It gave way on the second attempt, the frame splintering. None of the neighbors opened their door to see what was going on. Ty stepped inside, his gun drawn just in case Hanger was waiting on the inside. Pushing the front door closed behind him, he moved silently into the apartment. Dirty dishes and empty food containers and liquor bottles were strewn across a small kitchen. The dishes filled the sink and spilled over onto the counter. A cockroach made a sudden dash for safety as Ty took a closer look. On a small breakfast table, an ashtray overflowed with lipstick-smeared cigarette butts. A half-empty bottle of vodka sat next to it. 
It was impossible to tell if they had left in a hurry or whether the filth and squalor was a regular feature of a chaotic lifestyle. The motif continued in the living room. A muted TV was tuned to a rap music channel. There were more bottles here. Ty lifted a small clear plastic bag full of marijuana buds. He set it back down and moved into a bedroom. Clothes were strewn across the bed and floor. He checked the closet for suitcases and bags and didn't see any. They had split. In a hurry. He would bet on it. He took a quick video, panning across the clothes. Perhaps Kristen's mom would spot an item she recognized from her daughter's wardrobe, and they would have confirmation that she'd been here, even if she wasn't here now. If someone did see the breach door, or had heard him kick it in and decided to call the cops, he planned on telling them why he was here and hoping for the best. But it was a conversation he'd rather avoid if he could. Breaking and entering was still just that, regardless of how noble your motive was. A final sweep of the place threw up a utility bill. It had what he assumed was Sue's real name, Desiree Washington. He took a picture of the bill with his phone and walked out, pulling the door closed behind him. Pulling up his collar, he flew back down the stairs and walked back outside to his car. Ty drove a few blocks down and pulled into a McDonald's parking lot. He called Locke. He didn't pick up. He left a voicemail, giving his partner the bad news Monocle had given him another lead, but this one Ty suspected would be a lot harder to chase down. 23. Dressed in her standard business attire, Carmen walked into the bedroom where Locke was sitting up in bed, papers and books about human trafficking scattered all around him. She'd reluctantly agreed to him discharging himself, but on condition that he rested up at home. The doctors were fairly sure he'd suffered a concussion and told him that driving would be a bad idea, never mind anything else. Leaning down Carmen kissed him. I have to go into the office. No sneaking out. As if I would, said Locke, feigning shock that she'd think he would. I mean it, Ryan. His cell phone lit up with an incoming call. It was Jenny Chu. I have to take this, he said. Call me later and let me know what you'd like for dinner. I'll pick something up on the way home. He nodded, picking up the call as Carmen walked out of the bedroom. He heard her hunting for her car keys and then the front door closed behind her. What you got for me? he asked Jenny. Okay, so I managed to access the phone records for Kristen's cell phone. And? Goes cold shortly after she goes missing. No outgoing calls. Looks like it was switched off entirely. Locke sank back a little further into the pillows. It was the result he'd expected, but it was still disappointing. Sorry, said Jenny. Listen, thanks for looking into it, he told her. I did find something though. He sat up. Oh yeah? Yeah, after you left, I got kind of interested in this whole trafficking deal, and how it's pretty much internet-based these days. What do you mean, said Locke? You heard of a website called Backpage? No. He grabbed his laptop and typed in the name. Don't go looking for it, said Jenny. It was shut down by the feds back in 2018, but it was basically like a classified ad site for sex workers. Including people who'd been trafficked. You could go on and see who was available in your area, call a number and hey, presto. Plus, anyone could put up a listing as long as they paid the fee and checked a box saying the person was over 18. It wasn't like they were checking, and if they had been, people could upload a fake ID. This was all interesting and unsurprising, but he wasn't sure what it had to do with finding Kristen Miller, especially as it had been shut down. But you just said it was shut down. It was, said Jenny. But cyberspace abhors a vacuum, so there's now a bunch of other sites, most of them hosted outside the US that do the same job. So we should start looking there? No need, said Jenny. I already did, and I think I might have found her. Locke pushed himself up so he was sitting upright. Still holding the cell phone in one hand, he swung his legs out of bed. The sudden movement made him feel suddenly woozy. 
His stomach lurched and for a second he thought he might throw up on the bedroom carpet. He steadied himself and stayed still. Great work, that's amazing. Yeah, I thought so, said Jenny, ever modest. Anyway, I said might because the faces are blurred out on these things. There's software you can use to unblur them, but it's not like it gives you a totally clear image. For what I can see, it looks like her, but the description fits. I mean the listing says she's 19 because they're not going to give her real age, but it could be her. Can you send it over to me? On the other end of the line, he heard Jenny pecking at a keyboard. Done. Hey, when you spoke to her family, did they say anything about a birthmark or a tattoo? No, I don't think they mentioned either of those. In fact, I'm sure her mom said she didn't have any tattoos, only that her ears were pierced. Jenny's email pinged into his inbox. He opened it and clicked on the link she'd attached without looking at it. Okay, scratch that then. This girl has both. The sound of her deflation matched his own. It seemed like every time it looked like they were about to get a solid lead, it turned out to be nothing they could actually use. I can take a look at the site, said Locke. But we think they had her out working on the street. Okay, said Jenny. I suppose I haven't found her then. Would have been cool though. Listen, I appreciate you going the extra yard. Hey, these people are scum of the earth. I'll keep looking. Let me know when you find her. Will do. Thanks again. Locke took a moment as he sat on the edge of the bed. He really needed to take a leak, and he could use a shower. The shower would probably wait, but the call of nature wouldn't. Slowly he eased himself up onto his feet and took several tentative steps. He felt strange, disoriented. He focused on his breathing, inhaling for four seconds, holding for another four before slowly exhaling. A few more steps and he was at the bathroom door. He grabbed the sink for support and made it to the toilet. Now he had a debate. Stand up and pee like a man or sit down and pee like a man who felt he might black out. Screw it, he said to himself. He would stand. When the time came that his only option was to sit down to relieve himself, he'd stick stones in his pockets and go for a long swim. He heard the front door close. Carmen? They had a cleaner twice a week, but they'd given her a paid vacation over the holidays, something that apparently made them a rarity among the people that employed her. Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot something, he heard Carmen saying. You're not out of bed, are you? I needed to take a leak, he called through the closed bathroom door. He finished up, washed his hands and walked back out into the bedroom. Carmen was holding his laptop up. She turned the screen around. This better be to do with this case, she said laughing. Yeah, said Locke, tired from his short excursion across the carpet. Jenny found it, she thought it might be Kristen, but it doesn't check out with the description. No tattoo, huh? said Carmen studying the provocative picture gallery that showed a young woman on a bed. Nope. They didn't mention a birthmark either, but I'm going to call them just to be sure. That's a really bad tattoo as well, said Carmen. I mean, what does that even mean? Is it like a band or something? Locke's head started to spin again. He kept his game face on. The last thing he needed was to collapse in front of Carmen. She'd never let him back out to work on the case this side of Easter, if he did that. What, he said. I haven't really looked at it yet. She turned the screen back round. Hanger. Have you heard of them? 24. Kristen didn't think that being inside could be worse than being out in the freezing cold on the track. After all, she was inside. It was warm. There was a bed rather than the cramped seats of a car, and there was a bathroom where she could clean up, and so could the men. She had been wrong. Out on the track, she might have had a half hour between being dropped off and finding a new trick. Here the men arrived in an endless procession. There were so many of them that she lost count. Sometimes Sooth would have to wait to give a man waiting downstairs the room number because the one Kristen was with hadn't finished. 
Hanger had disappeared, leaving Sooth and Kristen alone. Kristen had thought they would share the Johns, but Sooth didn't seem interested in that. She answered the phone and sat outside, smoking and waiting for the next call. One hour melted into another, until time lost any meaning. After every man, Sooth would come in and take the money they had left. Then she would tell Kristen to get ready, because the next guy was outside. When Kristen had complained about being hungry, Sooth had walked over and pinched her stomach, hard enough to make Kristen yelp. You could use losing some of that puppy fat anyway, bitch. There's a time to party and there's a time to work, and this is work time. Day passed to night. Still the men arrived, did what they wanted, and left. One choked her so hard that she passed out. When she came to, he was gone, and Sooth was standing over her asking where the money is. When Kristen told her what had happened, Sooth slapped her and told her she'd have to make it up. After a time, Kristen seemed to go somewhere else again. She watched herself from above, like her shadow had slipped from her body. Then it was over. As she waited for the next man, Sooth came back in, collected the money and told her to go take a shower because they were going out. Kristen stared at her. All she wanted to do now was sleep. You can sleep later, said Sooth. I thought you said you were hungry, bitch. I was, said Kristen. I mean, I am. Quit complaining and go shower, you smell skanky. Sooth took her to a diner. They sat together at a booth near the kitchen. At one point the kitchen doors swung open and Kristen glimpsed a man hunched over a range. He was fat and sweaty, and she recognized him as one of the men who had visited her motel room. He looked up. Their eyes met for a second and then as she saw a flicker of recognition as to where he knew her from, he quickly looked away, like he was ashamed. The doors swung shut and Kristen had lost her appetite. She picked at the food on her plate. Sooth scolded her for not eating and called for the check. She paid and Kristen followed her back outside where a cab was waiting. Come on, said Sooth, getting in. Where are we going? Sooth held the door open. We're going to make you official. Kristen didn't know what she meant, and she didn't want to ask in case Sooth got mad or changed her mind. Right now, anything that avoided her having to go back to the motel room came as a relief. 25. Ty stared up at the building, a six-story brownstone with an ornate metal entrance, three blocks from the ocean in Santa Monica. It was going to be difficult to get inside the building, never mind the apartment, especially at this time of day. That was why he'd come up with an alternative plan. One that may have been short on subtlety, but scored high on impact. A well-heeled couple in their forties, residents by the looks of them, walked towards the entrance. They were in workout clothes, although neither looked to have broken much of a sweat. They eyed Ty with suspicion as he pulled out his bundle of flyers. Excuse me, said Ty. I'm sorry to bother you. The guy waved him off, patting his pockets. Sorry, buddy, I don't have any change. I'm not panhandling, brother, said Ty, mock offended and making sure they couldn't easily step around him. We're kind of in a hurry, said the woman, shooting a nervy look at her male companion. Ty handed them one of his freshly printed flyers. On it was a picture of Hanger. Above the picture, in large lettering, it read, Have you seen this man? Below the picture read, Wanted for child sex trafficking. Then there was a phone number. The woman took it without looking at it. Thanks, she said with a tight smile, moving to step around him and get to the entrance. Ty shifted over a step. Look at it, he said. It's important. She glanced down. Listen, we don't want any trouble, said the guy. All the more reason you should look at it too, said Ty. In fact, don't just look, read what it says back to me. Do that, and I'll get out of your way. The exchange had gotten tense. Ty felt bad. They were just two people trying to get back into their apartment after yoga, or a run on the beach, or whatever rich white people did that passed for exercise. Listen buddy, I'm not reading it back to you. Now do you want me to call the cops? As the guy argued, the woman started to study it. 
Oh my god, Lawrence, she blurted out, jabbing a finger at the picture. This guy lives here. Lawrence looked down at the flyer. His expression shifted from one of annoyance to one tinged with skeptical concern. Ty took a step back. I apologize, I didn't mean to come off rude like that. It's just that, I don't know you may have children living around here. I don't understand, said Lawrence. Anyone renting or buying here has to undergo a background check before the co-op board approve them. Ty had no idea if Hanger had ever been convicted. He doubted it. He'd probably been arrested a bunch of times, maybe even convicted on lesser charges, if at all. But if he'd been found guilty of trafficking, it was unlikely he'd still be out here doing what he was doing to kids like Kristen. Sometimes people slip through the cracks or people miss things when they run checks, said Ty. The guy wasn't buying it. The woman was more concerned. Women were usually more tuned in to stuff like this. A lot of men's instant reaction was one of disbelief. If you didn't have to spend your whole life dealing with creeps, you were less likely to understand how many of them there were out there. Listen, I'm not a cop. I'm just helping out a family whose daughter got tangled up with this man, said Ty. She's only 14. Is there anything we can do to help, the woman said. Ty thought about it. I'd really like to be able to put one of these in each of your neighbor's mailboxes. If you could let me in to do that, that would be great. I don't know, said Lawrence. Counting out a few dozen flyers, Ty held them out to him. Or if you're not comfortable, maybe you could do it for me. That seemed to do the trick. The guy pushed away the fistful of flyers like they were a bomb. He clearly did not want to get involved. He stepped back. Why don't you go ahead and do it? But you have to leave after you've done it. This is a quiet building, we don't want any trouble. I understand completely, said Ty. No trouble. And you're positive he's guilty, because, you know, if he's not, then you could be in a lot of legal trouble. If there was one thing Ty knew about a piece of shit like Hanger, it was that they enjoyed attention about as much as a cockroach enjoyed the beam of a flashlight. Sure, Hanger could try to sue him for libel, but that would involve going to court, and court was the last place that someone like this wanted to be anywhere near. Don't worry, Ty reassured the couple. I'm a hundred percent. Okay then, said Lawrence, still not convinced. Ty stepped out of the way and followed them up the short flight of stone stairs through the gate and into the cool stone floor lobby area. Thanks for your help, said Ty, walking over to the mailboxes as the couple made for the elevator. Oh, I probably don't want to drop one of these in his mailbox. You know that trouble thing you wanted to avoid. 3C, said the woman. Thanks, said Ty, waiting until the elevator doors closed before heading to the stairwell. 26. Kristen clenched her teeth at the low buzzing sound of the tattoo gun. The needle jabbed her skin. Try to stay still, said the tattooist, an acne-ridden young skinhead sporting a screwdriver t-shirt. Sorry, said Kristen, settling back into the chair and closing her eyes. It hurt like hell but she found the pain strangely soothing. It was so immediate, so pronounced, that she couldn't think of anything else. That came as a relief. There was only the staccato jab of needle into flesh, rather than the endless loop of nightmare images from the past few days. How long had it been? She tried to recall. Nothing came to her. She didn't know the day of the week, never mind the date. She had left before Christmas and now it was what? She didn't think it was the new year because she was sure Sooth would have partied. Or maybe they had, and Kristen had already forgotten. The tattooist wiped a cloth across the patch of flesh just above her hip to reveal a letter H. He glanced back over his shoulder at Sooth, who was smoking a cigarette and leafing through a tattoo magazine. We doing property of, or just the name? Just the name, said Sooth. You got it, he said, switching the gun back on and going to work on the next letter in Hanger's name. 27. A couple of restaurant menus poked out from under the door of apartment 3C, harbingers of the bad news that Hanger wasn't home. 
Tai knocked anyway, stepping off again so that no one inside could see him unless they opened the door. When no one answered, Tai knocked again. He pressed his hand to the door. It was sturdy and from a quick look, well secured. It was the type of door he would recommend to one of his clients, out in Arcadia. The only way inside would be to use a very good locksmith or a battering ram, and neither of those was an option right now. He took one of his home-produced flyers, grabbed a sharpie, and drew an arrow pointing to Hanger's face, before propping the flyer against the foot of the door so that Hanger wouldn't miss it upon his eventual return. Ty took the elevator back down. The lobby was quiet. He walked back over to the mailboxes and was about to drop another flyer into Hanger's mailbox when he saw a sliver of white envelope poking out. Pinching the nails of his finger and thumb together, Ty managed to work it out. It took some delicate maneuvering, but after a minute he extracted it. He turned it over and smiled as he read the name on the envelope, Carl Gowdy. Jamming the envelope into his pocket, he stuffed his flyer through the gap. 28. Wow, you really took a beating, didn't you? said Angie, as Locke limped his way out of his car outside the Miller household. You should see the other guy, said Locke. She shot him a wry smile. Let me guess, not a mark on him? Locke laughed. It hurt. The way she'd said it wasn't entirely unsympathetic. But it did have the tone of someone who was familiar with being the nail rather than the hammer. Angie had chosen not to see herself as a victim. She told Locke that the first time they'd met. She'd also told him a little about her time on the other side of the fence. It was a story that held more than its fair share of violence, physical as well as emotional. Locke had reflected that most people went through an entire career in the military and experienced less violence and trauma than a teenager out on the streets for a couple of years. No one held any parades for them either. Angie rang the bell, Locke by her side. After a while, Joyce Miller opened the door. She looked beyond exhausted. It had only been a few days since Locke had seen her last, but it may as well have been years. Her daughter's continued absence was taking its toll, and Locke wished now he'd been able to bring some good news. What happened to your face? Kristen's mom said. Oh this, said Locke, playing it off. It's nothing. A slight misunderstanding. May we come in? Oh yes, of course. Angie gave her a hug, and Locke followed them into the living room. Kristen's grandfather was nowhere to be seen. Locke decided to start by ripping off the first band-aid. We haven't found Kristen yet, he said. But we do have some promising leads, and I'm hopeful that it won't be too much longer. I'm just so grateful that you're helping, said Joyce. I spoke with the sheriff's department, and again with the LAPD. They said they're doing what they can, but there are so many young people in Kristen's situation. Locke cleared his throat. It was time to rip off the second band-aid. He was sure the picture they had of the girl with the tattoo wasn't Kristen, but he needed to be positive. Mrs. Miller, we did find someone on the internet, but this young woman had a birthmark. Does Kristen have a birthmark up around her hip? No, said Joyce Miller. She has one near her shoulder. Locke exchanged a look with Angie. He was 99% positive they weren't looking at a shoulder, but the image was a close-up of the girl's body. Would you mind taking a look, said Angie, sparing Locke having to make the request. He couldn't think of many things worse than having to identify your daughter on a website like this one. Well, there was one worse identification you could make but they weren't there yet, and Locke hoped they would never be. Sure. Angie took out her cell phone and pulled up the photograph. She passed the phone over. Joyce took a long look. She shifted uncomfortably in her chair. No, it's not Kristen, she said, then she got up and rushed out of the room. Locke stayed put. He heard her go into the bathroom, followed by the sound of her throwing up, followed by water running into the sink. Angie got up and went to check on her. Locke got up too. He walked over and picked up a framed picture of Kristen. In this one she was even younger, 
her hair was up in bunches, and she had a look of carefree happiness that kids had when they'd yet to see the other side of the world they'd been born into, the darker side. After a few minutes, Angie came back in with Joyce, who apologized profusely. There's no need, said Locke. This is tough. And he thought, about to get tougher. There was one more thing that he needed to show Joyce. One more set of images that once seen couldn't be unseen. He pulled up the video that Ty had taken in the apartment that they believed Kristen was sharing with one of Hanger's girls. Locke explained to Joyce what it was and where it had been taken. If you recognize anything that belongs to Kristen, that would be helpful. Maybe a bracelet or an item of clothing. Joyce watched the short pan across the bedroom. She stopped Locke. There. He hit the pause icon. Those shorts, she said, pointing to a pair of denim cutoffs. We had an argument when she bought them. I thought they were, you know, inappropriate. Okay, said Locke. And you're sure these are Kristen's? Yes, she said. There's like this glittery logo on the back, see? Thank you, said Locke, his entire suspicions confirmed. Can't the police go round there, said Joyce. See if she's come back there? It's definitely a location we can keep an eye on. Locke didn't hold out too much hope that Kristen would be back there any time soon. She was in the wind. Angie and Locke said their goodbyes. Angie walked him back to his car. Rough, isn't it, she said. You can say that. You know you're running a risk going after her. Locke stopped, his hand on the doorframe of the car. He looked at Angie. You think we should back off, he said. No, said Angie. But there's a chance that if this pimp gets desperate he does something to her. You mean like get rid of her? Angie glanced up at the bright blue Los Angeles sky, her eyes squinting at the winter sun, then back at Locke. It wouldn't be the first time, she said. 29. Locke watched in his rearview mirror as Ty's car pulled into the space behind him. The six-foot-four-inch Marine got out and lumbered over, opened the passenger door, and got in. So who's making the call, said Ty. I thought you would, said Locke. Why should it be me? I don't know what to ask, said Locke. What you saying? That I do. I've never paid for the company of a female in my life. Not even when I was overseas in the corp, and it was hard to come by. And neither have I, said Locke. Ty reached out his hand for Locke's phone. Here I'll do it. Locke tapped in the number from the ad featuring the girl with the birthmark and the hanger tattoo, and handed his phone to Ty. Hey, said Ty. I was looking to make an appointment. Locke had to look away to stop from laughing. Ty made it sound like he was checking in to see a dentist. Ty scowled at him. Yeah, that's cool, said Ty finally. Where you at? There was a pause. No, he said. No special requests. Locke had rarely seen Ty this uncomfortable before. It was hard not to find it funny. It's down in Van Nuys, said Ty after he'd hung up and handed Locke's phone back to him. He read off the address. It was a 20-minute drive. They took Locke's car. He parked around the corner from the apartment block. Ty got out. He would go inside first, and Locke would follow a few minutes later. They didn't know if this was one of Hanger's stable of girls or not. They didn't know if she would be alone. But they did know that if she was rocking ink with his name on it, that there was a slight chance she might help them find Kristen. Three minutes after Ty had left, Locke got a text. He got out of the car, and he walked around to the apartment building. He hit the buzzer and Ty buzzed him inside. Ty opened the door. The girl from the ad was sitting on a couch in the living room. She was about five feet two, a little chubby and mixed race, just like the girl in the ad. Locke pegged her as early to mid-twenties. She was wearing a red silk robe and smoking a Newport. This is Shanice, said Ty by way of introduction. 
Shanice did not look overly amused by the intrusion or by the fact that Ty was not a regular customer. Locke didn't necessarily blame her. Hey Shanice, what do you usually get for a half hour? Locke asked. A hundred. Plus tip. Locke pulled two hundred dollars out of his wallet and handed it to her. She took it without a word. This shouldn't take more than ten minutes, he said. You tell her why we're here, he asked Ty. Ty nodded. We believe the girl we're trying to locate is with Hanger. I don't know no Hanger, she said. That's funny because you have his name inked on your body, said Locke. She looked up at him, suddenly flirty. Do I, said Shanice, pulling up the bottom of her robe. I know you do. Now listen, we're not here to cause you any problems. We just want to find Kristen Miller. You help us do that, and there's another $500 in it for you. Shit, I make that in one afternoon. Okay, a thousand. Payable when we find her. You know she's 14 years old, right? The mention of Kristen's age drew a flicker of emotion. Locke saw it pass like a cloud over her face and then disappear back behind the hardened mask. If you're scared of Hanger, don't be, said Ty. When we have Kristen, I'm going to deal with him before the cops do. This was news to Locke, but hardly a headline grabber. Ty had the same reaction to a man like Hanger that Locke did. Complete and utter contempt. At the same time Locke didn't want Ty facing a judge because he'd taken out a piece of shit like Hanger. That however was a discussion for later. For what it was worth, Shanice seemed to believe Ty. So did Locke for that matter. Ty was a man who made promises rather than one who simply issued idle threats. Okay, so I have his name on me. But I'm not his hoe anymore. Locke was about to ask if she'd replaced Hanger with another pimp. He stopped himself. It wasn't relevant, and it wasn't any of his business. We just want to find this girl, said Locke. Anything you can tell us that might help us do that would be appreciated. Well, seeing as y'all are here now, and you already paid for my time, you want something to drink? I'm going to make myself some peppermint tea, she said, getting up and bustling past them toward the kitchen. I'm good, said Locke. Sure, said Ty. I'll take a coffee. She stopped, turned and cocked a hand to her hip. You have a hearing problem. Did I say anything about coffee? Tea's good too, Ty hastily corrected. Locke smiled. He'd only met her a few minutes ago, but Shanice was kind of growing on him. Five minutes later, Shanice settled herself back down as Ty politely sat across from her, sipping his tea. Locke had given her some background to Kristen falling into Hanger's grip, and it seemed to be a pattern she recognized. Get some pretty boy to reel them in and then before you know it you're selling your ass out on the track and giving him every dime you make, came her summation. Would you have any idea where we might find Kristen, or Hanger for that matter? She shrugged. It's been like a year. He has a crib in Santa Monica, I know that much. We already know about that, said Ty. Then that's all I got. He puts his girls on a track downtown or in an apartment, sometimes a motel, but those change all the time. He never leaves a girl in the one place for too long. This was looking like a dead end, thought Locke. How come you still have his ink, said Ty matter-of-factly. Shanice straightened up. Her hand instinctively fell to her leg as she traced a pattern with her fingertip. I've thought about that laser removal, but I figured I'd keep it. Remind me never to fall for a man's bullshit again. I've got about another five years in the life, and then I plan on going back to college training to be a nurse. That sounds like a good plan, said Locke, meaning it but not entirely sure that's how life would go. From what Angie had told him, the problem to getting out of the life was the same one he'd had working in high-end security. You got used to the money. I hear you, said Ty, rolling up a sleeve to reveal one of his many tattoos, this one a Marine Corps emblem. Damn boy, said Shanice, taking in a bicep that was as thick as most men's thighs. You're in good shape for an old guy. Locke bit back another laugh. Ty had definitely found his match. 
Hurt like hell at the time, said Shanice. I'll tell you that much. He almost had to hold me down. Something occurred to Locke. Does he get that put on all his girls? She shot him an irritated look. Yeah, it's like cattle. Does the person doing it know what it means, said Locke. Of course he does. They're buddies, she said. Wait. He uses the same tattooist every time, said Locke. Far as I know. Think they met one time when they were in county together. The guy's like some gnarly cracker. Gave me the creeps. You remember his name, said Ty following Locke's train of thought. No, but I can tell you where his studio was, said Shanice, extending her hand. That'll be extra though. She looked back to Ty. Unless you want to hang around, sweet thing. 30. With Ty at the wheel of Locke's car, they headed east towards Bakersfield. In the passenger seat, Locke finally gave in to the pain overwhelming his body, palmed two Vicodin from a brown plastic pill bottle, and swallowed them down with a glug of water. Ty side-eyed him as the speed trap detector on the dash beeped and Ty eased up on the gas, dropping down from 90 to the speed limit. What? said Locke. You ain't pissing blood or anything, are you? No, I'm just a little sore. Been a while since I was last beaten up, said Locke. Good to have a little reminder once in a while. Helps maintain vigilance. Guess that's one way of looking at it, said Locke. You think we're just going round in circles here, said Ty. Perhaps, but what's the alternative? If they did time in the joint, then I don't see this dude giving up his buddy. Locke didn't disagree. Then again, there were ways of persuading people to do all kinds of things they might not do of their own volition. It was just a question of how far he and Ty were willing to go, and how much pressure they were prepared to apply. Pulling up the tattoo studio details on his phone, Locke swiped through pictures. They'd be outside the place in 20 minutes, and he wanted to know going in who he was looking for. Google revealed the owner and chief tattooist as one Gilman Spinner, a 27-year-old skinhead from the Inland Empire. A deeper dig revealed someone with a string of convictions for petty crime, and some involvement with a number of white supremacist groups in the area. The tattoo studio was located in a rundown strip mall on the edge of Bakersfield, sandwiched between a dry cleaner and a Vietnamese restaurant. Ty pulled into a parking spot outside the restaurant, and they got out. A bell jangled as they walked into the tattoo parlor. Every available inch of wall was adorned with potential designs and photographs of presumably satisfied customers. None of the photographs seemed to feature underage trafficked girls, but that was hardly a surprise. Locke could remember when tattoos were the preserve of sailors, military personnel, prison inmates and members of street gangs rather than soccer moms and teenage girls. The thought made him feel old. Gilman was in back, hunched over a jacked-up bodybuilder type in a wife beater. Gilman looked up as he came in. He took in Locke first, apparently unfazed by his bruised face. Then he saw Ty, and there was a flicker of something else that lay between unease and distaste. Judging by the photographs on the wall, he didn't have many African-American customers. Sorry guys, it's appointment only right now. This was music to Locke's ears. Appointments usually meant an appointment book with names and dates and times. Unless of course it was something he was saying to get rid of them, which was eminently possible. No problem, said Locke. I'll make an appointment. Yeah, we'll make an appointment. Gilman put down the tattoo gun. I don't have anything free for the next week. That's okay, said Locke. Next available works. Whenever that is. I'll be right back bro, Gilman told the bodybuilder. He wandered over to the reception counter, chest puffed out, ink-stained hands stuffed into his pockets, all business. Look, what do you guys want? Locke glanced at Ty and shrugged. I just told you, I'd like to make an appointment to get a tattoo. Gilman shot Locke a sarcastic smirk that suggested he didn't believe a word of it, but he was prepared to play along. Okay, what kind of thing are you looking for? He asked Locke with a wave to the wall filled with designs. 
Locke was tired and sore, and he didn't appreciate the attitude. He knew where this was going, and it wasn't anywhere good. Not for the tattoo artist. In the meantime, he decided that he may as well press some more of the guy's buttons. I want to get his name, and he's getting mine. On my ass cheek. Ty took out his Oakley sunglasses and put them on as he struggled to keep a straight face. That's right, said Ty. Yeah, said Gilman. It's not that kind of place. The bodybuilder had gotten up and was waddling over. Okay, said Locke. That was a lie. For real, said Ty. I feel kind of hurt now. Locke took out his phone and pulled up the picture that showed Shanice's tattoo. He angled the screen so Gilman could see it. This your work? Gilman glanced at it. How would I know? You want me to get rid of these assholes, the bodybuilder chimed in. Easy there, Sparky, said Locke. This won't take long. We're looking for your buddy hanger, said Locke. We know you did time together, and we know you ink up his girls. Can't help you, said Gilman, folding his arms across his chest. He can't help you, said the bodybuilder. Locke didn't shift focus from Gilman. You want to speak with Hanger, said Gilman. Or you could tell us where he is, or whether you did any work on one of his new girls. Locke could sense the wheels in Gilman's brain turning around. He was making a decision. You're not going to leave until I help you, are you? Correct, said Locke. Gilman turned to the bodybuilder. Go sit back down, he told him. I haven't seen Hanger or anyone he knows in months, and for the record, I don't exactly agree with how he makes his money, but I ain't no snitch either. I'll make a call, see if I can find him for you, but if I do, you gotta leave. Fair. I have a business to run here. Locke nodded his agreement. Fair. Bodybuilder waddled back to the chair. Gilman followed him. He picked up his cell phone and with his eyes still on Locke and Ty made a whispered but brief phone call. A minute later, he finished the call and walked back over to them. You're in luck. I got him and he's here in Bakersfield. Where, said Ty. Don't worry, he's coming to meet you. Locke and Ty stood outside the tattoo place. You believe any of that, said Ty. Nope. You? Not a single word. We'll give it ten. If no one shows, we go back inside and express our disappointment, said Locke, glancing through the door where Gilman had resumed his work. Every few seconds he looked up at them, seemingly untroubled. When he saw Locke looking, he smiled. Locke didn't like it. Let's wait in the car, said Locke. They walked the short distance to the Vietnamese restaurant. Locke got into the driver's seat. You sure you want to drive? We're not going far, said Locke as Ty got in next to him. He pulled out of the space and moved the car closer to the exit, taking a spot between two hulking pickup trucks. No one driving into the strip mall would see them. Not immediately, anyway. And even if they did, they'd have to drive the whole way round the lot before they reached them. What's the plan if he doesn't show, said Ty. Go back in, take his phone, see who he called, take it from there. It seemed to meet with Ty's approval. He sunk back into the passenger seat. Please tell me once you find this girl that you're done with this, said Ty. I don't know if I can, said Locke. You think you can rescue all of them, said Ty. Locke didn't say anything for a moment. It was a question he'd given some thought. There were so many kids caught up in this world that it was way beyond the scope of one person. Ty was right about that. But maybe that was missing the point. No, said Locke. I can't rescue them all. No one can. But maybe I can rescue one. Right on cue, about nine minutes after they'd left the tattoo studio, and a few minutes before they were going to go back in to speak again with Gilman, a patrol car with two uniformed police officers rolled slowly into the strip mall and pulled into the spot they had vacated outside the restaurant. The cops' heads were on a swivel, scoping out the lot. 
They hadn't seen Locke and Ty sitting in Locke's car, but it was only a question of time. Locke started the car. As the doors of the patrol car popped open, he eased out of the space and rolled to the exit. That solves that mystery, he said, watching the cops in his rearview as they went inside. Wait until they've gone and roll back in, said Ty. Yeah, that would work, said Locke, picking up speed as they blasted through an intersection. You hungry? Might be our last chance to get something for a while. Ty raised his Oakleys. Sorry, who am I asking, said Locke to himself. Hey, I have a question for you. Go ahead, said Locke. Would you really get my name inked on your ass cheek, said Ty with a grin. Hang on, said Locke as his phone trilled with an incoming call. It was Angie. He picked up, putting her on speaker so Ty could hear what she had to say. Give me some good news, said Locke. I think I've found her, said Angie. 31. Sooth hammered her fist on the bathroom door. All she could hear was water running. Kristen had gone in there about a half hour ago and still hadn't come out. There was at least one guy downstairs in the parking lot waiting for Sooth to give him the room number, and another John had just called, some weird sounding old dude who'd asked a lot of questions and was on his way to the motel. If Hanger walked in right now, it wouldn't just be Kristen that would be in trouble. Sooth could take care of the guy in the parking lot herself. Once a guy was horny enough, it didn't much matter who greeted him at the door. But that wasn't the point. Hanger had texted her that he was dropping by. He was almost always late, usually by an hour or two. Wouldn't it just be her luck that this would be the one time he was on time? She banged on the door again. You better open up, she shouted. No sound apart from the rush of water. Kristen had been upset after they'd left the tattoo place. Sooth had known that much. It wasn't unusual for new girls to throw a little tantrum, make life difficult. Sooth had been like that herself at the start. You don't open up and I'm gonna break down this door. You hear me, girl? Suddenly aware that her foot felt wet, she looked down. Water was leaking under the bathroom door, pooling on the sticky bedroom carpet and soaking through. Sooth cursed again. They'd have the manager here any second. Places like this were cool with business being conducted, as long as you kept to yourself. Soon as there was a problem like the cops being called, or a bathroom flooding into the room below, you got kicked out. Retreating to the edge of the bed, she ignored her phone ringing and took off her heels. She aimed a kick at the bathroom door. She could feel it give. She kicked again. This time she caught the handle with her toes, pain ripping up her leg. Now she was really mad. The phone rang again. She picked it up. It was Hanger's number, or one of them. She put the phone back down on the bed and squared up to the bathroom door. This time she shoulder charged it and it flew open. Her momentum carried her skidding on the wet floor into the tiny bathroom. There was blood and water everywhere. Kristen was slumped against the far wall. Her eyes were closed. Next to her was a pill bottle that Sooth recognized as belonging to her. Ambien for when the booze wasn't enough to put her to sleep. A lady's razor lay on the floor, smashed up. Sooth knelt down to see where the blood was coming from. Kristen had dragged the blade across both her wrists. You dumb bitch, Sooth muttered as someone knocked on the motel room door. 32. Whatever pain Locke was in had disappeared, knocked out by a one-two punch of Vicodin, and the thrill of knowing that he was minutes away from Kristen Miller. He swerved around a semi, blasting through a red light as they hurtled toward the motel. Easy there, Ryan, cautioned Ty, slamming his hand against the dash to steady himself as the car rolled under them. It's no good if we crash before we get there. Locke eased off the gas but only by a fraction. He wanted this done, and they were so close he could taste it. Things weren't over when they had Kristen. He still wanted some personal time with Hanger. But that could wait. The call from Angie was about an ad she had spotted, similar to the one they had seen for Shanice. Only this one matched Kristen perfectly. 
Rather than make the call and risk someone recognizing either their number, calls from withheld numbers as a rule went unanswered, or their voice they had quickly grabbed an elderly man. In return for a fast hundred dollars, he had made the call. His questions had confirmed as best they could that it was likely Kristen Miller on offer. He had been given the address of a motel on the outskirts of Bakersfield and told to call for the room number when he arrived. They had taken the elderly man's number and set off for the motel, the promise of another hundred bucks securing his continued cooperation. The plan was simple. Get to the motel. Have the old guy call for the room number. Go in and extract Kristen Miller. If Hanger was there, all the better. Locke's grip tightened on the steering wheel. Adrenaline surged in him. This beat advising the kids of wealthy Chinese businessmen on home security or babysitting Russian oligarchs, hands down. It was a feeling that beat any drug, natural or man-made. A flash of red light behind them pulled him back to the present. The whoop of a siren confirmed the bad news. Locke slowed, studying the patrol car tucked in behind him. It was the same two cops they'd narrowly avoided back at the tattoo studio. Ty checked them out too. What you want to do? He asked Locke. How close are we, said Locke. Ty scanned his phone, their position a red dot pulsing toward the motel. 90 seconds, said Ty. Locke flicked on his signal and slowed down. He needed a moment to weigh things up. Showing every sign he was pulling over achieved that. The last thing he needed was these two calling for backup. Or was it? Maybe it was precisely what they needed. A motel parking lot full of cops might not be the worst thing in the world right now. The alternative was pulling over and a long, awkward explanation of what he and Ty were doing out here, with no guarantee they would dispatch anyone to go check the motel. That was assuming this was a crime they took seriously, which wasn't always guaranteed. And who knew what kind of relationship they had with Gilman, or what kind of yarn he'd spun when he called for them to drop by. Relative to LA, this was a small town, and small town cops could be a law unto themselves. Locke looked over at Ty. I'm going to run it. See if you can get the old guy to press them for the room number. Bracing himself again against the dashboard, Ty dug out his phone. Locke buried the gas pedal, pulling away with ease from the patrol car. 33. Hanger's hand arced through the air, catching Sooth flush in the chest and sending her reeling back. How the hell could you let this happen? She looked up at him. I didn't know what she was doing. She seemed fine. Fine, spat Hanger. Does she look fine to you? Sooth knew better than to say anything more. Hanger was crazy when he got like this. He was capable of almost anything. He'd killed a girl before. Right in front of her. She was only a little thing too. Maybe four feet eleven and like ninety pounds. Hanger had beaten her until she started bleeding from her ears and then left her for dead. This is all kinds of bad, he said. You know we got people chasing us down because of her. You know that, right? Here. Yeah, here. They were in at Gilman's right after you left. They had a picture of her. Cops, she asked. I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe worse than cops. So what are we gonna do? I'll tell you what we're not gonna do, and that's stick around here. Help me get her down to the car. Sooth looked down at Kristen, laid out on the bed, her wrists wrapped with strips of bedsheet to staunch the bleeding, her eyes still almost rolling back in her head. Like this. He drew his hand back again. She flinched and he relented, dropping it back down by his side. Yeah, like this. Where we going? she asked as she walked around, grabbing Kristen's ankles, as Hanger hooked his hands in under the girl's armpits. Together they lifted her off the bed and staggered to the motel room door. I don't know yet, said Hanger. We could just split, leave her here. Someone will find her, said Sooth. Hanger kept moving out of the door. He seemed to be weighing the idea. No, he said, out of breath as they staggered with Kristen out onto the walkway. 
No one's going to find her. Not until I'm done with her. They could hear sirens in the distance. Come on, hurry up, said Hanger, hustling down the stairs to his BMW. Man, she is really going to make a mess of my car. You could move her on, said Sooth. By move, she meant sell. It happened when girls had become more trouble than they were worth. Guys like Hanger would pass them over to someone new. For a fee. Usually someone who had a reputation as a gorilla pimp, a man who relied exclusively on fear and intimidation to keep his girls in line. Maybe, said Hanger, unlocking his car with a simple click of a button. Or maybe I could give her to the freak. Mention of the freak sent a chill running over Sooth. She wished now she hadn't brought up the idea of moving Kristen on. Hanger opened the back door, and together they shoved Kristen into the back seat. She started to come round and put her hand out. Hanger slapped it away. Maybe I'll give you to him too, he told Sooth. 34. Locke could see the sign for the motel up ahead. He could also see three patrol cars parked horizontally across the road ahead, blocking the next intersection. He looked from the roadblock to the passenger seat. Ty finished up his call. No luck, said Ty. He says they're not answering any of his calls, but he's just seen some white dude who sounds like our boy loading a girl into the back of his car with some black chick helping him. I'm guessing the black chick is Sooth. That's them, said Locke. It has to be. Ask him what they're doing now. Ty asked. There was a pause. They're splitting. They left yet? Locke asked. Ty relayed the question. Not yet. Okay, ask him to see which way they're headed and text you with it. Then see if you can get these guys dispatcher on the phone and tell them we're not looking for trouble, but we're not stopping either, said Locke, although he already knew the answer on the first part. They'd almost certainly be heading for the freeway, out of town. If they were spooked enough to be leaving the motel, they weren't going to stay in town. Locke eased off the gas, keeping an eye on the patrol car behind them in his mirrors. What to do next was a coin toss. They were close enough to the motel that if they could get round the roadblock, they had a chance of intercepting Hangar. Not much of a chance. But a chance nonetheless. The alternative was to pull over and persuade the local cops to dispatch someone to chase him down. But that would take time. A few minutes at the very minimum, and quite possibly longer. Assuming they agreed to do it at all. What do you think, said Locke? Try to go round? See if we can catch up to them? Ty hesitated, pulling the phone down from his ear as he spoke with the Bakersfield PD dispatch. Okay, but get ready to duck. They're loaded for bear. Locke followed Ty's gaze to where one cop was drawing down on them with a shotgun from behind the open door of his patrol car. Decision made, Locke kept his car moving, slowing a little more before spinning the wheel hard as they closed in on the intersection, and careening off the road, up onto the empty sidewalk and then onto dirt, the tires spinning for a moment as they struggled to gain traction. They held fire, said Locke, glancing over at Ty, who had done his best to make himself as small as possible. No mean feat for a man of his size. Almost as soon as the words had left Locke's mouth, the car's back window blew in, buckshot peppering the interior. The seats soaked up most of the shot. The sound of two more shots crackled in the air. Locke spun the wheel the opposite way, slowly fractionally, as the car crunched back down over the sidewalk and onto the road. The impact sent a wave of pain all the way up his spine. Behind them the patrol cars were turning, ready to continue the pursuit. He accelerated, pulling away, putting increasing distance between them and the cops. They were almost within touching distance of the motel. They'd be there in less than 60 seconds. He say where they went? Locke asked Ty. East, said Ty, reading the text. Locke had been right. They were heading for the freeway. He kept the car moving, pushing it as hard as they could. In his mirror he counted three patrol cars. One had either dropped out or was taking a different route to cut him off. Not that it mattered. They kept moving, past the motel entrance. 
The old guy waved at them as they sped past, pointing down the street towards the freeway. Now they had a decision to make. Had Hanger decided to head west, back to Los Angeles, or had he gone east? Lock S. West. Under pressure, people tended to opt for home territory and the familiar. A block ahead was another set of lights. They were at red. Lock slowed slightly, but kept moving, hoping that anyone moving through the intersection from the other side would be slowed by the lights and sirens behind him. Hunched over the wheel, he ducked into the turn lane so he could get round the waiting traffic. Blowing through the red, he narrowly avoided being T-boned by a pickup truck. Scooting up the on-ramp, they made it to the freeway, headed west. Black Beamer said Locke. Got you, said Ty, both men scanning the road ahead. Pushing the car as hard as it would go, Locke laid on his horn to clear people out of the way. No sign of a BMW, black or otherwise. The sound of the pursuing patrol cars grew louder. Locke knew that they wouldn't be able to do this all the way back to L.A. Highway Patrol would have had a call by now, and someone would be waiting further down the line. Right there, said Ty. Where? There. Behind that semi. There it was. A black BMW, driving at a steady clip up ahead of them. It was driving a little above the speed limit, enough to make good time, but not so much to be overly conspicuous. They kept moving, edging closer with every hundred yards of blacktop that rolled out under their wheels. Spooked by the sound of the pursuit, the BMW picked up speed, momentarily pulling away. But Locke was almost on top of it. Cutting around it he got in front and eased on the brakes, forcing it to slow. Checking his mirror there was no sign of hangar, or for that matter, Kristen Miller. Only a lone black female driver who raised a middle finger in his direction, as she slowed down, and eased the BMW over to the side of the freeway. 35. Gilman rubbed a hand across his chin. I don't get it, he said to Hanger, who was next to him in the truck's passenger seat. The girl was sitting in back staring with glazed eyes out of the window as the miles of desert whipped past them on either side. Her wrists had stopped bleeding, and she had a dazed expression. Gilman had suggested they take her to an emergency room to get her stomach pumped. Instead, Hanger had forced her to drink a bunch of salt water until she vomited by the side of the road. What don't you get, said Hanger. Well, whoever these guys are, they're prepared to cause a lot of trouble to get her back. What you saying? Gilman wasn't sure he wanted to come straight out with it. He and Hanger were tight since they'd been sellies, but Hanger could be, what was the best word? Touchy. Yeah, that was it, he could be touchy. You say the wrong thing to him, or look at him the wrong way, and he could go crazy. It wasn't just that he could get violent, most people in jail could be violent. It was the level he went to, and how fast he got there. It was like he really got off on hurting people. I'm not saying anything, said Gilman. It's your business. You handle it how you see fit. But if it was me then I'd maybe, you know, throw this one back. Hanger stared at him, and for a second Gilman worried that he might lose his temper. Not that it would come to much. After all, this was Gilman's truck, and Gilman was busy saving his ass. But contrary to appearances, Gilman wasn't much for getting into it with people, not unless he had to. Hanger put his arm on the back of Gilman's seat and turned around. What you say, he asked Kristen. You want to go home? She turned her head so slowly that the movement was almost robotic. She didn't say anything. See, Hanger said to Gilman. She doesn't want to go home. Okay then, said Gilman as they came up on a sign that told him they had 94 miles to go before they hit Las Vegas. Here's the problem, said Hanger. Once you're in the pimping game, you can't let hoes go. Not until you're done with them. And definitely not because someone puts the squeeze on you. Do that and well, you might as well stop being a pimp. I hear you, said Gilman, starting to wish he'd never said anything. Hey, said Hanger with a flick of his eyes towards the back seat. You want to get a taste of her when we get there. On me, of course. Gilman didn't want to look at Hanger. 
the idea creeped him out, and he didn't want Hanger to see that in his eyes. When she'd been brought in by Hanger's bottom girl, he'd asked how old she was. She'd said 19. But Gilman knew that was a lie. She was a kid. A kid with makeup on. That's a generous offer, he told Hanger. But I can't leave the studio. Hanger produced a pack of cigarettes. He tapped one out for each of them. He lit them both and passed one to Gilman. He lowered the window and blew smoke out into the fresh Nevada air. You might be right, said Hanger. I won't give her up. But maybe I could move her on. 36. Locke hesitated at the door leading out of the main Bakersfield police headquarters. Next to him Ty nervously rubbed his wrists, both men glad to be back at liberty, but apprehensive as to what, or rather who, awaited them outside. You know maybe if we ask nicely they'd put you in that cell, said Ty. That would mean you'd have to go out there on your own, said Locke. Good point, said Ty opening the door. You can be my human shield. Thanks, said Locke as they walked out into the fresh air. Carmen waited for them at the bottom of the steps. She had her arms folded across her chest. Glad I'm not you, whispered Ty as they walked down to her. Oh, don't worry, said Carmen. I have plenty of anger to go round. I swear women have better hearing than bats. I heard that too, said Carmen, turning and walking toward her car, which was parked at the curb. The two men fell in behind her like errant schoolboys. Locke's car was in storage. Carmen would have to drop them at the pound so they could collect it before they headed back to Los Angeles. Carmen turned back to them as she reached her car. Her mouth shaped to speak, but she stopped. I'm sorry you had to come all the way are here, said Locke. Yeah, me too, said Ty. Events kind of conspired to take over, said Locke. That drew a cool ah ah from Carmen followed by a brusque get in the car. Once Locke had settled into the front passenger seat and Ty was spread out in the back, Carmen looked at them. So how do you persuade them to let us go? Locke asked. He had been expecting to spend at least one night in jail and have to post bail before he saw the outside again. He'd made Carmen his one phone call so you wouldn't worry about where he was, fully expecting that she'd be happy to let him cool his heels. Instead, it seemed that she'd gone to work to secure their release. I called in some pretty big favors with an old law school classmate who works with the state attorney's office. And I suggested to the cops here that perhaps they might want to avoid the publicity they'd get from arresting people trying to rescue a 14-year-old girl from a sex trafficker while said sex trafficker was getting away. Locke nodded, as angles went that was a pretty good one. Of course I didn't word it quite that bluntly, continued Carmen. It's the old saying about when you have the law on your side, argue the law, and when you have the facts on your side, argue the facts. I didn't have either, so I went for the there is such a thing as bad publicity approach. She pulled out into traffic. They will be asking you to sign some paperwork, and they've also requested that once you've collected your car, you never set foot within the city limits again. She paused, looking at Locke and Ty in turn. Think you can manage that? Both men nodded. Oh, and the black woman that you chased down, they released her too. They didn't question her, asked Locke, his mind snapping back to the reason they were here in the first place, Kristen Miller. They did, but what were they going to hold her on, said Carmen. Locke could think of half a dozen things. That they could prove, said Carmen. What about the car? asked Ty from the back seat. What about it? said Carmen. It's registered and insured, and she had a clean driving license. Look, I know what you're both saying, but I think they didn't keep hold of her for the same reason they let you go. Which was? Trafficking cases are messy, said Carmen. My old classmate told me as much when I spoke with her. They take a huge amount of resources and they're tough to prosecute, never mind get a conviction on. That's messed up, said Ty. Welcome to the justice system, said Carmen. You catch some guy with a kilo of blow, that's one thing. You catch a traffic teenager, and half the time they won't give the cops their real name, never mind enough evidence to go to court. And when they do, 
the trafficker's attorney use every trick in the book to delay it coming to trial. Victims lose hearts, they move away, they're intimidated. It's a nightmare. The rest of the short ride to the police vehicle compound passed in silence. Finally, much to Locke's relief, they pulled up outside the front gate. Thanks again, said Locke, getting out. Not so fast, said Carmen. Once you get your car, Ty can drive it back to L.A. for you. I don't think you're in any fit state to be driving. Not with all the pain pills you're taking. Guess you're driving, said Locke. No problem, said Ty, levering his long legs out of the back seat. You're driving home with me, said Carmen, her tone suggesting it was more a statement of fact than a request. Cool, said Ty. Locke pointed to the compound. I'm gonna go sign for the car. Sure, said Carmen. I'll be here. Ty waited until they were clear of Carmen's car before he spoke. Long ride back to L.A., he said. Locke shrugged. She's pissed. I don't blame her. I was supposed to be resting up at home, not getting arrested out in the middle of nowhere. Hey, you were doing a good thing. She knows that. As Locke signed the paperwork for the return of his car and handed the keys to Ty, he caught sight of someone watching them from the street. It was the same young black woman they'd chased down in the BMW. Presumably, thought Locke, she was also here to collect her car. Unsurprisingly, there was no sign of Hanger, and even less surprisingly, no sign of Kristen. She had seen them. He was sure of it. That was why she was hanging back. Locke was confident that Ty had noticed her too. You see who I see, said Locke. Roger that, said Ty. You think we should go speak with her, said Locke. The last thing they needed was more drama. Not here and not now. He doubted the local cop's patience would extend any further than it already had. I mean we could, said Ty. But you really think she's going to have a come to the Lord moment? Nope, said Locke. I have a better idea, said Ty. Oh yeah? Yeah, said Ty. But I'm not sure Carmen is going to like it. 37. Kristen was curled up in the back seat. Her wrists hurt like hell, and she felt like she might throw up. The cotton wool clouds in her head had started to lift. She wished they'd return and block all of this out. Now she was deep in Narnia, and she could barely remember the wardrobe she'd stepped through, never mind how to find her way back to it. Up front, Hanger told the guy from the tattoo parlor to slow down. There was a sign in the middle of the road that said, Welcome to Las Vegas. You see that, said Hanger, turning round in his seat to look at her. She knew better than to ignore him. Straightening up, she pressed her nose to the window so that he could see that she was looking. She had seen the sign before. Maybe on TV or in a movie. Now, he continued. On one side, that's where the private jets get parked. She looked. He was right. Directly across from the sign was a chain-link fence, and beyond it rows of sleek private jets like you saw people posing next to on Instagram. Over there, he said, jabbing a finger at what looked like a big concrete wall. That's a big storm drain that homeless people live in. Underground. He waved the car forward, still turned to face Kristen. Now you have to make up your mind which one you want. Do what I say and one day, maybe you can be getting on one of those jets. Carpet hoes can make good money in a place like this. In fact it's like carpet hoe heaven. She tried to look like she was following this, even though she had no idea what he was talking about. It was like being in math class when the teacher skipped way ahead, and you were just totally lost. Now you don't do what I tell you, you disobey me, then you can end up in one of those tunnels, turning tricks for a dollar a throw. You don't want that, do you? Kristen solemnly shook her head. What was that? I didn't hear you. No. Good, he said, apparently satisfied. They drove for another five or ten minutes, the neon falling behind them, until they turned down a street, and then down a ramp and into an underground parking lot. The two men got out. They spoke outside for a few minutes. 
Anger walked round and opened Kristen's door. She almost fell out, her legs wobbly. Don't worry, he smiled. You're not going to be doing too much standing up. As he said it, she studied his face, fantasizing about having a gun and killing him with it. Pushing the barrel into his mouth and pulling the trigger. Not that she had ever so much as held a gun, never mind fired one. A thought flared up from nowhere that somehow he would know what she was thinking. The idea terrified her so much that she could feel herself start to tremble. Before she knew it, they were alone, and she was following him to an elevator. He hit a button, and the elevator doors closed. It was just the two of them. The elevator moved up. It stopped. The doors opened. She followed him out, down a carpeted corridor. They stopped outside an apartment door. Hanger fished out a key from his front pocket and opened it. Grabbing her wrist and squeezing hard, he half guided and half shoved her inside. So far, he'd been calm. But now, as she found herself standing in the middle of a living room with a couch and some chairs, a coffee table, and a couple of withered brown leaved plants, his expression changed. His lips peeled back over his teeth as he walked behind her. Placing both hands on her shoulders, he leaned in so she could feel his breath on her ear, and he started to whisper. Here's the deal, he began. You belong to me, until I say otherwise. If you die, that's because I decided you were going to die. He spun her round so she was facing him, although her eyes barely came up to his chest. You try to check out like that again, okay, you might get lucky, that might work. But know this. He took out his phone tapping the screen, his brow furrowed with concentration. Finally, he turned it around so she could see it. It was a picture of her mom. It had been taken recently. She was taking the garbage out in front of their house, still in her dressing gown. She looked older than Kristen had ever seen her, and knowing why that was, Kristen felt a wave of guilt and shame for having been so stupid. You kill yourself and she dies. He pocketed the phone, reached down and grabbed her hair so hard that her neck snapped back. She stared up at him. I decide when you die. You understand? She was crying, but she managed to choke out the words she knew he wanted to hear. I understand. He let go. The anger evaporated, and he was back to being almost regular. Now you can't see them, but I got cameras all over this place. You leave. I'll know. You try to speak to anyone else or shout out the window, I'll know about that too. Sooth will be here in a day or so. He walked to the apartment door, opened it, and was gone. She was alone. All she could think about was that picture of her mom. Sorry, she said, sinking down onto the couch and lying down, her knees pulled up into her chest. 38. There better not be a scratch on my car, said Carmen. Don't worry. Ty's a really careful driver, said Locke. We both know that's a lie, Carmen shot back. Are we good? She glanced over at him. I don't know, Ryan. I followed up on something that I thought would take me to Kristen Miller. If I'd known where it was going to end up with me getting arrested, then maybe I wouldn't have. Carmen didn't say anything. I'm sorry, okay. I really am. And if you get another call in five minutes from Ty saying that he's seen her and he needs you there, what are you going to do then? asked Carmen. They both knew the answer to that one. I'm just worried about you, said Carmen. I'm fine, said Locke. You look it, said Carmen, this time with a hint of a smile playing at the edge of her lips. Locke's cell phone chimed with an incoming call. The call showed on the car's display. It was Ty. Carmen reached over and answered it. You'd better not have crashed my car, she said. Ty's voice filled the cabin. Oh, hey, Carmen. No, your car's fine. Is Ryan there? Yeah. I haven't dropped him by the side of the road. Not yet, anyway. You're on speaker. What the good news, said Locke, hoping that's what it was. I'm tucked in behind her on the I-15. 
I don't think she's seen me. Or if she has, then she's being cool about it. The I-15, repeated Locke. Yeah, I think she's headed for Vegas. Okay, stay close and keep me updated, said Locke. Roger that, said Ty. If I see the kid. Do what you have to do, said Locke. Ty hung up. Locke chewed over what he'd just heard. Vegas made sense. It was within driving distance, and it didn't take a genius to know that it was a mecca to the sex industry. Sex was baked into the city's DNA almost as much as gambling. What happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas. 39. They were coming into Vegas, heading north on the 15 as they skirted the northwest of the Mojave Desert. Ty was about 300 yards behind the black BMW, tucked in behind what looked like a group of college kids headed for the bright lights of Vegas. If Sooth had spotted him, she'd showed no sign of it. She'd kept a steady clip all the way from Bakersfield, stopping once for gas. Ty had hung back when she'd exited the interstate and driven past the gas station to wait for her. When the black BMW had driven past him ten minutes later, he'd been nice and patient, giving her plenty of time to rejoin the interstate before he did. As every exit came up, he closed the gap a little, so he could see if she got off. When she didn't, he fell back a little further, occasionally losing sight of her before he closed the distance when they came up on the next exit. It wasn't until they were in Vegas itself, and the traffic thickened enough that he could risk getting closer, that he saw her move over, ready to exit onto Flamingo Road. He followed, barely making the light as she merged onto West Flamingo Road. The Bellagio with its famous fountains was on the right, as he maintained the tail. He thought she might turn onto the strip, maybe pull into one of the big hotel and casinos. She didn't. She kept moving, on down Flamingo Road and into Paradise City, past the edge of the airport and the iconic Welcome to Las Vegas sign and out into the less glitzy section of the city. He hung back. The whole time he'd following her, her speed had rarely varied. She'd driven at the speed of the other traffic. Now as they moved down Tropicana and hit a fresh set of lights, the BMW suddenly lurched forward, running a light as it switched to red and narrowly missing being clipped by a truck making a turn. The driver lay on his air horn, coming close enough to the rear of the BMW that he may even have shaved some paint. The BMW kept moving, picking up speed, and then it was gone as Ty sat, frustrated, six cars back and waited for the lights to change again. Even if he'd wanted to run the intersection and risk Carmen's car, there was no way he could navigate it. The surrounding traffic was too thick. He was hopelessly pinned in. Worse, it hadn't been the move of someone running late and concerned about missing the light. It had been deliberate, calculated to make sure that anyone behind her wouldn't be able to follow. Finally, after a frustrating minute, the light changed. Ty moved through the intersection. He sped up, cutting in and out of the traffic. After a time, he doubled back. He checked out the side streets, hoping for a glimpse of the car, slowing down as he came up on every black car he saw. There was no sign of the BMW. It was gone. 40. With Gilman driving back to Bakersfield, Hanger jumped the shuttle to LA at McCarran Airport. At LAX he grabbed a cab LAX. Sooth could keep his BMW in Vegas. He didn't plan on staying long in Los Angeles. A day or two at most while he figured out who was so determined to pry his brand new swan from his grasp. On the short plane hop he'd found himself sandwiched into a window seat by a sweaty, overweight road warrior who'd insisted on telling him all about his career, selling CRM software to Fortune 500 companies. About halfway through the conversation, while Hanger was sucking down his second Jack and Coke, he'd asked Hanger what he did for a living. Guess I'm in sales too, Hanger had told the man. His travel companion had perked up, like somehow this made them brothers. Oh really, what is it you sell, he'd asked. Hanger had stared him dead in the eye. I sell pussy. The guy had looked puzzled. Sorry? What was that? You sell what? Hanger had done a lurid mime with his fingers, and the guy had excused himself to go to the bathroom. 
When he got back he opened the overhead locker, took a laptop, and pretended to work, which was fine by hangar. The cab ride from LAX didn't take long. What had been unseasonably cold weather had given way to bright blue skies. It wasn't exactly warm, not by California standards, but it wasn't freezing cold either. Forty-five minutes later, the cab pulled up outside his apartment building, a few blocks from the ocean in Santa Monica. He'd lived here on and off for the past four years. He'd figured it as a sound investment, a good way of stashing his pimping money. When people asked what he did for a living, he told them he was in the music business. It fitted with the neighborhood. He was on nodding terms with most of the people who lived here, but he kept it to that, and no more. He didn't like people having more information than he wanted them to. His brushes with the law and a couple of short stints in jail had taught him that much. As he walked to the front door, a couple who lived on the floor below were coming out. They saw him and hurried past, the guy slipping a hand around his wife's waist. Hanger said hello. They both looked away and ignored him. Weird, but he didn't think too much of it until he opened the front door and walked into the lobby, where he got the same reaction from an elderly lady who lived on his floor. She looked like she was on the way out, but when she saw him, she about turned and made for the elevator. Using his key, he opened his mailbox and pulled out the usual junk. It was mostly menus for local restaurants and a flyer for a new yoga studio. As a rule, he took the stairs. It helped him stay in shape. He planned on taking a long shower and then grabbing a couple of hours sleep. Then he'd get out there and start trying to figure out what was going on. He wanted to speak with Andre, and he planned on making a trip downtown. Right now that could all wait. He was dog-tired. Pushing out of the stairwell door, he walked along the corridor to his apartment. He froze as he looked at the flyer that had been tacked to the door and took in his name. Not his real name, his street name, a name that no one here would have known about. Ripping the flyer down, he studied it. He could feel a rage bubbling up inside. He knew this had to be connected to what had been going on. Well, he thought, whoever it was had just made a monumental mistake. Unlocking his door, he slipped inside his apartment and closed the door. He closed his eyes for a second, allowing his anger to wash through him. When he opened his eyes again, he took another look at the flyer. There was a phone number. People were to call the number if they saw him. Suddenly, his neighbor's reaction made sense. His shower and his nap would have to wait. He wasn't scared of whoever was looking for him, some do-gooder on a moral crusade, but he needed somewhere quiet to get his bearings and figure out his next move. 41. Locke picked up Ty's call. He was in the living room, papers scattered all around. He was working up the courage to call Kristen Miller's mother and tell her that they were still no closer to finding her daughter. He owed her the call, and it was the right thing to do. Knowing that didn't make it any easier. Tell me something good, Tyrone. Sorry, brother, all I got is bad. Well, maybe not bad exactly, but I'm not sure it's good either. What you want first? Locke figured it was best to start by ripping off the band-aid. What's the bad? I lost her in Vegas. It was all cool. Then she gave me the slip. It was pretty slick too. I had no idea she'd seen me, and then she was gone. But she's in Vegas, which means that's where he has Kristen, said Locke. He knew from his research, and a quick call to Angie, that if Kristen was in Las Vegas, the chances of her being picked up were better than in most places. When it came to trafficking, the Vegas PD were switched on and had a lot of good officers. According to Angie, they weren't likely to accept a fake ID and throw an underage girl in jail or let her go back to her pimp. Yeah, that's where it gets complicated, said Ty. Our boy Hanger is back in LA. Locke cursed silently. That muddied the waters. If Hanger was back in town, then that meant Kristen could be too. Suddenly they had two cities to cover, and not one. How do you know he's back here? asked Locke. I had a call from some of his neighbors. They said he was back at his pad in Santa Monica. Didn't stay long, but he was definitely there. 
They have any idea where he was headed. Nada. I expect he keeps his real work very separate from people like that. He's mostly just on nodding terms. No people around, no loud parties. He keeps a low profile when he's on the west side. That concerned Locke on a couple of fronts. First, they now had no real idea where Hanger was. Second, it was a sign that he was smart. Dumb criminals made a show of what they did for a living, the clever ones played it down, and went out of their way not to draw attention to themselves. As a general rule, the dumb criminals were easier to deal with for that very reason. Brian? You still there? Yeah, sorry, I'm thinking. I can call Jenny and ask her to scan the internet listings for Vegas, see if we can get a lead that way. You want me to hit the track downtown when I get back, see if I can spot him. That's one of his regular haunts, right? said Ty. Locke was aware that this wasn't Ty's problem to solve. You have time for that. I'll make the time. This is kind of personal for me too now. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, if you want the truth, this whole thing's been a bit of a gut check for me. How come, asked Locke? Dude, I'm like everyone else. You hear the word pimp, and you think one thing. You hear the word sex trafficker, you think something else. But they're basically the same damn thing. Locke knew exactly what he was saying. Pimping had become part of American culture, the word was ingrained in the vernacular. Rappers rapped about it. Movies were made about it. It was something that was sold as entertainment, with the idea that pimps were somehow business managers when the truth was, they were the worst kind of predators. You're not the only one, brother. I didn't know about any of this until I met Angie. Okay, listen, said Ty. I'm going to grab some coffee, take a leak and drive back. I'll drop Carmen's car back to your place. If anything changes, I'll give you a call. Same, said Locke. I have some calls out to law enforcement in a couple of different places. I'll call the cops in Vegas too. Give them a heads up. Locke's phone lit up with another call. I have to take this, he told Ty. I'll see you soon, said Ty, hanging up, as Locke switched to the other call, the number withheld. Brian Locke. No reply. There was someone there. He could hear the sound of traffic in the background. Hello, said Locke. The line went dead. 42. You have to understand one thing about the pimping game, Andre, said Hanger. They were sitting in Andre's car in a McDonald's parking lot. The car faced out to the gas station across the street. Andre looked at him, nervous. What's that? You can never let the hose run the game. Not ever. Once that happens, it's over, said Hanger, his fingers miming an explosion. This was the first time they had seen each other since Andre had passed Kristen over, and all hell had broken loose. Hanger knew that Andre had given up information. That meant one thing. Andre owed him. Yeah, I feel you, said Andre. I know you do, said Hanger digging into his jacket and pulling out a scrap of paper with an address scrawled on it in blue pen. It had taken some time to get the address. There had been a lot of phone calls. At first, he hadn't gotten anywhere. Then he'd found a girl who was looking to get back into the life. She was strung out, in need of a fix. In return for hangar making sure the sickness stopped, she had given it up. Junkie were like that. They'd do anything, betray anyone, as long as they could feel okay again. Andre looked at the scrap of paper. What you want me to do? He asked Hanger. We'll get to that, said Hanger, a smile creeping over his face. 43. The smell of gasoline thick in the car, Andre pulled over and made a final check of the address. Yup, this was it. He switched off the engine and cracked the front windows, partly to clear the smell and also because a running engine or fogged up windows got you noticed. Not that anyone was around. It was two in the morning and the street was empty. Andre sat there for a moment. He looked at the address again. 
he looked at the gas canister sitting on the passenger seat. Part of him wanted to drive home, go to bed and give Hanger some kind of excuse, like he was about to do it, but the cops drove by. The problem was that Hanger would never believe him. He'd know he was lying and that he'd punked out. If Hanger put the word out, then Andre's life wouldn't be worth living. There was nothing worse on the streets than a snitch. Okay, he may not have spoken to the cops, but it was a distinction without a difference. A car drove past, its headlights sweeping across his windshield. He sunk down into his seat until it passed and looked across the street. This was bad. Different level. Once it was set in motion, it would be out of his control. All Hanger had told him was that the place was full of hoes, and that the lady that ran it was behind all the bad news that had been coming their way. He tried to persuade Hanger to go with something less drastic, but his mentor's mind had been set. Burn it to the fucking ground, he said. Easy to say, thought Andre, but harder to do. His phone chimed. He answered it. Yeah. What you waiting for? The question spooked him. Was Hanger watching him? Was he here? He looked up and down the street. He couldn't see Hanger's BMW. Nor could he see anyone else sitting in their car. That didn't mean too much. Hanger could be like a ghost, appearing and then evaporating seemingly at will. Someone just drove by, said Andre. Yeah, that was me, said Hanger. Now go take care of business. If I come back and you're still sitting there, it's not going to end well for you. Andre popped his door. I'm doing it, don't worry. You'd better be. Andre pulled his hood up over his face, and Speed walked across the street holding a jerry can full of gasoline. When he got to the building, he skirted around the front and walked down to the side. He climbed the padlocked gate, careful not to spill anything from the can. Jumping down he jacked up his ankle. He cursed as a security light snapped on, bathing him in light. Angry that he'd hurt himself, he swore and kept moving, keeping his head down so that even if he was caught on camera, his face wouldn't be clear. It wasn't like this was an insurance job where someone wanted to hide the fact that they'd set a fire. At the rear of the building, he found what he was looking for. A big stack of cardboard boxes next to the recycling. He set the can down and hauled the cardboard over to the back door. He arranged the cut-up empty boxes at the back door and poured the gasoline over them, careful again not to get any on his clothes. When the cardboard was good and soaked, he set the can down in the middle and looked around for anything that might burn. His luck was in. Over by a dumpster, someone had dumped an old chair. He humped it over and set it down near enough to his little makeshift bonfire. Reaching into his pocket he pulled out the taper, lit it, walked back and threw it into the pile. For a second nothing happened, and he thought it had gone out mid-throw. He stayed where he was, giving it time. There was a sudden flash as the gas ignited. He didn't hang around to see what would happen or how it would spread. If anything, he hoped it would go out. As part of the mission complete, he ran back to the side, climbed the fence again, and this time lowered himself gently down. Limped on his ankle, he half ran and half hopped back across the street, got in his car and took off without a backward glance. The scream of the smoke detector had Angie wide awake and bolt upright in bed. She grabbed a robe and stumbled out into the hallway. A couple of the other girls were out there already. She smelled the acrid odor of the smoke before she saw it. It was pooling at the bottom of the stairs. Quickly, she ran over to one of the three recently installed panic buttons and pressed it. When Locke had been here, as well as updating the cameras and alarms, he'd made everyone, Angie included, work through what he'd called actions on attack. He'd explained that all it meant was having already decided what steps you'd take in any given situation where danger presented before it happened. Fire had been one of them. The route to the fire escape was at the end of the hallway. Angie shouted for any of the women in the hallway to wake the others. She ran back into her room, grabbed her phone and called 911, calming herself down as best she could and giving their details. Back out in the corridor, she shooed her flock down the hallway and through the door that led to the fire escape. 
As they shuffled past her, out onto the fire escape and down the metal steps, she counted heads. They were one short. Missy. Where was Missy? She was a recent arrival to the refuge, only 19, but a girl who had spent the last six years on the streets. She also had a fairly major drug problem that she was working on, which might have explained her absence. Worse, her room was down at the other end of the hallway. Angie turned back, a couple of the other girls calling to her to follow them down the fire escape. Go on, she told them. I'll be real quick. Out in the hallway, smoke was in the air. She could still see fine, but it caught at the back of her throat and she started to cough. Lifting the edge of her robe, she placed it across her nose and mouth and hustled down the hallway. Pushing open Missy's bedroom door, Angie rushed inside. She closed the door behind her. Missy was in bed, lying on her side. She must have taken something. There was no way even the deepest sleeper would have slept through this otherwise. Even the alarm by itself was loud enough to wake the dead. Angie knelt down and shook her awake. Slowly Missy started to come round. Come on, we have to get you out of here. Missy's eyes began to open. She had a glazed look. Drugs weren't allowed in the refuge, but that was a talk for another time. Not right now. Angie hauled Missy out of bed by grabbing her arm. What is it? said Missy. There's a fire, we have to get out. The smell of smoke came again, intense and insistent. Angie shepherded Missy to the door. She opened it. The hallway was filled with smoke now. Pushing Missy back inside the room, Angie closed the door again. She grabbed some bedding and jammed it at the bottom. Then she ran to the window and yanked it up and open. She leaned out and started shouting. 44. Locke stood behind the yellow and black crime scene tape that ran along the front of the building. He watched as Angie was loaded into the back of an ambulance, an oxygen mask covering her mouth and nose. From what he'd already gathered from one of the cops, she'd gone to wake one of the young women who was slow to get out, and collapsed from smoke inhalation as the firefighters were leading her to safety. Apart from shock, everyone else was fine. The fire had been crudely set and quickly extinguished. There wouldn't be any need for an in-depth investigation. This wasn't a sophisticated insurance job that had been made to look like an accident. Nothing had been rewired. As Austin's went, it had been as simple as setting fire to a bunch of gasoline-soaked boxes at the rear of the property. As far as Locke was concerned, that could only mean one thing. It had been designed to send a message. The question was by who, and what was the precise nature of the message? There were a number of possible answers. The most obvious in Locke's mind was that it was somehow connected to the search for Kristen Miller, but that could easily be confirmation bias on his part. It was just as likely that a former pimp or jealous boyfriend had stumbled upon the location of the refuge and decided to extract some form of retribution. Mr. Locke? Locke looked up to see an LAPD sergeant heading his way. You told one of my officers that you'd just updated the security here. Yes, said Locke. The cameras should have it all recorded. Everything goes to a remote server, so I can send everything I have over to you. That would be a big help. The sergeant looked back to the fire-damaged building. Obviously, we haven't been able to speak with the lady who runs it. You know, if she had any specific concerns. Was that why she'd asked you to take a look at the security? Locke wanted to choose his words with care. They were on the same team, no question about that but he wanted to get a better handle on who was behind this before he said too much about Kristen Miller. Nothing specific, no, but obviously there are plenty of bad guys out there who'd have a problem with a place like this. No particular threats you were aware of. The sergeant's tone of voice suggested that he didn't fully believe Locke, but that he wasn't about to call him on it either. None, but if I think of anything, I'll let you know. Appreciate it, said the sergeant, fishing out a business card. They traded cards. I'll email you a link to all the security camera footage as soon as I get home. 
Apparently satisfied, the sergeant wandered back to speak to some of his patrol officers as Ty pulled up in his car and headed over to speak with Locke. What happened? Locke brought him up to speed. You looked at the cameras yet? asked Ty. Just got here, said Locke. What you think, said Ty. Locke shook his head. I don't know. Could be hangar and could be a coincidence. I don't like coincidences, said Ty. Me either. They drove back to Locke and Carmen's place to take a look at what the cameras had captured. Locke had already scoped them out, and apart from one at the rear that appeared to have been damaged as the fire took hold, they all appeared to be intact and untampered with. Dawn hadn't yet broken as they hunkered down in the living room, and Locke began to download the footage to his laptop. Carmen appeared still sleepy and started to make coffee. You guys cool? Ty asked Locke. Yeah I mean, I think she'd rather this hadn't spun out of control like this, but she wants whoever this asshole was caught as much as we do. Just don't go letting this bullshit get in between you. I hear you, said Locke, as he opened up the video player to review what the camera at the rear property had filmed before the fire was set. The fire crew had estimated the blaze had been set close to when the first call came in to dispatch. Maybe a half hour prior and possibly less. Surprisingly for such an amateur attempt at arson, it had taken hold quickly, burning through the wooden door and quickly finding a bag of recycling that had been left on the other side. It didn't take Locke long to find the arsonist. As he watched it unfold at five times regular speed, a shape appeared in the otherwise static frame. He pulled it back to just before the person appeared and played it at regular speed. The quality from the camera was good, but the positioning was a little too high. One of Angie's criteria had been discretion. She didn't want the women who lived there to feel they were being watched. Most of them had experienced years of that, years in a life where they had no autonomy, and where every aspect of what they had was controlled. He knows it's there, said Ty. Or he's guessing that it is, said Locke. A common but rookie error was criminals who stared straight into the lens. This person had their head covered, and they'd kept their face angled down. Locke studied the footage at slow speed. As the arsonist arranged the boxes, he froze the frame and zoomed in. What do you think? he asked Ty. Those hands belong to a guy. He moves like one too. What is he, maybe six, six one? Slim. White. That narrows it down to a few million people in the greater Los Angeles area. Okay, well, let's check the camera at the front, said Locke, going into the folder and opening up a new file. He moved to the timecode stamp a few minutes before the person appeared at the back of the property. All it threw up was the same shadowy figure in the same hoodie as he moved quickly down the side of the property. Ty threw up his hands. God damn it. Carmen appeared with two mugs of coffee. Thanks, said Locke, kissing her cheek. Anything? Nothing, said Ty, exasperated. We still got one more to check, said Locke. We do, asked Ty. Yeah, I placed a covert camera outside to cover the street. Sneaky. I like it, said Ty. Wasn't part of the brief, but I figured what the hell for a few more bucks and a few more gig of storage, said Locke. Okay, let's see, said Carmen, perching on the edge of the couch as Locke clicked on the folder. He pulled up the video from this camera. He'd had it placed in some shrubs on the street side of the building. The camera had a relatively wide angle and was about three feet above ground level, ensuring that it captured everything on the street. He moved the timestamp to around 15 minutes before the arsonist had made his appearance and placed it on five times play speed. What you think? asked Ty. Get the car. Not unless the guy's a complete moron. You park a block away, said Locke. Carrying a can of gas. Kinda suspicious. Locke shrugged. Just looks like you broke down. Remind me to never commit arson with you, said Ty. Noted. Hey, hold up, said Locke, reaching down and pausing the footage as car headlights cut down the street. 
he pulled it back and watched the car drive down the street. It didn't stop, no one got out. Just someone driving home. He restarted the video footage. It played through the time frame for the fire being set. Locke let it continue to spool out. The camera had caught the arsonist fleeing the scene. He was on the edge of the frame, with his back to the camera, and moving fast. Locke played it back in slow motion. They couldn't see his face, or anything else they hadn't already seen from the camera at the rear of the property. The footage moved on. Whoa. Hold up, said Ty as a fresh set of car headlights light up the street. Locke hit pause one more time, then rewound a few frames. Damn, said Ty. Can't see the license tag. Locke fiddled a bit more with the video player, until he had the car in the middle of the frame side on. Don't have to, said Locke. I know whose car that is. 45. You're sure, said Carmen, peering at the screen as she leaned over the couch. 100%, said Locke. Or it's the mother of all coincidences, Ty chipped in. And Ryan doesn't believe in coincidences, said Carmen, straightening up and walking around the couch so she was facing them. Locke could feel an address to the court about to go down. That was the vibe Carmen was giving off. He had a fair idea what the gist of it would be too. No going vigilante again, she said. He smiled. He'd been right. Getting charges in Bakersfield dropped is one thing, and even that was a stretch, but here's different. So what we do, asked Ty. He was looking more to Locke than Carmen. We can take this straight to the cops, but the first thing he's going to do is lawyer up. He goes down for the arson, but that doesn't help us find Kristen. No it doesn't, said Ty. I'd vote we beat the shit out of him and hand it to the cops, but Carmen you're right, we can't find this kid if we're cooling our jets in county jail. Carmen stalked over to the window and back. She snapped her fingers. Maybe there's a way you can have your cake and eat it too, she said. Oh yeah, said Ty. Yeah, she said, tapping the back of the laptop with her nails. 46. There was no such thing as time in Las Vegas. Not inside the casinos, anyway. No clocks. No windows in the gaming rooms. No way of knowing whether it was night or day. Then even went as far as pumping oxygen in to keep the gamblers alert and awake. If you didn't know the time, how could you know you'd spent 10 or 12 or even 24 hours at the tables, or pumping money into the slot machines? The game was to keep people gambling, which Sooth had explained to Kristen, was why casino security and women like them were enemies. They tolerated selling sex because that was part of the city's appeal. For instance, said Sooth, they would never embarrass a John if he was with them. But if you stepped onto the casino floor and they caught you soliciting for business, then watch out. That was where they were now. On the casino floor. Kristen with her fake id that gave her age as a wildly improbable 21, and Sooth watching everyone around them, explaining to Kristen who a likely customer was and who wasn't. See that guy over there, said Sooth, pointing out a balding middle-aged white guy in a sport coat. Yes, said Kristen. He keeps looking over. Next time he does, you look back. Don't break eye contact. He'll come over. Okay, said Kristen, watching him as she stirred her straw around her orange juice. That was the other rule of being a carpet hoe, Sooth had told her. No drinking on the job, and definitely a hundred percent no getting high. That would get you kicked out faster than anything. He looked again. Kristen stared back at him. This was way tougher than being out on the track, she thought to herself. The track was straightforward. If a guy was in his car on the track and he had his window down, then he was either a John or a cop. Here on the carpet, there were other men, a lot of them not looking to buy sex. On the other hand, Sooth had explained, the rewards were higher. A girl could charge a lot more for a guy she met here. Sooth wasn't exactly sure why that was. Maybe it was something to do with the fact that the carpet hose looked better, they were on point. 
A girl with meth-rotten teeth who was stumbling all over the place wouldn't last two seconds on a casino floor. Kristen was just glad that Sooth was here, and what had happened back in L.A. had been forgotten. By now Sooth was like a big sister to her. She could be tough on Kristen, but she told Kristen it was for her own good, and Kristen was starting to believe that. The guy looked back over at them. Kristen looked back. Okay that's good, plenty of eye contact, don't look away, Sooth coached. The guy was starting to come over. Okay, you're on your own now, girl, said Sooth, stepping off to a nearby craps table and leaving Kristen standing by herself. Hey, how are you? The guy said to Kristen. I'm good, said Kristen. You looking for a date? The guy smiled. He moved the bottom of his sport coat to one side, revealing a laminated plastic casino ID badge. Okay, let's see some identification. Let me guess, you're 21, right? Kristen froze, a rabbit in the headlights. I didn't do anything, she stuttered. Sure you didn't. What are you like, 16? From nowhere, she felt a hand on her arm. She jumped, expecting it to be attached to a security guard, or worse, a cop. We were just leaving, said Sooth, guiding Kristen gently away from the guy. He stepped in front of them. I haven't finished speaking to her yet, said the casino security guy. You ain't a cop and we're leaving, okay, said Sooth, her face set like granite. It was the same look she gave Kristen when Kristen had messed up or she needed her to do something. I don't want to see either of you in here again. Understand me, said the security guy as he stepped out of their way. Sooth guided Kristen past him and across the floor. Kristen's heart was still racing. Being arrested was one of the cardinal sins of being a carpet hoe. A few minutes later, they were back out on the street. Ain't no thing, said Sooth. I thought you'd be mad, said Kristen. You got to be less direct, girl. Let them ask you if you want a date. I'm sorry. Sooth looked her up and down. Don't be sorry, get it right. Sooth's phone chimed with an incoming text. She checked it. Her face clouded a little. She didn't say what it was or who it was from, and Kristen knew better than to ask. Come on, said Sooth. We better go make some money. Hanger gets back here, and we ain't got no cash to show him then you and me are both going to be in trouble. Kristen didn't need that part decoded for her. Trouble meant a beating. 47. Andre came around the corner and strolled over to his car. He saw Locke standing next to it, arms folded. Turning he started to run, only to find himself smashing straight into a wall of retired U.S. Marine. Ty folded his arms around Andre like he was giving a hug to a long-lost friend. Why you so jumpy, brother, said Ty. Andre tried to struggle free. Ty let him keeping a precautionary hand on his shoulder in case he tried to make another run for it. Relax, we just want to talk with you for a few minutes. Or you can talk to the cops about trying to burn down that refuge. Your choice. I don't know anything about that, said Andre as Locke joined them. Unfortunately for you, said Locke. We do. He held up his phone, angling it so that Andre could see it. On the screen was a still image of Andre's car from the roadside security camera. That, my friend, is enough to convict you. Andre stared at it. So why don't you go to the cops, he said. Ty put a comforting arm around Andre's shoulder, walking him over to the street. We were hoping to avoid doing that. Locke could see the cogs turning in Andre's head. He wasn't the sharpest tool in the box, but he wasn't entirely dumb, either. In fact, he seemed suddenly focused. Get in the car, said Locke. Andre did as he was told, climbing into the front passenger seat of Locke's car. Locke got in the driver's seat. Ty climbed in back. How come you guys knew about the refuge, said Locke. I don't know what you're talking about. Locke let out a theatrical sigh. What you did, that's 10 to 15 if the DA really goes after you, which they will because this is what you might call, 
a hot button issue. Not to mention the fact you've been recruiting girls for hangar. Underage girls. Ty leaned forward between the seats. You know what they do to guys like you in Penn in California? Level 1 yard, you might be fine. Level 2, the same. But you land on a level 3 or 4 yard and they check your paperwork, you're done. First chance someone gets, you're getting marked up. And that's if you're lucky. If you're unlucky, then your celly gets given the job of making sure that he has the place to himself, added Locke. It may have sounded like an exaggeration, but Locke and Ty both knew this was the reality that awaited Andre if he was convicted. Convicts in California were old school when it came to any kind of crime that was sexual in nature, especially one that involved violence, coercion, or a victim who was below the age of consent. I don't know what you're talking about, said Andre. Locke and Ty traded a look. Locke reached over and opened Andre's door. Okay, have it your way. Andre didn't move. He looked at Locke as if this was some kind of trap that was being laid, like there had to be a catch. It was strange how frightening an open door could seem under the right circumstances, thought Locke, which was precisely why he had opened it. Andre left the door open. He didn't get out, either. No one died, he said. I saw that on the news. That comment provoked a laugh from Ty in the back seat. Yeah, they probably won't even bother investigating it in that case. I don't get why you even care, said Andre. If you're not cops then what's it to you? That's correct, said Locke. We're not cops. Who are you? asked Andre. That doesn't matter, said Ty. The only thing that matters right now is that we have the goods to send you to prison. But if you give us what we want, then that doesn't happen, added Locke. And what is it you want? We want Kristen Miller. I don't even know where she is. Well then you'd better find out where that footage is going to the LAPD, along with everything else we know about you trafficking a minor, said Locke. Don't think about skipping town either. Not unless you're going to take your mom with you, said Ty. Hey, she doesn't have anything to do with this, said Andre. Ty laughed. Neither did Kristen Miller's mom. In fact, neither would Kristen have if she hadn't had the misfortune to run into a low-life piece of shit like you. What's it to be, said Locke, extracting Andre's cell phone from his pocket, turning it over in his hand and passing it back to him. Andre massaged the bridge of his nose with pinched fingers. Okay, let me think how I do this. Take your time, said Locke. Once I tell you where to find them, then you destroy what you have. That's the deal, said Locke. Okay, I got it, said Andre. But he doesn't always answer when I call. Locke and Ty stared at him. The silence grew. Andre made the call. Seconds passed. Hey, hanger, yeah, all good. Listen, I got a new girl. Hanger said something that neither Locke nor Ty caught. Yeah, I know I haven't mentioned her before. I didn't know if it would work, but I think she's ready to meet you. Another pause. Yeah, white, real pretty like a surfer girl. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Locke knew that no matter what was happening right now, or how nervy Hanger might be, that Andre was dangling a unicorn in front of his mentor. Where you at? Andre asked. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'll send you over a picture, and we can hook up when you're back here. The call over, Andre placed his phone face down on his leg, his foot tapping out a beat of pure anxiety. They're in Vegas. Hangar's headed there now. Vegas is a big place, said Ty, unimpressed. Hangar has a crash pad in Paradise City. I can get you the address. That's more like it, said Ty. Locke and Ty watched Andre take off down the street in his car, no doubt to find somewhere he could stash the vehicle. Not that it would help him if they went back on their word and handed the footage over to the cops. You trust him, said Ty. I trust him to want to save his own skin, said Locke. He could still call Andre back and give him a heads up. He could, and then we could give the cops what we have. 
And what about when we have the girl back? asked Tai. What about it? Well, do we destroy what we have on him like we said we would? Or do we give it to the cops? Locke bit down on his lip, pensive. Let's see if we can find her first, said Locke. 48. If they knew about the car, Andre assumed the cops might too. It was going to be hard to deny he had anything to do with the arson if it was parked in his driveway. Selling it was out of the question. If things did go badly, then getting rid of it would make him look guilty. No, he needed somewhere to stash it for a while. Some place that no one would see it from the street. He drove out to Simi Valley. His buddy had a body shop out there. He could leave it there for a while until things cooled down with no questions asked. He was fairly sure that the body shop dealt in all manner of vehicles, not all of them legally acquired. When he got there, he slipped them a hundred and left it in back, the car cover providing an extra level of concealment. It wasn't great, but it was the best he could do for now. The best thing would have been to throw it into a compactor for scrap, but there was no way he was going to do that to such a beautiful automobile. In any case, he had worked hard to buy it. A lot of girls had been handed over to Hangar to pay for it. Relieved that the car was gone, he climbed into an old Toyota that his buddy had said he could use until he came back for his Buick. He stopped at a McDonald's, grabbing a coffee and a cheeseburger. There was a cute girl behind the counter. Normally, he would have gone to work feeling her out. She was light-skinned Latino with long black hair and deep brown eyes. She was shy too. He thought about getting her Instagram, maybe even her number, but he couldn't focus on a new acquisition with all this going on. He took his coffee and burger and sat by the window and tried to work through how he was going to get himself out of this, or at the very least not get dragged any further in. The two guys would be back. That was for sure. He wasn't convinced that they'd harm his family. It had seemed more of a hollow threat than anything. But was he prepared to take the chance? He took a sip of coffee and decided that he wasn't. It would be better if he gave them what they wanted. The only problem was that giving them what they wanted meant risking Hanger's wrath. Hanger was violent. Andre didn't doubt for a moment that if he discovered that Andre had ratted on him, that he would come looking for revenge. He took a bite of burger and stared out the window as a car full of high school girls rolled up and got out. It was, he thought, as if the universe was taunting him, offering up a bunch of distractions when he knew he had to keep his mind clear. Ten years in prison was a long time, he reminded himself. Maybe he could give the two men a fake address in Vegas, the building next door or something. When they called him on it, he could claim an honest mistake. Would they buy it though? He doubted it. They'd either hand over what they had to the cops, or worse, they'd come back to his home. The high school girls came in and walked to the counter, a couple of them checking him out. He kept his head down and his eyes on the window. Give up hangar or go to prison. His dilemma wasn't going anywhere. He pushed away what was left of the burger, no longer hungry. There had to be a way to pacify those two psychos while not risking hangar's wrath. He picked up his coffee and walked back outside. As he opened the driver's door of the Toyota, it came to him. It wasn't a perfect solution, far from it, but it was all he had. Play both ends to the middle, he told himself. He pulled out his phone, tapped out a text with the address of Hanger's pad in Vegas, and pressed send. Once it was gone, he deleted it so it no longer showed on his phone, a gesture that was born more out of superstition than any fear someone would see it. Next he took another sip of coffee, called Hanger, and told him some of what had happened. Two guys had appeared out of nowhere. They knew everything. They were looking for Kristen. As Hanger probed him on what they looked like, Andre conveniently left out the part about giving them Hanger's address, but said that Hanger needed to be on his guard. They had told him they knew Hanger was in Vegas, and they were looking for him. They said it like they meant business. Oh, and they were armed, bro, he said. Said that if they saw you, then they were gonna kill you. Hanger wrapped up the call. Andre leaned his back against the car and blew out a big breath of air. That should do it, he thought. 
let them take each other out. The high school girls were coming back out. He noticed one of them was hanging back. All the others were looking over at him, giggling and talking amongst themselves. All apart from the one at the back of the group. Ignoring her friends, he walked over to her. Hey, you're really pretty, he said. She didn't look up, just stared down at the ground. Can I get your number, he asked her. 49. Locke read off the address from the text message. He plugged it into Google Maps and angled his phone screen so Ty, who was driving, could see it on the map. Yeah, that's close to where I lost the black chick driving the BMW. He could be lying to us, said Locke. No way of knowing until we get there. They were on the I-15, with just over a hundred miles to go, until they made it to Vegas. They'd stopped once to load up on coffee and donuts and to fill the gas tank, but Locke wanted to get there. Ty eased up on the gas pedal as they sped past a California highway patrol sitting at the side of the road running a speed trap. Think we should call it into the Vegas PD? asked Ty. They could go take a look. They're going to be faster on the scene where they are. That had been Locke's first thought too. From what he knew about law enforcement in Vegas, they were, unsurprisingly, well versed in dealing with trafficking cases. But there was a snag with asking them to go check. Yeah, said Locke. But if they send a couple of uniforms in and they don't find her, then we have a problem. Might be better to have the element of surprise. I hear you, said Ty. And we're assuming this isn't some wild goose chase. That too, said Locke. If we need, we can call them. Once we find her, you're taking a step back from this stuff, right? Ty asked, side eyeing Locke. I don't think Carmen's going to give me much of a choice in the matter. Can't really blame her. Oh, I'm not, said Locke. That beating you caught really seemed to shake her up. There's a bit more to it than that. Ty looked over at him. Oh, yeah? We've not really told anyone yet, but seeing as you're as close to family as I have, we have some news. Ty raised an eyebrow. We? Is this news what I think it is? Don't tell her I said anything, not until she says something anyway, but yeah, Carmen's pregnant. Ty broke into a huge grin. He raised a hand and high-fived Locke. Ah oh, brother, that's amazing. Congratulations. When'd you find out? You know what it is yet? Is it gonna be a little Ryan or a little Carmen? It's a little girl, said Locke. Ty shook his head. He was still smiling. I can't believe it. I'm going to be a godfather. When Locke didn't say anything, the smile dropped. You are asking me to be one of the godparents, right? Of course, said Locke. Satisfied, Ty turned his full attention back to the road. Neither of them said anything for a few moments. I can't believe it, said Ty. You're gonna be a father. I know, said Locke. How are you feeling about it? I'm happy, said Locke. But I'll be a lot better when we have this kid back home. I hear you. And what about the cleanup, said Ty. Locke knew what he meant. What were they going to do with Hanger? There were a few scores to settle, if that was the way they decided to go. I think we leave that to the cops. We may have already pushed our luck. I don't want to end up facing a judge over some piece of garbage like that. But if we walk in there and he pulls a piece, said Ty. Then we do what we have to do. 50. When Hanger walked in, Sooth was busy plumping the cushions on the couch like some demented housewife from a 1950s TV show. She'd snorted a little something a couple of hours ago, so she could keep going. Whatever it had been cut with was making her jittery as well as wide awake. She hadn't been looking forward to Hanger's arrival. Babysitting Kristen meant she hadn't been able to make nearly the kind of money she usually would have. On a good night she could have made a couple of thousand dollars, maybe more. Between her and Kristen, they had made less than 400. 
There was no way Hanger would be happy with that. Sit down, she said, patting the couch. Let me fix you a drink. He didn't say anything, but he sat down as she mixed him a scotch and soda and brought it over. He took it from her. Where is she? he said. Oh, she's taking a nap. You want me to go get her? No, leave her be. He wasn't saying much. That made her nervous. She didn't want to look at him directly because that could set him off. Instead, she snuck glances, trying to work out what kind of mood he was in. Usually, she was pretty good at getting a read on him. That was a big part of being a bottom girl, working out what your pimp wanted, maybe even before he knew himself. Today, her sixth sense wasn't working. He was quiet, withdrawn, but not in a way she recognized. Maybe it was the drugs she'd taken, or maybe it was just the craziness of the past few days, but when he looked at her, she didn't like it. He looked like Hanger, but something had changed, and she didn't know what. Once, years ago, she'd come close to being killed by a trick. The worrying part was that the guy had seemed completely normal. Then he'd flipped, just like that, and before she knew she'd been trapped in a car with him, fighting for her life. The vibe now had echoes of that, which made her telling him how little money they'd made even more nerve-wracking. Still, it was better for her to tell him than wait for him to ask. She went to her bag. We kind of had a light night. She's new to being on the carpet, and? He cut her off. Just give me what you got, he said, hand out, not looking at her as he studied his phone screen. She placed the money and credit card receipts in his hand, bracing for a reaction that didn't come. Hanger tapped out a text on his phone. He shoved the paper into his pocket without so much as looking at it, never mind counting it. In all the years she'd been with him, she'd never seen him not count what she handed over. It scared her so much that she could feel herself starting to sober up. We'll make it up, she said. Tonight. I'll take her back out. He looked up at her, almost as if he'd forgotten she was there. No. You won't. She didn't say anything. Asking what he meant would be a seriously bad idea. You want me to freshen that up, Daddy? She said. He ignored her. There's two guys out looking for her. If you see them, call me immediately. Don't worry, she said. I already lost the black guy when he was following me here. I know what he looks like. He won't catch me slipping. He didn't say anything to that. He pulled out his wallet and handed her cash. He nodded to the bedroom. Take her to the salon. Get her looking fine. I want her hair dyed. Blonde. Platinum blonde. Sooth froze for a second. Suddenly it all made sense. His mood. How he wasn't looking at her. Blonde, she said. He lifted his eyes to hers. Bitch, is there an echo in here, he said. No, she said. Don't look at me like that again, he said. Not ever. Blonde, she thought. With everything that had happened, it could only mean one thing. Hanger was about to cut his losses. 51. Put on some clothes, we're going to the salon. Kristen jumped up from the bed. She'd been lying on the bed, staring up at the ceiling with dead eyes. Now they sparkled, like a kid being told the family was off to see Santa. The way she reacted made Sooth want to grab her by the throat and shake her. The kids still didn't get that anything good a pimp ever did for you was for their benefit, not yours. Sooth waited as Kristen threw on some clothes. Hanger had left, but he'd be back to collect Kristen later. Sooth's stomach flipped over at the thought of it. She did her best to push the thought of what lay ahead out of her mind. Focus on what you need to do, she reminded herself. That had always been Sooth's mantra. She didn't plan on being in the life forever. Hose had an expiry date. She was about two or three years from her prime, and after that it would all be downhill. She didn't plan on staying with Hanger forever, either. Soon she'd cut loose and go make her own money. Enough to go home and go study to get a real job. 
I'm ready, said Kristen, emerging from the bedroom in a sweatshirt with sleeves long enough to cover her wrists. Sooth didn't say anything. It was a hard, unforgiving world. Kristen wasn't her problem. They walked downstairs and outside, Kristen jabbering on about what they'd get done at the salon. She thought it was like some kind of girl's pamper party when Sooth knew it was about getting a turkey ready for Thanksgiving. Can I get my nails done? she asked as they got into the back of the Uber. Sure, said Sooth, staring out of the window. Kristen leaned over and hugged Sooth's arm. Thank you for taking me. The gesture made Sooth want to start screaming and never stop. She was sweating and her heart was beating out of her chest, almost as bad as if it was her and not Kristen who was being handed over. Why was Hanger making her do this? It wasn't like she was going to see any of the money from the deal. Sooth wasn't even sure it was the right decision. So the kid's family had a couple of guys trying to find her. So what? It happened. They could ship Kristen out east, out to the Bronx. Or they could move her to Florida. Disney World had some of the busiest tracks in the country. All those family men dropping their kids off to see Mickey Mouse, then heading in the other direction to go party. There was a hint of spite to what Hanger was doing. A big fuck you to her family and the guys who were trying to find Kristen. Maybe that was what had soothed so tangled up in her own head. She brushed Kristen off her. Part of her wanted to get the driver to stop and push Kristen out of the car. She didn't want to be part of this. The beauty salon was next door to a strip club. That wasn't a coincidence. In fact, Sue thought it was kind of genius. Strippers spend a lot of time and a lot of money creating their look. It was a business expense. They pushed through the door and took a seat. After a while, someone came over to ask what they wanted. Bread and cut it short, Sooth told the hairstylist with a wave to Kristen. Kristen looked at her, puzzled. I thought I was going to be blonde. It took everything Sooth had not to slap the hell out of her. She hadn't even known she was going to say red rather than blonde until she'd found the words coming out of her mouth. But once they had, she knew this was the right thing. There's been a change of plan, said Sooth. Kristen must have picked up on the rage coming off Sooth because she dropped her eyes and silently followed the stylist over to a chair. Sooth followed them. How long's it going to take? she asked the stylist. Couple of hours. That was fine. A salon trip could take four, maybe five hours. Even pimps knew that. Two hours left an extra two hours to play with, and that should be enough. I'll be back, said Sooth as the stylist turned back to Kristen and said, Don't worry sweetie, you're going to look really cute when I'm done. You want a magazine to look at? There was a Target, a few blocks away. Sooth prowled the aisles, picking out a new outfit for Kristen. Jeans, low-top sneakers, a Vans t-shirt, and a bulky jacket that would change her shape. By the time Sooth was done, Hanger could walk right past Kristen and not even know. At the checkout, Sooth wavered for a second. It wouldn't just be Kristen that Hanger would be looking for. It would be her too, and his reaction would be nuclear. Ma'am? The cashier's voice snapped her back to the present. Yeah, sorry, said Sooth, pushing her purchases over to the counter. Once this was done, there was no going back. Her hand fell to her pocket and the knife she always carried with her. Her thumb ran along the side of the blade, enough to feel the sharpness, but not enough to break the skin. In her mind, she was somewhere else. This decision had seemed to come from nowhere, but she knew deep down that it really hadn't. It had been there for a while now, lurking somewhere in a part of her mind she had assumed was long dead. She paid for the clothes and walked back outside. It was sunny. She was scared more than scared terrified. But she also felt lighter, like the years that had passed since she'd been in the life were behind her somehow. Sooth had never been to church, not since she was a little girl and her grandmother had taken her. She'd sat in the pew and it was one time growing up with the light shimmering through the stained glass that she had felt truly at peace. There was a little of that now, a feeling of being at peace, of having made a decision, and because it was a good one, of having someone watching over her. 
She walked back to the salon trying to figure out how to explain all of this to Kristen. 52. The stylist gave the chair a theatrical twirl so that Sooth could see Kristen's new look from the front. Sooth smiled. The 14-year-old looked almost unrecognizable. Not only was her hair a bright, cartoonish red, it had been shaped into a bob. With her large eyes she looked, thought Sooth, like a character from a Japanese animation. More importantly, her appearance was completely different. It would take a second or third look to realize it was the same person. Sitting in the chair, Kristen didn't look as impressed. Are you sure Hanger's going to be okay with this? she asked. Sooth ignored the question. Is there somewhere she can get changed? she asked the stylist, holding up the bag with the outfit. Sure, just go through the back. Kristen trotted obediently behind Sooth as she led her through a door at the back of the salon and into a break room. Pulling out the clothes, Sooth told Kristen to change into them. Kristen held the t-shirt up, confused. What's this? Sooth guessed that the time had come to tell her the truth, or as much of it as she thought Kristen could handle. You're going to get changed into these clothes, and then I'm going to put you on a bus back to L.A. What? Why? Does Hanger want me back on the track? I know I haven't been making much money out here, but I'll get better, I promise. I just need more time. Sooth placed her hands on the girl's shoulders and shook her head. No, you're going home. Kristen recoiled at the words. No, I can't. Not now. Listen to me, if you stay here, you're going to die. No, I won't. Hanger's here now. If any of the Johns try anything, he'll mess them up. Sooth stared into her eyes. No, he won't. Sure he will. That's what pimps do. They look after their hoes. Keep them safe so they can work. For the longest time, Sooth would have agreed. More than agreed. She'd have been the one saying it. But it was bullshit, and dangerous bullshit at that. She could barely think of one time she'd been saved by a pimp. That's why she carried a knife. It was strange to be here. Hearing this kid spit back the sales pitch that Sooth had heard given a hundred times. It worked too. It was a good pitch if you found the right kind of person to say it to. But the reality was different. When you were in the life, no one cared if you lived or if you died. Why'd you think he wanted you blonde, huh? The question seemed to perplex Kristen. I'll tell you why. Because he's going to pass you over to a guy who likes little blonde white girls. That's why. So. Sooth had to fight back her temper. When he finds a girl he likes, he likes to hurt them. Do all sorts of crazy stuff to them, like a horror movie. If you don't finish up dead, then you'll wish you were. Hanger wouldn't let anyone do that. I'm a swan. Oh you think? This guy pays a lot of money for the right girl, and you're a whole bunch of trouble right now. Kristen's gaze dropped to the floor. Those words seemed to find their target. I'm going to take you down to catch the bus now, and you're going to get on it, okay? No answer. You're going to get on it, or you're going to die, Sooth repeated. Kristen finally looked up. What about you? What about me? What are you going to say to Hanger? Let me worry about that, said Sooth. Now finish getting changed. I don't know if I can go home, said Kristen. She sounded less defiant than defeated. You don't have a friend you can maybe go stay with? Kristen just looked at her and Sooth realized it was a stupid question. Girls with lots of friends weren't usually the ones who got caught up in the life. She dropped the subject and watched as Kristen got changed into her new set of casual clothes. When she was finished, Sooth jammed her old clothes into the bag. Come on, I'm going to show you where you can catch the bus. Together they walked out of the salon and out onto the street. Taken by a sudden wave of paranoia, Sooth looked around for Hanger. He was nowhere to be seen. He was likely still back at the apartment, 
planning how he was going to spend the money he'd get from handing Kristen over. Her phone chimed with a text. It was Hanger. He was asking for a picture of Kristen's new look. For a second Sue thought about sending him one, but that would be like throwing gasoline onto a fire. She powered down her phone and put it back into her bag, then she turned back to Kristen. You're gonna be okay. You're going to get on that bus and if you don't want to go home, there are places you can go, places that have girls just like you. Kristen blinked back tears. Sooth's words finally seemed to be hitting home. Sooth could feel her own throat start to tighten. There would be no going home for her. Not ever. Maybe one day, she'd also be able to leave the life behind her. Today wasn't that day. 53. A call from Joyce Walker flashed up on Locke's screen. He debated answering it. He'd have preferred to speak with her when they had found her daughter. Leaving it unanswered felt unfair. It was better to know, even if the only news was that there was no news. Ryan Locke Mr. Locke, I'm sorry to bother you. You're not bothering me. We have a tip that Kristen may be in Las Vegas. We're heading there now to check it out. Oh, that's great. You've no idea what a relief that is. Like I said, right now it's only a tip. We don't know if it's true or not. On the other end of the line, she let out a loud sigh. Still, I can't tell you how nice it is to hear something positive finally. Especially after the news earlier about Angie. I can't believe it. Locke looked over at Ty, both men thinking the same thing. What news? What's the news about Angie, Mrs. Miller? You haven't heard. Locke was hoping that she was talking about the fire at the refuge. She probably was. I know the refuge was the subject of an arson attack and that Angie was taken to the hospital for smoke inhalation, but I think it was mostly precautionary. There was silence from Joyce Walker. Not a good sign. Mrs. Walker, are you still there? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. I thought you would have heard. No, said Locke. I guess there were complications or something. I think Angie already had some trouble with her heart, you know, from all those years back when she was using drugs and drinking. What's happened, said Locke. Is she okay? No, I'm sorry to say she's not. She passed away. Next to him, Ty's face was stone cold, a reflection of his own. If they'd been weighing Andre's fate, this had sealed it. Locke wrapped up the call as gently as he could, telling Joyce he'd call her the second they found Kristen or knew anything more. She thanked him again. That's murder right there, said Ty. It sure is, said Locke. How long do we have to go? Ty checked the time to destination. An hour and twenty. Let's see if we can make it an hour ten, said Locke. 54. On her way back to the apartment, Sooth ran through the things she could say to hang her. She'd thought about lying, but that rarely worked with men like him. They were experts at sniffing out deception. She paced up and down the sidewalk about the building for a while before going in. After a time, she settled on a strategy. She'd tell him the truth, weather the inevitable storm that would come. Then, when Hanger's temper had blown itself out, she would make him see that it had been the right thing to do. Not just for Kristen, he wouldn't care about that, but for him. Taking a few deep breaths, she walked into the building. Hanger was sitting on the couch, clouded in a halo of weed smoke, when she walked in. He was brooding over something. You stop answering messages, huh? She played dumb. What message? He started to get up from where he was sitting, decided against it, and sunk back down. So where is she, he said, his gaze floating past Sooth. Sooth's skin prickled with sweat. Her throat tightened. This was it, the moment to rip off the band-aid and unleash the storm. She'd take a beating. She was sure of it. But she'd taken beatings before. She knew how to move her body so that some of the impact was cushioned. 
She also knew how to make the right sounds so Hanger would ease off. After all, she was inventory, and you didn't want to destroy inventory. She's gone. Hanger's eyes bore into her. He put down the blunt he was smoking. What do you mean she's gone? She's gone. She's not here. He stood up, hands clasped together, rings gleaming as he cracked his knuckles. I can see that bitch. So where is she? And what do you mean she's gone? She didn't give him a reply. He circled her, walking behind her. She could feel his breath on the back of her neck. Like she ran away, that kind of gone. Sooth could sense that this was going to be a big storm, one that was gathering off a coast somewhere, ready to rip through everything it touched when it finally touched land. Maybe more like a hurricane or a typhoon. She also knew that Hanger had just given her a place to hunker down if she told him that Kristen had run away. The problem with lying now was that he was bound to find out sooner or later. All she would be doing by confirming what he'd said would be to delay the inevitable. Was it better to punk out and deal with him later? Or was it wiser to be truthful and get it over with? In the end, as he circled slowly round her, inches from her face, his eyes never leaving her, fear won out. Yeah, she took off. His hand shot up. He grabbed her hair and snapped her neck back. Well then you'd better go find her, hadn't you? I tried, she said. I think she ran to the cops. There was like a cop car, and she was heading over to them, and I figured it was better to just split. The words and the scenario behind them came to her in a rush. Why hadn't she thought of it before? It was the perfect lie. It would put Hanger even more on edge. Maybe even enough that he'd back off. The only thing that held any sway over men like Hanger was the idea of spending years in prison on a trafficking charge. No amount of money or disappointing a special client was worth it. That before or after you left Dixie's. Dixie's was the name of the strip club next to the salon, but to Hanger the two were obviously interchangeable. After. It was after, Sooth blurted out. His expression shifted fractionally, and she knew she'd made a mistake. He was smiling the faintest of smiles. She'd seen it before. It was the smile that crept over his face when he knew for sure that a girl was lying to him, holding back money, or telling him she'd spent all night on the track when she'd made her money early and went somewhere to rest up, get warm or get high. It was after. She knew better than to back down. Pick a story and stick to it, come hell or high water. Hanger backed off. His hands dropped to his side. He walked over to the window, facing away from her, even though the shades were down and he couldn't look outside. So she had her hair all done and blonde and she got the full makeover and then she just took off. Sooth didn't like not being able to see his face when he asked a question. She hesitated, hoping he would turn back towards her and she'd be able to read him. He laughed soft and low. That's one clever bitch. Let me spend my money and then she takes off. I almost admire that level of deception in a hoe. Yes, yeah, she's clever, said Sooth. Hanger still hadn't turned around. All she could see was his back. He looked relaxed. It's okay. I'll find her. I mean, I'm going to have to do something because you messed up. You understand that, right? Yeah, I understand. How'd she look with that new hair color, he asked. She looked good. Okay, so I find her and pass her over and there's no real damage done. When he said he almost seemed to be talking to himself somehow, offering his own mind some reassurance that this was a situation he could manage. Sooth started to relax. He'd likely slap her around a little for having messed up, but no more than that. As for finding Kristen, she'd be on a bus back to Los Angeles in a little over an hour. Turning away from the window, he looked over at her, his face relaxed, only his eyes showing a hint of anger. Soothe, baby, go in the bedroom and get me a coat hanger. A wire one. The temperature in the room seemed to drop. Her blood ran cold. She told herself that she had to stay calm. 
she couldn't show the fear she felt because fear would suggest she'd been lying, and then her fate would be sealed. You can't use that on her, not when you're going to move her on. Slowly, he stepped over to her. He was back within inches of her. Oh don't worry, she ain't going to be seeing it. He gave her the shark smile. You are. You see I called the salon. Just to make sure that everything was being done how I asked. Now go get me that coat hanger. 55. Kristen's hand came up to her hair. She couldn't stop herself from touching it, or pausing to study herself every time she caught a glimpse of her reflection in a store window. On the walk to the bus station she'd thought about what Soothe had told her, turning it over and over in her mind. Whatever it was had to be bad. There was no way Soothe would have done this otherwise. Was it as bad as death, she'd wondered. She wasn't sure how much death scared her now. A disheveled man wandered past her, weaving his way across the sidewalk. He made a clucking noise with his tongue. What about it, baby? How much? She put her head down and hurried past him. Even with her new look was it still obvious what she was? No, she told herself. It was just how some men were. As she walked on, the idea that people could tell what she'd been doing continued to trouble her. Was there any going home? Any way of somehow turning back the clock to the time before she met Andre, and all this started? Could she even bring herself to go home? What would she say to her mom? Shame and embarrassment welled up in her. It threatened to overwhelm her. She thought about going back to school, and it seemed impossible. Keep walking, she told herself, and she did. A sleek glass window threw back her reflection as she came up on it. She stopped. Maybe the haircut and the clothes had been as much of a gift as the money for the journey. Soothe had chosen to give her the opposite of what she was. Was that what she'd been telling her? That we are who we decide to be. She pulled the money out of her pocket and studied it. She shoved it back as two young guys walked past her, both of them checking her out for a moment before they continued on their way. She could see the bus station a few blocks ahead. She hurried along. The bus left in 30 minutes. Plenty of time to make it. Even more time when she was aboard to figure out what she'd do when she got back to LA. 56. Locke pulled up outside the apartment building. Ty made a final check of the address and the building on Google Maps. This is it, said Ty. Locke put the car back into drive and eased out. I'm going to park a little further down, in case someone's looking out the window. Roger that, said Ty. Locke pulled in and they sat there for a moment, both men watching the entrance to the apartment block and the car's mirrors. We both going in? asked Ty. No, I'll go in, said Locke. You stay out front in case anyone tries to make a run for it. You sure? Locke shifted his jacket to reveal his sig, neatly tucked into his shoulder holster. I'm sure. Okay, said Ty, sounding reluctant. But if I don't hear anything from you in five, I'm coming up. Locke opened the car door and started to get out. Ryan? He glanced back to his tie. Yep. What if she doesn't want to come with us? That could be a thing, right? Yeah, that could be a thing, said Locke. If a person didn't see themselves as a victim or in need of help, it was tough to rescue them, and that was the case with a lot of trafficked girls. They had been so broken down and traumatized that their pimp was seen as a protector, rather than someone who was exploiting them. Locke gave it a moment's more thought to the question. If she won't leave voluntarily, we call in local law enforcement. However you cut it, she's still a minor. They can take her in until her mom gets here. Ty appeared satisfied with that. He held out his arm fist clenched. Locke reached back in and they bumped fists. Let's just hope she's up there, said Locke. Not wanting to alert anyone who might be on the lookout, Locke skirted around the back of the apartment building by cutting down a service alleyway. He emerged at the rear of the property and began to look for a door. 
a set of steps led down to a basement door. It was a large heavy door and it was locked. He came back up the steps and skirted further down until he found a fire exit door. It was open. He went through it and followed the corridor down past what he assumed was the building superintendent's office, which was empty. He ducked his head quickly inside, scanning the office for a set of keys. There was a desk. He tried the drawers. They were locked. Another quick search revealed nothing that would help him gain entry in the event that no one answered the door. He kept moving, up some steps and emerged in the lobby. Quickly finding the stairwell, he climbed two flights before coming out into a corridor and following the signs for the apartment number that Andre had given them. Rapping hard on the door he stepped back, his hand on the butt of his sig, ready to draw down if he saw Hanger. A few moments later a voice came from inside. It was male and sounded old, definitely not the voice of anyone he was looking for. Locke's heart sank. Andre must have given them the wrong address. Locke would make him pay, but that wasn't going to help him find Kristen Miller. The door opened, an elderly man with a shock of powdery white hair peeked out from behind the door chain, an elderly woman on his shoulder. You're not the cops, said the man. It was a strange greeting. Locke went with it. You called 911? He asked the man, framing it as a question and careful not to say that he was law enforcement. Is that the police? His wife piped up from over his shoulder. The old man turned back to her. Let me handle this, will ya? He turned back to Locke. I called 911 like 40 minutes ago. It was obviously the wrong apartment and likely the wrong building, but if Kristen wasn't here, then Locke and Ty were back to square one. There was no harm in indulging the old guy for a few minutes. If and when the cops arrived, Ty was sure to see them. He would be able to give Locke the heads up so he could get out before they had the chance to ask him any awkward questions. What's the issue? asked Locke. What's the issue? the old guy said, apparently incredulous that Locke wasn't already aware. Locke assumed that he must have given the details when he made the call. Sir, if you could just give me a quick rundown, said Locke, giving his best impression of an impatient cop who just wanted to see what was up and get the hell out of here. That prompted a deep sigh and a jabbed finger in the direction of the apartment to Locke's left. They're back, that's the issue. Who's back? Another sigh of exasperation. The hookers. Or one of them anyway. Locke's focus suddenly sharpened. Hookers. Yeah, they haven't been here in a while, and I gotta tell you it's been great. You know, the peace and quiet. You probably have no idea what it's like to have people like that living just through the wall next to you. And you called someone because? Prompted Locke. I called you guys because one of their Johns was trying to kill one of them. At least that was what it sounded like. He turned back to his wife. Didn't it? The screaming, said his wife, putting her hands to her ears. Even with my hearing aids off, I could still hear her. It's gone quiet now, said the old guy. And it was this apartment here, said Locke. The old guy shot him another withering look. What did I just say? I'll go check it out. The old couple stayed where they were. They didn't move. The door was still open. If you could go inside, said Locke. I'll let you know if I need you. With some reluctance, the old guy closed his apartment door and Locke stepped down the corridor. He knocked a couple of times at the door. There was no response from inside. Had Andre given them the correct building and the wrong apartment number? Right now the question barely mattered. Locke needed to get inside the apartment, and fast. He couldn't wait for the cops to show. Not if the neighbor was correct, and something that sounded at best like a violent argument had just gone down. He knocked again. This time he pressed his ear to the door. He thought he could hear someone in the apartment, but whatever they were saying was muffled by the door. Hello, said Locke. The sound came again. As far as he could tell it wasn't words, more of a low moan. 
He stepped back, ready to take a run at the door and see if he could force it open. That was when he saw the blood oozing in a slow trickle from under the door. 57. The apartment door gave way at Locke's third kick. It didn't fly open. The frame splintered, but the door barely moved. Now he could hear whoever was on the other side. Help me, said a woman's voice. Putting his shoulder to the door with his legs braced at an angle, he slowly, inch by inch, eased it open until he could squeeze through the gap. The woman on the other side must have crawled to the door, tried to open it so she could crawl out, and then collapsed with her back to it. She was young and African-American, and was sitting up in a pool of bloody gore. Locke crouched down and she looked at him, eyes open but barely able to focus. The blood wasn't from her face, where he would have expected it to be. It was coming from below her waistline. With the amount of blood, it looked like some kind of hemorrhage, although he couldn't be sure. She wasn't so much sitting in a pool of her own blood, as swimming in it. He put his hand up to her neck, feeling for a pulse. It was faint, but it was there. Locke went into triage mode. Any thought of Kristen was pushed momentarily to one side. Listen to me, you're going to be okay. I'm going to get you an ambulance. Yanking out his cell phone, he called Ty. Ty, we need an ambulance up here right now. Once you've called for one, you can call me back and I'll bring you up to speed. He gave Ty the apartment number. Roger that, said Ty. Thankfully, there were no questions from Ty, only a response. It was one advantage of having a retired Marine for a partner. They could be trusted to do what was required. Locke turned his attention back to the young woman. She reached her hand out and he took it in his, moving his thumb inside her palm and giving it a soft squeeze of reassurance. He wasn't a doctor, but he'd seen enough traumatic injuries to know that if medical help different arrived quickly, he was going to lose her. Even if help did arrive, the outcome might be the same. He needed to know if Kristen had been here, but he knew he couldn't leave this woman, not for so much as a second. Whatever lay beyond the hallway would have to wait. Ambulance is on its way, okay? The most important thing he could do right now was keep her conscious and if possible, talking. A lot of times in a situation like this, survival came down to whether someone gave up and checked out, or whether they somehow mustered the will to stay in the present for a fraction longer. She was looking up at him. Stay with me, okay? She managed to move her head. What's your name? The words were a struggle. Soothe. Locke kept his face blank as she said it. What happened here? Her lips turned up in a bitter smile. I fell, she whispered. Locke smiled back. That's a pretty bad fall. Yeah, she said, as if they were both enjoying the same joke. I fell onto that. She stared down the hallway. He looked where she was looking. It took him a moment to figure out what the blood-coated object lying discarded in the hallway was. When he did, something cold ran right through his body, in a sickening snap of recognition that told him not only what had happened, but who had done this. He turned his attention away from the blood and gore slicked metal hanger, and back to Soothe. Her eyelids fluttered. He pressed his thumbnail into her open palm. Stay with me, okay? Just a little while longer. Her eyes opened again. That's good. I'm not going to leave you. You understand me? Yeah, she said, managing to squeeze out another wan smile. Sooth, where's Kristen? asked Locke. I know she's been with you. I don't care about any of that. I just need to find her and make sure she's safe. Her eyes scanned his face as if she was trying to work out some kind of puzzle. Please, said Locke. Her family needs to know she's okay. That's all. It's okay, she's safe, said Sooth, the words coming out slow and labored. Where is she? Is she in there? he asked, looking down the hall, trying and failing not to look at the bloodied tendril of wiry metal on the floor, bent out of shape and twisted into a hook. Sooth shook her head. Her eyelids closed. 
Block jabbed his thumbnail into her palm again, a little more insistently this time. I couldn't let it happen, she whispered. Just tell me where I can find her. She's going home. How? How is she going home? asked Locke. Her gaze began to drift. He could hear sirens down on the street below. Here eyelids fluttered again. Locke bent down so he was right next to her. How is she going home? he asked again. She made a low gurgling sound, and her body seemed to loosen another notch. Tell me where I can find her. Sooth's eyes opened again, but now they were completely without focus. She was looking off into the middle distance. I already told you hang her, she said. 58. Ty snatched up his phone as two EMTs hurried past the car on the way into the apartment building. Behind them two patrol cars pulled up. She's down at the Greyhound bus station, said Locke. Or she's already got on the bus for LA. I think Hanger knows about it too. You want me to wait for you? asked Ty. No time, said Locke. Call me when you get down there. I'm going to try to slip out of here. I'll meet you down there. Ty had already started the engine, one eye on the cops. Locke might get caught in having to kill valuable time answering questions, but he couldn't afford to do the same. Got it, said Ty, easing slowly out onto the street. At the end of the street, he tapped the details of the Greyhound terminal into his phone. He pulled out, picking up speed as two patrol cars raced towards him, heading in the opposite direction. Glancing down at the phone, he read the expected time of arrival. He would be there in 12 minutes. He figured he could get that number down to 9. Ty buried the gas pedal to the floor. The car lurched forward. 59. By the time Kristen had found her way to the Greyhound station across from the Fremont, the early afternoon bus headed for Los Angeles had just left. She'd missed it by a couple of minutes, and now was a three-hour wait until she caught the next one. The journey itself would take around six hours, with only a couple of stops. She bought a ticket at the window with the cash Sooth had given her, and went to stand at the gate. A security guard appeared and told her she couldn't wait there, and anyway it was a long time to stand. There was a seating area, but most of the people sitting down looked sketchy. In fact, the whole place reeked of urine and stale sweat, and she'd had enough of both those smells to last a lifetime. She walked back outside. There were more homeless people out here. There seemed to be homeless people everywhere in Vegas. It occurred to her that technically, she was probably one of them. Hungry and still with a few dollars left over, she walked a block to a Chick-fil-A and ordered a grilled chicken sandwich and a strawberry milkshake. She took a seat by the window. If she ate slowly, she figured she could kill at least an hour in here where it was clean and no one would bother her. She needed time to think. Not about what had happened over the past week or longer, but just to process what had happened today. Kristen wasn't sure she even wanted to go home. She didn't know how being home would even work, or if her mom would be happy to see her. Would she be welcome? And what about school? How would she be able to walk back into class and pretend like nothing was different? Like she wasn't different? The more she thought about it, the more overwhelming it all seemed. She had left home one person, and now she was another. But Sooth had been insistent that she had to go, that somehow Kristen was in danger if she stayed. That didn't make much sense to her, either. She was in danger every time she got into some strange guy's car. She was in danger every time a man walked into a motel room to have sex with her. Hanger wasn't there, and Sooth wasn't always close by either. A guy passed by her table as she chewed a mouthful of chicken. She knew straight away from the way he was dressed that he was a pimp. She could spot a pimp now. It wasn't how they dressed so much as how they carried themselves and how they looked at you. He came back around and she kept her eyes on the table, just like Hanger had taught her. She was still one of Hanger's hoes and a hoe didn't make eye contact with another pimp, not ever, not unless she was looking to change pimps. Hey baby, he said standing over her. You just get into town? She ignored him. 
Like that, huh? She kept looking down at the table until finally he took the hint and moved off. She watched him as he left the restaurant, rolling his shoulders with his wrists cocked, walking in a way that only pimps walked. Outside she watched a couple of girls, one of them not much older than her, do some low-key hustling for business. A month ago, she would have looked at them and had no idea that was what they were at. It was like she had stepped into a completely secret world that only the people in it could see, even though it was right there, hidden in plain sight. Maybe the only other people who could see it were cops, and she had been told to be more afraid of them than of the Johns. Cops were the enemy. They were the ones, according to Soothe, who took you off the street and put you in jail, which was even worse than being out here on the streets where you could make money and get high and live how you wanted to live. Kristen finished up her food. She got a refill. She could spin that out for another while, then she'd have to leave. She only had a few dollars left, and as she watched the girls outside, she wondered if maybe she could turn a trick before she got on the bus. That way she'd have some money for something else to eat when the bus stopped in Barstow. Just one last time she told herself as she left the restaurant, making sure to check the time on the clock behind the counter. She had two hours until she had to catch the bus. 60. Pushing through the doors into the Greyhound bus station, Hanger brushed off a homeless woman begging for food. Catching the look on his face, she quickly melted away. A quick scan of the waiting area didn't turn up any sign of Kristen. He walked over to the gate where the next bus to Los Angeles was due to leave. She wasn't there either. A security guard put his hand out. You have to take a seat in the waiting area until the bus boards. Sorry brother, I was just looking for my daughter. She forgot something. I wanted to catch her before she left, said Hanger. The guard looked like he didn't believe him. I think she's getting this next bus, but she might have caught the earlier one. Ah, said the guard. He gave off the impression of a man who wasn't all that interested. You hear when that bus boarded? Yeah, I was here. Hanger gave the guard a quick description of Kristen. Don't think she was on that one, but it was busy. That part didn't matter too much. Hanger knew that the bus stopped in Barstow, and he'd already arranged for someone to be there when it did. If they saw Kristen, they would pick her up for him and drive her back. I'll go take a look around, said Hanger. Thanks for your help. No problem. The guard watched him with suspicion as he moved away from the gate. Hanger was starting to regret speaking to him. In a situation like this, it was better to fly under the radar and not do anything that could make you memorable. He did a couple more laps around the inside of the building. He kept an eye on the door leading into the ladies' bathroom for ten more minutes. He figured that no one in their right mind would stay longer than that in a Greyhound terminal bathroom. Finally satisfied that Kristen wasn't here, he walked back outside to scope the area on foot. If he didn't see her, he'd circle back in time for boarding to start. If she was getting the bus like Sooth had told him, then he'd see her. With a little luck, she wouldn't make too much of a fuss and he could get her into his car without any more drama. He was still shaken by the turn today had taken. Sooth was the last person he'd expected to betray him. That's why he'd done what he had. He wanted to make sure that if he couldn't pimp her, then no one else would either. He'd been in the game long enough to know that every single girl had their limit. There were no exceptions that he'd ever seen. The only thing that troubled him was that usually he saw it coming. They'd show up late for work, they'd go missing, they'd start drinking a lot more or using more. Usually there were plenty of signs along the way. But with Sue this sudden pang of conscience seemed to have come almost out of the blue. No matter, he told himself. He had a couple of other girls who'd be happy to take over the role of bottom girl in his stable. Now what counted was finding Kristen and handing her over to his buyer. Once that was done, she wouldn't be his problem anymore. Hanger walked down Main Street, he ducked into a couple of the casinos. There were a couple of fast food places. He checked those too but there was no sign of Kristen. He kept moving through the shoals of tourists and gamblers. 
Then, when he was just about to head back to the Greyhound Terminal and waited out, he saw her. She was standing across the street from him. At first his eyes had moved straight past her. She changed her hair, but not how it was supposed to have been changed. He told Sue that she needed to be blonde, but her hair was red, and it had been cut short. That was one more mess he'd have to fix, but first he had to catch her. He waited at the crossing, his eyes never leaving her, as he sunk behind a group of tourists. She was waiting to cross in the other direction. She was heading straight for him. He smiled. This couldn't have been more perfect. 61. Ty pushed through the doors of the Greyhound station. The smell hit him like a wave of heat from a blast furnace. He didn't know how people could sit for hours in a place like this, never mind work here. He collared the first Greyhound employee he saw. They pointed the gate out to him. He walked over to it, keeping an eye out for Kristen as he moved. He didn't see her, or any other teenage girls for that matter. That was good. It meant that if she was in here, someone would have been more likely to notice her. Hey brother, I'm looking for a kid. Female. White. About 14. Yay hi, said Ty, holding a hand beneath the chest to approximate her height. I think she's getting the bus to LA. The security guard stared at him. Don't tell me, let me guess, you're her father? 62. By the time Kristen saw him, it was already too late. She put her head down, hoping he'd miss her, but the way he was moving directly towards her, looking straight at her, told her that wasn't going to happen. Pivoting on her heel, she turned around, walking in the other direction. The next thing she knew, his arm had linked through hers. He fell into step with her, not saying anything, not making a fuss as he guided her back to the corner. There were people all around them. She could scream. She thought about it. But she was too scared. No, scared wasn't the word. She was terrified. Back on the side of the street she'd just crossed, he pulled her to a halt. She didn't dare look at him. She didn't want to see the expression on his face. Part of her wanted to close her eyes and hope that when she opened them again, that the last minute would have been a terrible nightmare. She should have hurried down here, made that first bus. Now it was too late. My car's just down here, he said, sounding eerily calm. You start screaming or making a fuss, and I'll gut you like I just gutted Soothe. You understand me? His hand pinched her elbow, shaking it. I understand, she told him. He walked her to the end of the block, and then around a corner. The BMW was there. He made sure to stay with her all the way around the car. He opened the passenger door. She got in. Don't fucking move, he said, slamming the car door closed, walking around and getting in next to her. As the doors locked with a clunk, her heart sank. She'd had her chance to run, to yell, to do something, but she'd been so jolted by seeing him appear from nowhere that she had frozen like a rabbit in headlights. Now the chance was gone, and it was just the two of them, alone in his car. He didn't say anything. He didn't move. He didn't switch on the engine. Silence settled between them. He stared straight ahead. A minute passed. Then two. You want to see a picture of your friend? He said finally. Kristen didn't respond. He held his phone up, angling it so she could see the screen. She turned her head, looking away. Maybe it's for the best you don't look. Don't want you throwing up in here, he said, putting his phone away. Reaching over, he grabbed her hair and yanked her head back. We're gonna have to get you a wig. He hit the button. The engine turned over. He pulled out into traffic. Where are we going, she asked him. He ignored the question and kept driving. No one could see them through the heavy tint on the windows. For the first time, as she watched the streets busy with people, she felt truly like a prisoner. Where are you taking me, she repeated. Don't worry, he said. You'll like this next guy. Why? Why will I like him? He's a magician, said Hanger. He started laughing. 
It was a crazy laugh, the laugh of a maniac or someone who had completely lost their mind. He makes girls like you disappear. 63. His clothes soaked in blood, Locke watched as the ambulance pulled away from outside the apartment building. He prayed that the outcome for Sooth would be better than for Angie, but he doubted it would be. She had lost one hell of a lot of blood. Despite his best efforts, she had blacked out completely before the paramedics reached her. His phone pinged with a call from Ty. Give me something good, Ty, he said to his partner. She didn't make the bus, and I don't think she was on the earlier one either. Locke put the phone to his chest and looked up at the sky. It seemed like every time they got close to Kristen, she slipped through their fingers. Hanger was here looking for her too but I'm not sure he found her. The bus hasn't left just yet so I'll hang out here in case she shows or he turns back up. If he shows keep hold of him, said Locke. Oh no question, said Ty. It will be my absolute pleasure to lay hands on this guy. What do you think? If he doesn't have her and she didn't make the bus. She must be out there somewhere, said Ty. I'll let the cops know. They can check the CCTV where you are and see if they can spot her. Okay, said Ty. I'll call you when the bus leaves. If she doesn't show for it, then I'll swing by and pick you up. Okay, brother. With the phone call wrapped up, Locke walked back over to an unmarked Las Vegas PD car. Maybe Kristen would show at the last second, and Ty would be able to grab her. Maybe Hanger would show too, and Ty would be able to deal with him. And maybe Locke could win a million on the slots. Right now the odds of any of those happening seemed roughly equal. Standing next to the unmarked car was a detective from the LVMPD's vice unit by the name of Beth Adorno. She'd identified herself to Locke shortly after he'd explained what he was doing there, to the first uniforms on the scene. Adorno had told him that she worked with the CETF or Child Exploitation Task Force. The CETF was made up of detectives from the Metro PD's vice unit and agents from the FBI. The story he'd told the uniforms about his and Ty's hunt for Kristen Miller had prompted her to drive down to speak with him, something he was more than happy to do. She pushed off from where she was leaning against the back of her car. She was an athletic-looking woman in her early 40s and was dressed in sneakers, jeans and t-shirt from a local CrossFit gym. Her long brown hair was pulled back into a ponytail. What's your deal, Mr. Locke? she asked him. You're like a private investigator from L.A.? Close, but not exactly. He gave her a quick rundown of his involvement, carefully editing out any parts that a by-the-book member of law enforcement might not approve of. I'm just trying to find this kid and return her to her family. As soon as I've done that, I'll be out of your hair, he told her. Good to know, she said. This work is already hard enough without enthusiastic amateurs jumping into the mix. He ignored the jibe. He would have described himself as more focused than enthusiastic, but he would be happy to concede the amateur part. Trafficking was not his area of expertise, and he wasn't going to pretend that it was. What's the name of this pimp that brought her out here? asked Adorno. His street name's Hanger, said Locke. He spelled it out letter by letter. Hanger. Ring a bell? More than one, said Adorno. He's been on our radar for a while now, but we've never been able to get close. We've picked up some of his girls over the last few years, but they were way too scared to give us anything apart from a lot of attitude. It's tough to prosecute someone when the victims see us as the enemy. That could change if Sooth pulls through. Adorno chewed at the side of her lip. Maybe. You had any word on her condition? asked Locke. She was taken to UMC, but that's all I know. From what Patrol said, it's going to be 50-50 whether she makes it or not. She folded her arms. So how long have you been after Hanger? A week, give or take. And what do you know about him? He's highly mobile, just like you said. He's ruthless. He's happy to use violence. He has a place in Santa Monica, but I don't think anyone's going to find him there anytime soon. Not with all the heat he has on him. 
Hold up, you found out where he lives, she said. Yeah. Don't know if he rents or if he owns, but it's where he lives when he's in LA. Can you give me the address? asked Adorno. Of course. I have his name too. Adorno looked at him. You have his name? Yes, said Locke. I don't know if it's legit or an alias, but when my partner tracked him down, he found some of his mail. Can you wait there for a moment? Sure, said Locke. She stalked off and made a call on her cell phone, pacing back and forth as she talked. A few minutes later, she walked back over to him. I owe you one, she said. Like I said, it could be an alias, said Locke. Either way, said Adorno. And just so we're both clear, you came about his mail completely legally, right? Locke smiled. Of course. Listen, I'll put as much as I can behind finding Kristen. We can definitely take a look at the CCTV from the Greyhound station and check to see if she made any of those buses. If anything pops, I'll let you know. I appreciate that, detective. Do me one favor though, would you? He nodded his assent. Don't go getting crazy on me. I've been around long enough to know that half of what you told me about how you've been tracking this guy is complete horseshit. Frankly, I don't care too much about your methods. Just don't do anything while you're here that's going to get you arrested. We'll do our best to stay within the law, said Locke. Adorno smiled. That's nice and ambiguous. I don't like to lie, said Locke. Not flat out and not unless I absolutely have to. Adorno mulled that over for a second. She walked past him and got back into her car. He watched her drive away and called Ty. If Sooth made it and she was conscious, then she might still be their best shot at finding Kristen, assuming Hanger hadn't done that already. 64. A security camera mounted next to the gates observed Hanger's BMW as it rolled up. Before he could so much as lower his window, the gates slowly swung open. He drove through and up the long winding driveway. The main house was shielded from prying eyes by a ten-foot wall that ran around the entire perimeter of the ten-acre property. Trees and shrubs, none of them native to Nevada, provided an extra level of concealment. As instructed, Hanger drove to the back of a garage block. He looked across at Kristen. She was wearing a long blonde wig that was fooling no one. It was the best Hanger could do at short notice. He hoped that her haircut wasn't going to blow the deal entirely. He waited for someone to appear again, as instructed. A minute passed, and a door opened at the back of the garage block, and a man appeared, looking pale and skeletal in the late Nevada sunlight. He was in his late sixties with gray hair and piercing blue eyes. Even though once upon a time he'd been a famous Vegas entertainer, no one in Hanger's world called him by his name. He was known simply as the Freak because of his extreme outlandish and sadistic sexual appetites. He paid a lot of money but it was a one-time deal, so pimps tended only to offer him girls that had outlived their usefulness. Any girl or woman who survived their time with him was no good to work even the bleakest track and many were never seen again. Because of that, it was rare for any pimp to offer the freak a new girl, and certainly not one as young as Kristen. For that reason alone, Hanger was sure he could secure a premium price. The freak walked towards them as they both got out of the car. He greeted Hanger first, shaking his hand with papery thin skin. So good of you to come and visit with me, he said to Hanger. No problem. The freak turned his attention to Kristen. And what's your name, my dear? Hanger had to hard stare Kristen to get her to tell him. Well, Kristen, I'm enchanted to meet you, said the freak. Shall we go inside? Hanger ushered Kristen through the door and into the garage. There must have been a million dollars worth of automobiles inside, everything from a brand new Tesla to a fire red Ferrari. They followed the freak through a side door that led into the main house. It was a cavernous place that was full of posters and mementos from the freak's career. The walls were lined with pictures of him posing with the rich and famous, everyone from presidents to movie and music stars. 
Hanger saw Kristen's eyes widen as she took in some of the pictures. Can I get you something to drink? said the freak. I'll take a bourbon if you have some. And you, my dear? the freak asked Kristen. Maybe some water. Of course. Coming right up. He disappeared off through a door, leaving Hanger and Kristen together. She was looking around, fidgeting with her hands. I don't know what Sooth said to you about this guy, Hanger told her, although he knew exactly. But it was lies. He's just a lonely old guy. You'll spend a couple of days here, you'll make a ton of cash and then I'll pick you up. She said he likes to hurt girls. Hanger laughed. Him? Nah. You said he makes girls disappear. That was a joke, said Hanger. He pointed to one of the framed posters on the far wall. He was a stage magician. The last thing he needed right now was more trouble from Kristen. Once he'd been paid she could do what she wanted. He needed her quiet and compliant. The freak reappeared with their drinks. I would have thought you would have had staff, said Hanger, looking around. He hadn't seen so much as a gardener since they'd driven in, unusual for a place this size. Kristen sipped nervously at her glass of water. Oh no, said the freak. I always give the staff a day off when I have a special guest. That figured, thought Hanger. He knew that the freak had a basement and that it was soundproofed. He guessed Kristen would be hustled down there and safely out of sight before anyone else was allowed into the house. Hanger had met some real weirdos in his time, but the rich, famous ones were always the weirdest. He hadn't decided if it was the money or fame that did it, or whether it was their innate weirdness that drove them to acquire fame and money. Not that any of that mattered. He was about to make a big score. The freak walked behind Kristen and hovered there. She didn't move. He put his hand out to the wig. Would you mind taking that off for me, darling, he said. What? said Kristen. My dear, I spent long enough in what laughably passes for show business in this town to know a wig when I see them. Now be a darling and remove the wig. Hanger gave her the nod. Slowly she took it off to reveal her short red hair. The hairstyle had been Sooth's way of spoiling the deal, a big middle finger to Hanger. It looked like it was going to work too. Yeah, said Hanger trying to play it off. We had a little bit of a miscommunication. The freak pursed his lips. A little, he said, waving for Hanger to join him on the other side of the room. If you'd excuse us for a moment, my dear. Hanger followed him. He was starting to get pissed. He knew what was likely coming, a price reduction, and he didn't like it. Maybe he should call the deal off. Kristen could make him good money out on the track. She was low mileage. It was a lot more work and it carried more risk, but maybe he should go that route. I feel like there's been a little bait and switch here, my friend, said the freak. I was offered a blonde. I don't like redheads. Come on, said Hanger. She's a swan and she's young. How many girls like this you get offered? I could put her out on the track tomorrow and make a bundle. This is like the deal of the century, right there. The freak shot him a tight smile. Which brings me to my next question. If she's so valuable, and I don't doubt for a moment that she is, then why are you selling her to me? Hanger had anticipated the question. The freak had been around long enough that it was bound to have occurred to him. You didn't hand off a girl like this in a one-time deal unless there was an issue. Thankfully, Hanger had prepared his answer. I'm getting out of the game. I'm liquidating my assets, he said. This seemed to amuse the freak. Really? And what business do you plan on moving into next? He held up a finger. Let me guess, rap music. No, no, wait, software sales. He was making fun of Hanger, and Hanger didn't like it. Maybe he should just take the freak down into the basement, instead of the freak taking Kristen. After all, there was no one here to stop him, and the freak would be no match for Hanger. The freak picked up on his annoyance. I apologize, that was uncalled for on my part. Why don't we do this? 
I'll help you with your liquidation, but I won't be paying full retail, not for an item that doesn't match the original description. Hanger's anger fell away. He'd learned in the pimping game that it was better not to get too emotional. That was how deals went south and money was lost. Let's say half of what we talked about, said the freak. Hanger turned away. Forget it. Then what will you accept? I'll drop it 20. Percent. 25. Done, said Hanger, watching as Kristen stood with her back to them, studying a framed poster from one of the freak's old casino shows. 65. Locke walked out the front entrance of the University Medical Center, the main public hospital for Las Vegas and Southern Nevada. What's the news? Ty asked. She's critical, but unless she picks up some kind of infection, I'd wager that she's going to make it. They let you speak to her? No. Maybe later in the week. That lot of good that does us, said Ty. A call from Adorno at LVMPD had brought more bad news. Kristen had shown up on CCTV from outside one of the casinos near to the Greyhound bus station. She'd been spotted with a man who matched Hanger's description. The cameras had lost them shortly afterwards. Something has to fall for us eventually, said Locke. You think, said Ty. Law of averages, said Locke. It's what this city was built on. Hangers on a winning streak but it can't last forever. What's the next move? Leave it to the cops? They have her description, and they have a hell of a lot more eyeballs out here than we do. Locke stared at his partner. They also have a lot more than one kid to be on the lookout for. They must have hundreds, probably thousands of trafficked kids and teenagers on their at-risk list, and more coming in every day. This is on us, Ty, and it's going to stay on us until we find her. Ty scuffed the sole of his shoe on the sidewalk. He looked up. And if she doesn't? We're not out of options just yet. How you make that out, Ryan? We still have Andre. If he'll play along, said Ty. Oh, he will, said Locke with a rare certainty to his tone. How you figure? Trust me. They hunkered down in a coffee shop to make the call, the number withheld to increase the chances that Andre would pick up. That was all Locke needed, the opportunity to lay out his case to Andre for just long enough to understand that he was out of other options. Across from Locke, Ty was wolfing down a mammoth cheeseburger with fries. He stopped mid-mouthful as Locke held up a finger, indicating that Andre had just picked up. Don't hang up on me, Andre, said Locke. If you do, then the next time we talk it will be face to face and believe me, you don't want that. What do you want now? I gave you what you wanted. He sounded defensive. That was understandable. No, said Locke. You gave me the wrong apartment number. Did I? Yes, said Locke. You did. I must have written it down wrong or something. Or you figured I'd knock at the wrong door, and by the time I found the right door that your buddy would have a heads up, and would be waiting for me on the other side, all ready to solve your problem with a point four five. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you don't, said Locke. What do you want? I told you already. I want Hanger. Hey, I gave him to you. It's not my problem if you missed him. So far, the conversation was going exactly as Locke anticipated it would. Andre was evasive and unhelpful. But all that was about to change. You've forgotten that we still have the footage linking you to felony arson. Hey, I held up my end of the deal, okay? Andre sounded a little shrill. Locke continued on. Only it's no longer just arson, is it? There was a pause on Andre's end. Like you don't know, said Locke. You've been following the news. I know for a fact you have. Which means that you know the lady that ran the place died, and that means your future prospects just got even shittier than they already were. I don't think this is even legal. 
you're blackmailing me. Maybe an attorney could get whatever you have thrown out. Then what do you have on me? Locke had to give it to him. He was a lot smarter than he appeared. A good defense attorney would absolutely challenge the video they had. Without it, the case against Andre would be a lot harder to prove. A judge going to stop me driving back to LA and putting a bullet in you. That's not legal either, Andre said. You can't go around threatening to kill people. Sure you can, said Locke. Maybe you shouldn't and maybe you'll get in trouble, but you can. I just did. What do you want? I told you. I want Hanger. I don't know where he is. Then find out. You have three hours. I'll text you the number to message with the information. If you get it wrong again, or if you try to set us up, then I'm going to find you, and no amount of lawyers will save you from me. Locke killed the call. 66. Kristen didn't know why Sooth had been so worried. Up until now, the old guy hadn't so much as touched her or asked her to do anything, never mind anything else. Okay, he was definitely creepy, but by now she was used to creepy. And if he did want to have sex with her, she'd do what she'd learned to do and just pretend she was somewhere else. Hanger had been mad when he left. Something to do with how her hair had been cut had meant he'd gotten less money, and that had put him in such a bad mood that she'd been happy to stay behind. After Hanger left, the old guy had given her a tour of the place. It was huge, like something from MTV Cribs. He took a lot of time to point out all the photographs where he was with famous people. She just went along with it. She had no idea who most of them were. When he'd finished showing her around, he'd told her to help herself to anything in this huge refrigerator. She'd made herself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and ate it with a big glass of cold milk. At that point he disappeared. As she was cleaning up she caught herself looking at this wooden knife block. She'd remembered how Sooth always carried a knife, just in case things got crazy. If she took one from the block, he was sure to notice. She opened some drawers and found a small chopping knife, but just before she could take it out and hide it, he came back. I'm afraid I have company soon, Kristen, he said. I can't have them seeing you, so if it would be okay with you, I'd prefer if you were out of sight. Sure, she said. She'd been so hungry and so caught up in everything that she hadn't so much as thought about getting out of this place. Now she kind of regretted that, although she had no idea where they even were, never mind how she would get out without anyone seeing her. In that case, follow me. They went down a stone staircase that led to the basement, only this basement was like a whole other house. There was a wine cellar and next to it was like this huge home movie theater, except rather than seats it had three huge beds. You could lie in bed and watch a movie. Her eyes widened as she took it all in. She'd never seen anything like it before. You just make yourself comfortable, he said, walking out again. She sat down on the edge of the middle bed. She should have asked him how the home theater worked. By the time she got to the door to shout after him, she found it was locked. Never mind, she thought to herself, she could lie down on the bed and take a nap. The sandwich and the milk had made her sleepy. As she lay down on her side, she started to feel a little woozy. She was awake, but her head was swimming and she felt out of it. Then the lights went out, and the room was plunged into complete darkness. It was dark that when she lifted her hand up in front of her face, she couldn't see it. It stayed like that for a few minutes. Pitch black darkness. She tried to get comfy. What did it matter that the lights were off? She was going to take a nap. Still lightheaded, she closed her eyes. Slowly, she began to drift off. Next thing she knew, the room filled with the sound of a woman screaming. The scream seemed to come from all directions. Kristen opened her eyes. It was still dark, then suddenly the screen lit up and a movie started to play. There was a young girl. She was around the same age as Kristen, and she had long blonde hair. She was tied down on a bed. It was the same bed as the one Kristen was lying on right now, but the girl on screen had her wrists and ankles tied to the frame and she was naked. 
She was screaming, stopping only to take a breath so that she could scream again. Her whole body shook. She wrenched at her restraints but she couldn't seem to free herself. Kristen started to sit up as the scream from the speakers got louder and louder. On screen a man appeared. He was old and wrinkled and naked apart from a mask. Even without seeing the man's face, she knew who he was. It was the man who lived here, the man whose basement she was in. 67. Locke tapped the tablet with his fingers, willing his phone to light up with a call from Andre. Ty was finishing a second serving of apple pie and ice cream as Locke stared into his cup of coffee. He's still got an hour, said Ty. Let's go check the apartment, see if he's back there, said Locke, getting up from the table. Ty scooped up the last piece of pie, then hurried to catch up with Locke as he headed to the cash register to pay. They got into the car and drove the short distance to the apartment building. The cops were gone. Locke buzzed the original apartment number they'd been given by Andre. He explained to the old guy who answered that he was the person he'd spoken with earlier. After complaining that he was watching TV, the old guy buzzed them in. The elderly neighbor was waiting for them out in the hallway by the time they stepped out of the elevator. Crime scene tape was splayed across the door of the apartment where Locke had found Soothe. Would you look at this mess, said the old guy. Who's going to clean it up? Building maintenance should take care of it once they get the okay from Metro, said Locke. Those bums, said the old guy with a dismissive wave. They never fix anything in this place. They take their money though, they're real good at that. Ty was busy scoping out the inside of the apartment as Locke spoke with the neighbor. Has anyone been inside? Apart from the cops, said Locke. Nah, ain't seen the guy if that's what you're asking. If you see him, call me. Okay? The old guy's hand came up from inside the doorframe. He was holding a .38 revolver. I'll do better than that. Listen to me, this is a very dangerous individual, said Locke. Call me, call the cops, but keep away from him. Ty stepped back out into the corridor. It's clear. Remember what I said, Locke told the old guy as they walked back down the corridor. Sure, sure, said the old guy dismissively as his wife appeared, admonishing him for having the gun out. As they got back to the car, the call came from Andre. Locke answered it. What you got? Don't get pissed, okay, said Andre. He's not answering his phone. I tried all the numbers I have for him, left messages, but nothing so far. Then keep trying. Time's ticking away. What do you think I'm doing? Listen, I know there are a few places he likes to drop by when he's in Vegas, a couple of places where he likes to play poker. Okay, said Locke, figuring that this information was better than nothing. Locke put Andre on speaker. As he ran down the list of places, Ty tapped them into his phone. Two were casinos, smaller places off the strip. The third was a private room in the back of a bar near the Tropicana. Be careful going in there, said Andre. It's all guys like Hanger, and they don't always play for money. What does that mean, asked Locke. Sometimes they wager one of their hoes. Of course they do, thought Locke. If there was a level of depravity that human beings weren't capable of sinking to, he hadn't yet found it. So if you find him we're good, right? said Andre. Don't get ahead of yourself. Just keep making the calls, said Locke, hanging up. How do you want to do this? asked Ty. Split the casinos between us and meet at the last place? That works. You drop me at the first place. If none of them pan out, then we make a sweep of the main tracks, see if we can spot Kristen on the street. You think he's telling us the truth? Ty asked. Locke shrugged. There's no way to know but it's not like we have anything else to work with. I can call Jenny and ask her to do another trawl of local online ads see if anything pops but what else have we got? True, said Ty pensive. What is it? Something's bothering you. Come on Ryan, back room of a bar with a high stakes poker game. That's as good a place to get shot as anywhere I can think of.
68. The Lizard Lounge stood on Industrial Road. It was a 24-7 dive bar with a claim to fame that it had only closed once in the past 25 years, and only then to allow for the cleanup of a triple homicide that had taken place in the main bar area. There had been a couple of other murders since then, but as they had taken place in one of the bar's back rooms, the management had not deemed it necessary to stop serving drinks while those were cleaned up. Alongside the homicides, there had been numerous shootings, stabbings, and beatings. No one knew why it still retained its liquor license, but the suspicion was that the cops preferred having most of the city's worst degenerates concentrated in the one place. Locke and Ty stood across the street from the bar and weighed up their approach. It wasn't exactly the kind of place you could go in and wave around a photograph with a breezy, hey, have any of you fellas seen this guy? Not unless you were prepared to pay for some dental work. A trawl of the two casinos that Andre had suggested had turned up no sign of either Hanger or Kristen. That only left the Lizard Lounge. I'll go in and take a look, volunteered Ty. That made sense to Locke. For better or worse, Ty would blend in better than he would. If you see him, message me, and we'll figure out how we get him out of there. Roger that, said Ty. Locke watched as Ty walked across the street. As he stepped off the sidewalk, Locke observed his partner's gait shift from a shoulders back head straight stance to more of a gauche roll. Locke figured he was getting into character. Ty walked past the two hulking bikers posted at the door and disappeared inside. Locke walked back to the car and got inside, ready to swing over and collect Ty if he needed to make a fast exit. Inside the place was suitably dark. Ty took a seat and ordered a scotch with a water bag. As the bartender fixed his drink, he scoped the place out in the mirror that ran the length of the bar. There was no sign of hanger. The bartender placed his scotch and water on the bar. Ty feigned taking a sip of the whiskey and followed it up with a real sip of the water. There were two ways he could do this, the right way and the wrong way. He could ask if they had a poker game going on in back. As no one had ever seen him here before, that would be the wrong way. Instead he waited a few minutes, grimaced as he slid off his stool and asked the bartender to point him in the direction of the men's room. In a place like this, it was better to be a guy with a thirst and a middle-aged prostate than a guy who came in asking questions. Moseying down the corridor to the bathroom, he kept walking as he got to it. He kept moving, down past the women's restroom. A sign on it read bitches, presumably to match the sign on the men's room that read players. He opened the next door. It was a closet full of cleaning supplies and dry goods. He closed it again as someone came out of the men's room. They didn't give him so much as a second glance. Turning a corner there were two doors, one to the left and one to the right. He could hear voices behind the door on the right. Suddenly he started to doubt his plan of not asking the bartender. Walking through a closed door into an illegal card game wasn't the smartest thing to do, especially when no one inside knew who the hell you were. Then again, there was no other way of telling if Hanger was inside. Or was there? Ty walked up to the door and knocked. Yo, is Hanger in there, he said, loud enough that those inside would be able to hear. He stepped off to the side and waited. The chat inside fell away a little. There was the sound of a chair being pushed back. The door opened a few inches, and a short, overweight black guy peered out. He stared at Ty with yellow liver failure eyes. Some dude's out front looking for Hanger, he said. The guy wasn't buying it. Ty could tell that much from the man's expression. He looked over the top of the man's head, trying to get a view of who was inside. Get the fuck out of here, the short guy said, closing the door, but not before Ty picked out a white guy with cornrows sitting at the card table with his back to the door. Outside, Locke watched Ty come out of the bar and stroll nonchalantly across the street. He walked down to their car and got in. He's in a back room playing cards, just like Andre said he might be. You sure? asked Locke. Only saw him from the back but yeah, I think it's him. I couldn't exactly ask everyone to stand up and turn around so I could get a look at them. How many in the room? Seven or eight, said Ty. I'd say they're all packing too. Locke took a moment. Any sign of the girl? 
None. Locke cursed under his breath. It would be easier to go grab a 90-pound teenager than haul a full-grown man out of there, even with firearms. They could call the cops. He had Adorno's details, and he was sure she'd be delighted to arrest Hanger. But there was one problem with that. The first thing Hanger would do would be to lawyer up. As soon as he figured that he had something that they wanted, he could use Kristen as collateral. Locke had no intention of handing Hanger any kind of power. Not when they still had no idea where Kristen was. What if we would use some kind of distraction, said Ty. Like what? I don't know, fire alarm, something that will get him out on the street. You think those guys are going to leave their game for a fire alarm, said Locke. Point taken, said Ty. Ty had something though. It would be one hell of a lot easier to grab hold of Hanger if he was outside. A fire alarm might not do it, but he knew something that would. He grabbed his cell phone and found the number for Adorno's unit. It's Locke, he said when she answered. I found our boy. I thought you and your colleagues might like to swing by and pick him up. Oh yeah, where he is, she asked. He told her. You might want to bring some numbers, he added. Don't worry, every cop in Vegas knows what to expect going in there. How fast can you make it here, asked Locke. We're not sure how long he's going to be here for. Give me a half hour. If you see him leave before then, let me know. You got it, said Locke. We're giving him to the cops, asked Ty when Locke had finished the call. No, he's going to give himself to us, said Locke. Twenty-five minutes later, they watched as Adorno's car rolled down Industrial Avenue. Tucked in behind her was a mini convoy of LVMPD vehicles, including three patrol cars and a SWAT unit. Hanger hadn't left the bar. He was no doubt still hunkered in the back room with no idea his life was about to change. Ty was already posted at the back of the Lizard Lounge. Locke pulled out, drove to the end of the block, turned and parked next to the alleyway. He could see Ty standing halfway down the alley, tucked in against the wall, waiting for the rats to start leaving the sinking ship. Locke texted Ty the signal. He watched as Ty walked up to the service entrance at the back of the building, hammered his fist against it, and began shouting. There was the first whoop of sirens from out front. The door opened, and a motley crowd of people started spilling out, as a patrol car tore down from the other end of the alleyway. Hanger was one of the first out. Wild-eyed, he saw the patrol heading straight for him as the scene descended into chaos. He started running in the opposite direction, heading straight for Locke. Ty ran behind him, almost on his heels, staying just a few yards behind him. As they got closer to Locke's car, Locke scooted down in his seat so that Hanger wouldn't see him as he ran up to the car. A second later, the car's rear passenger door was flung open. Locke could hear Ty's voice. Get in dude quick. Hanger half jumped and was half pushed by Ty into the back seat. Ty closed the door. Locke hit the central locking, sat up in his seat and pulled away. In the back seat, Hanger looked around. He grabbed for the opposite door. Ty grabbed both his wrists, slipping the loop of a plasticuff over one then another and cinching them tight as the car picked up speed. They hit the end of the block, and Locke accelerated. He checked his mirrors, half expecting to see a patrol car tucked in behind him. His cell phone rang. He tapped the answer icon. It was Adorno. She sounded out of breath. Did you see him? I thought you said he hadn't left. Where are you? Her words spilled out in a rush, all the reassurance that Locke needed that they hadn't been spotted. Hanger started to speak. Ty clamped a hand across his mouth. That's the cops dude, said Ty, nodding to Locke's cell. We didn't see him leave. We pulled out when we saw you arrive, said Locke. Are you positive he's not there? There was the sound of commotion in the background. Adorno was speaking to someone else. Well go check again. A patrol car sped towards them. Ty shoved Hanger's head down and ducked down himself. It kept going. Adorno started to speak again. What? said Locke. 
I can't hear you. You're breaking up. He hung up on her. Ty had his hand clamped around the back of Hanger's neck, pushing his face into the seat so hard that he was having trouble breathing. Finally Ty let him up. Hanger looked at Locke. There was fear in his eyes. Who the hell are you? said Hanger. Locke stared at him in the rear view as the sound of the sirens began to fall away. Hey Carl, you ever hear the expression jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire? Well, we're the fire. But don't you worry, we'll throw you back into the frying pan just as soon as you take us to Kristen Miller. 69. Kristen woke to darkness. A cold breeze from an air conditioning vent somewhere above told her she was naked, although she had no memory of getting undressed or being undressed. Her mouth was paper dry, so dry that she almost had to peel her tongue from the roof. Slowly, the images she had watched on the screen drifted back into her mind. The girl's face twisted with pain. The knives and clamps and other instruments. The old man naked and covered in blood as he stood over her. Kristen shivered again, but this time the cold air had nothing to do with it. She went to sit up but couldn't and remembered the restraints. She craned her neck, lifting her head to look down. Her legs had been shackled, each one secured to the corner of the bed so that she was completely exposed. The door opened. She could hear someone come in, but she couldn't see them. She stayed quiet and waited. There was the sound of someone breathing heavily, wheezing almost. A metal trolley rolled across the bottom of the bed and came to a stop, a pair of hands pushing it. She lifted her head and tried to get a better look. As she saw all the shiny metal items laid out on it, she wished she hadn't. She closed her eyes, hoping that when she opened them again, she would be back home, or even in the apartment in L.A. with Sooth, anywhere but here. She startled as she felt a hand, cold and clammy on her forehead. It was him. It's better if you keep your eyes open, my dear. If you don't, then I'll be forced to use lid locks to keep them open, and they can be extremely uncomfortable. They scratch the cornea, you see. Why are you doing this? she blurted out. He didn't answer, not straight away. His hand stroked the top of her head. Why do any of us do anything, he said. Because we enjoy it. Are you going to kill me? Am I going to kill you? He repeated in a whisper that sent a fresh shiver down her body. No, not just yet. First, we're going to have some fun together. I'm going to take you places, places most people never get to go. 70. Locke's car bumped along the dusty desert track, less than an hour outside Las Vegas. When he was content that no one would be able to see them from the freeway, he pulled over. He and Ty got out. Ty walked around to the driver's side. He opened the door, grabbed Hanger by the back of the neck and pulled him out. With his hands cuffed and unable to break his fall, he landed face down in the dirt. Hanger twisted his head and looked up at them. He spat on the ground, narrowly missing Ty's right boot. Ty drew a foot back and soccer kicked Hanger just below the ribs. As Hanger started to ball up, bringing his knees to his chest, Ty reached down and pulled him up onto his feet. He gave him a hard shove in the back, propelling him forward. The three men came to a gap in the barbed wire fence that ran along one side of the track. Ty shoved Hanger through it. He grumbled and held his side where Ty's toe cap had landed. Fifty yards ahead was a bank that led down to a dried-out riverbed. Ty kept him moving towards it. When they reached it, Locke called a halt. This'll do. Hanger turned around so he was facing them. Locke and Ty stared at him. So what? You're gonna shoot me. That your plan? They didn't say anything. It was better to let him do the talking and see where he went than try to force information from him. They could do that later if they needed to. All three of them knew that killing Hanger and leaving him here was a dead end. It wouldn't help them locate Kristen, but right this second, that was beside the point. Look, I don't have her, said Hanger. Locke maintained his silence. Ty drew his weapon. Turn around, said Ty. 
Now man, said Hanger, you want to shoot me, you can look at me while you do it. Ty glanced to Locke. Locke brought his hands up to cover his ears and took a few steps back. Fine by me, said Ty, stepping in close to Hanger just beyond arm's length, raising his gun, taking careful aim and pulling the trigger. 71. Hanger screamed in pain as the bullet ripped through his sneaker and into his foot. Still screaming with real tears leaking from his eyes, he hopped up and down on his working foot for a few seconds before sitting down hard. Man, said Ty. He's making more noise than Lady Gaga's dog walker. You motherfucker, shrieked Hanger. I told you I don't have her. Locke stepped in closer so that he was looming over Hanger. We can see that, he said. So where is she? Like I'm going to tell you so you can finish me and leave me out here for the coyotes, Hanger said, rocking back and forth. Ty raised his gun again. You're not answering the question. Hanger rocked back and forth, doing his best to reach down to grab his foot. Why should I? Look, we can kill you out here, head back into town and we'll find her eventually, said Locke. That's a good point, said Ty. We don't really need this guy, do we? Hanger began laughing. You're not gonna find her. Something about the way he said it made Locke think that this wasn't a bluff. Oh yeah, and why is that? Because I sold her, and I'm the only person who knows who I sold her to. Without me you got no chance. Locke was about to correct him, but stopped himself. Sooth would likely know. Maybe Hanger was assuming that she was dead. Not that it mattered. So who'd you sell her to, said Locke. Hanger clasped his bleeding foot and shook his head slowly from side to side. Oh no. I ain't telling you. Then what's the point in us keeping you alive, asked Ty. You have to get me something for my foot. Something to take the edge off, said Hanger. We can do that, said Locke. A bullet in the head will certainly take your mind off your foot. Or we could shoot him in the gut and leave him out here, suggested Ty. That's another option. Locke stepped away and waved Ty over to him. They spoke in whispers, but loud enough that Hanger would pick up what was being said. He's full of shit, said Ty. She's out on the track. Metro will pick her up. Maybe not soon, but in the next week for sure. I think you're right. But let's not leave him out here. Let's find somewhere quieter where we can bury him. Okay man, you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? I'm easy either way. Why don't we flip for it, said Locke. Winner gets to do the deed. Ty dug a quarter out of his pocket, ready to flip. What you want? Heads, said Locke. Ty flipped the coin, caught it, and slapped his hand over it, making a show of the whole thing. If Hanger hadn't heard them, he would get the general idea. I'll take you to her, shouted Hanger. I know where she is. Ty ignored him. He lifted his hand. Tails. Lucky me. I'll take you right to the door, pleaded Hanger. 72. Now that they'd done the deal, Locke wanted Hanger to loosen up, to start to believe that he was safe. Or at the minimum, safe for now. If he didn't, if he thought that he and Ty would kill him as soon as he'd given them the information about Kristen's location, then there was more chance that he would change his mind. Locke had cleaned and bandaged Hanger's foot from the medical kit he and Ty always carried in their vehicles. He'd found a morphine lollipop in there and let Hanger suck on it just long enough to take the edge off his pain but not enough that he was completely out of it. It was another calculated solution. Drugs loosened the tongue, morphine not as well as cocaine or amphetamine, but those were drugs that weren't to be found in Locke's medical kit. Once they'd got Hanger back in the car, they set off back down the rough desert track. From there, they picked up the narrow service road that led back to the freeway. In less than an hour they were on the road back to Vegas, and Hanger had started talking. Where'd that lollipop go, was the first thing he said. You can have some more in a while, said Locke, studying him in the rearview mirror. We don't want you nodding off on us. 
Hanger sucked in some air. Still hurts like hell. Usually does when you get shot, observed Tai. So how did you guys know where I was? Should we tell him? Locke said to Tai, who was sitting next to Hanger in the back seat. I'd want to know if I was him. Your boy Andre, said Locke. Get the fuck out of here, said Hanger. He gave us your apartment too, said Tai. Hanger cursed. Think he might be looking to take over business when you're gone, said Locke. That prompted a fresh round of cursing from Hanger, in a long diatribe about snitches being the lowest of the low. Locke let him run his mouth. None of this would be happening if it wasn't for that little punk, said Hanger. He was the one that brought her to me. Told me she was 18 too. Locke didn't believe the second part for a single second. Going by his expression, neither did Ty. You call the cops, said Hanger. Sure did, said Locke. So why call them if you weren't going to let them arrest me? You're a smart guy, said Locke. Why do you think? Flush me out without having to walk in there yourselves and risk getting capped, offered Hanger. Ding ding ding. We have a winner, said Ty. How do you end up doing this, Carl? Locke asked. Like I said, you're smart, there are a lot of ways to make money, especially if you're prepared to break the law. Grew up around the life. My mama was on the street, my papa was her pimp. She was his bottom girl. Then they got married. When he got killed, she took over. Then she died, and it was just me. Guess it was that, and it's a lot easier to stay out of jail doing this than if you're selling drugs or robbing banks. The morphine must have really been kicking in. Locke hadn't expected Hanger to be quite this forthcoming. He didn't know if he was aiming to gain their sympathy, but if that was his intention, it wasn't going to work. Locke had never considered a shitty childhood as some kind of magical free pass to heap misery on other people. I saw the same shit growing up only it didn't make me want to be an asshole, said Ty, echoing Locke's attitude. Yeah well different strokes, said Hanger. I know you ain't cops. How come you're so desperate to get this girl back? What's the deal? She family or something? Something, said Locke. Okay, don't tell me. What about this guy that has her, asked Locke. We likely to run into any static when we roll up on him? The freak, said Hanger. Nah, he's just some weird old dude. Used to be a stage magician. You shove a gun in his face like you did to me, and he'll piss his pants. That sounded fine to Locke. They'd already pushed way beyond their limits with law enforcement. They were firmly in vigilante territory, and the law tended to frown on that, no matter how good a person's intentions. You're going to let me go when we get there though, right? Hanger asked. You can go when we have her, said Locke. Not a second before. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that, said Hanger. Well, that's kind of too bad, said Ty. 73. Even with the searing pain from his foot, Hanger knew the game they were playing. Hit him with a stick, or in this case shoot him with a bullet, and then be nice to him. He knew the game because it was the same game that he played with every girl he'd ever turned out onto the track. Keep them guessing. Mix up the brutality and the softness. Be their best friend and their worst nightmare. He would believed he was going to die back there. He'd been ready for it, or as ready as someone could be. Getting shot like that in the foot hurt like a son of a bitch, but it was better than getting shot most other places. It also told him that they needed him alive, for now anyway, and that was good information to have. These guys were smart but they weren't as smart as they liked to believe. That could prove fatal for them. They'd eaten up his bullshit story about growing up in the life like it was candy. The truth was his upbringing had been pretty regular, privileged even. He just liked pimping. The money was good, better than good. You set your own hours. And the one part he hadn't lied about, it was easier to avoid prison than a lot of other shady stuff. The only time that a girl was ever likely to take the stand, was if she'd be encouraged by some do-gooder. 
that was part of the reason why he'd gotten Andre to torch that shelter. As for these two white knights, if he had his way then they'd be going the same way as the woman who ran that shelter. The reality was the freak may have been old and decrepit, but he was a dangerous man. Like most people with money out here and things to protect, he was armed. He wasn't a dude who walked around with a gun, but his house was stoked with a pretty formidable arsenal. The freak could shoot too. That had been part of his act when he was still drawing in the big crowds. And his house had its share of surprises. You didn't do the kind of weird stuff that he did behind closed doors without making sure your security was on point. If burglary had been his game, there were a few mansions that Hanger might have considered breaking into in Las Vegas. The Freaks wasn't one of them. These two Boy Scouts were about to find that out for themselves. He leaned forward a little as they came up on the last turn. Make a left here, he said. His place is right at the end of the road. The one with the gates and the big ass wall around it. 74. She had fallen asleep again. In his experience, hours of terror would do that. After a while the body became completely exhausted and simply shut down. He would let her rest. He needed to rest himself. In a few hours he would find a new and terrifying way to wake her, and they would begin again. His watch pulsed. He looked down to see a red dot flashing on the display. It was likely a false alarm but it always paid to check. Hurrying out of the room, he grabbed a bathrobe and quickly put it on. He peeled off the mask and climbed the stairs where he could hear the alarm. Walking into the small cupboard he'd converted into a security monitoring room, he switched on the main display. A sensor had been triggered, probably by a coyote or a jackrabbit. He didn't have any visitors scheduled, and the staff were still on a paid break. He tapped the screen of the main display and looked at the various camera feeds outside the property. At first he couldn't see anything out of place. Then he saw it, a car rolling slowly up to the gates. Checking to make sure the gates were closed, he switched back to the feed where the car had been. It was still moving towards the front gate. There was a man driving and what looked like two other men in the back. The car stopped short of the gate and the driver got out. He skirted around the gate and started to walk around the wall, looking up, scoping it out, like he was casing the place before he tried to rob it. Only something told him that this man wasn't here to commit robbery. The freak had a bad feeling about this. A very bad feeling. He walked out of the cupboard and headed for the gun safe. 75. The wall had to be 12 feet high and it was smooth, tough to scale. Locke took a step back to get a better view. Even just getting to the house was not going to be easy. They could always hand this over to the cops, but the cops would need a warrant to go inside, and that would take time. It also meant that Locke would have to explain to them why he believed Kristen Miller was inside, and that was an awkward conversation. Judges tended not to look too kindly on evidence acquired after you shot someone. Nor did cops for that matter. It wasn't the kind of thing that stood up in court. As he took another step back, his phone rang. He saw the name and thought about letting it go to voicemail. He decided it was better to answer it. Brian Locke This is Beth Adorno from the Vice Unit. You remember me, don't you? Of course. How are you, detective? Well right now I'm super pissed is how I am and I'd like you to bring Carl Gowdy to me. Sorry, I'm a little confused, I thought you already had him in custody. Well, I sure would have if you hadn't put him in the back of your car when we raided that place. How the hell did she know about that? Locke asked himself. Not that it mattered. Now you've really lost me. Don't try to be cute. One of our patrols caught you on dash cam. It took us a while to work out it was you, but we did. Now unless you want to spend the next five years in Ely prison, I strongly suggest you hand him over. I really don't like being used, Mr. Locke. Locke knew he didn't have time to think this over. He needed to make a decision, and fast. He could either come clean, tell her where he was and why, and ask for her help. But that way, they ran into the whole search warrant problem. 
The alternative was to play dumb, stall, get inside this place and get Kristen, assuming she was even alive, which wasn't a given. Detective Adorno, I want the same thing that you do to find Kristen Miller. I think her life's in grave danger, and I can move a lot faster than you can to make sure she goes home in one piece. So you do have him, said Adorno. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. Now you can either tell me what's going on right now, or I can have every cop in Vegas looking for you, and that doesn't help any of us find this kid. Locke took a moment. Hello? Are you still there? I think I've found her, said Locke. Excuse me? You heard me. I can't be certain, but I think I know where she is. Adorno's tone changed, and the way it changed told Locke that she took this as seriously as he did. Where is she? Adorno asked him. I can be right there. Give me a half hour, said Locke. If I'm wrong and I haven't found her, then I'll come in and hand myself over, and you can do what you want with me. No, that doesn't work. Where is she? I'm sorry, said Locke, hanging up on her and walking back to the car as Ty opened the door. Who was that? Locke told him, then added, she knows about us snatching up this asshole. Look, they can probably trace where we are from my cell phone, so we need to figure out how we're getting inside this place and fast. I have an idea, said Ty. But we're going to have to leave him in the car. It's gonna take both of us. That's okay. You have another pair of cuffs. Yeah, I can secure him. Anyway, how far is he gonna get with that bad foot? 76. Turn around, put your hands behind your back, said Ty. Hanger did as he was told, shuffling around on the back seat so that his back was to Ty. Ty leaned inside the car, grabbing Hanger's wrists as he got ready to zip a fresh set of plasti cuffs on him. What's the big plan? Hanger asked him. One of you climbs the wall at the back and one climbs the wall at the front. Ty didn't respond. Or you ring the bell and pretend to be a delivery guy, Hanger continued. What's it to you? I'll tell you what it is to me. I don't want to be sitting trussed up like a turkey in the back of this car when the cops roll up. If he has the girl, he's hardly likely to be calling the cops, is he now? said Ty, securing one wrist. Fair point, conceded Hanger. But even if you get over the walls, you still have to get inside the house, and that ain't happening. Oh yeah, said Ty. Oh yeah, said Hanger. He has that place locked up like Fort Knox, and he doesn't just open the door to anyone, especially two dudes he doesn't know from Adam. Ty grabbed his wrists and spun him round on the seat so that Hanger was facing him. Locke wandered over to see why it was taking so long. What do you suggest, smart guy, said Ty. He knows me. I'm the one who brought her here, said Hanger, looking from Ty to Locke and back again. Like we could trust you, said Ty. You don't have to trust me. Think about it, you get the girl back and we're even. Unless you're going to rat on our deal. I help you get inside, you collect her, and I go free. No trust necessary. If you think about it, I'm the one who has to trust you, not the other way round. He shrugged his shoulders, showing his hands cuffed behind his back. You're going to have to take these off. Think the dude might figure something's up if he sees me cuffed up like this. Or he'll get turned on. Either way. They put Hanger in the back seat and walked away from the car, far enough that he wouldn't be able to overhear the conversation. What do you think, said Ty. I don't trust him but he has a point, said Locke, glancing back over to the car where Hanger was sitting quietly, head bowed. Yeah he does, said Ty. We can climb walls and try to break in, but if we can get this dude to open the front door for us, then it's pretty much job done. Search his crib, see if she's there and if she is, get her out. Or we could split the difference. What do you mean, said Ty. Hanger gets him to open the gates. We drive in, park at the side, but only one of us goes to the door with him. Looks less suspicious that way too. And one stays outside or comes in after. Yeah, maybe. What do you say? 
I'm not in the best of shape to be scaling a wall right now anyway, said Locke. They walked back over to the car. Locke opened the rear door and leaned in. He'll open the gate for you? I don't know, said Hanger. But it's worth a shot. Locke slammed the door closed again and turned to Ty. If he doesn't go for it, then we've lost the element of surprise. Then we call the cops. Lie and say we've seen her inside. That gives them probable cause to roll in there. Locke knew that you could spend hours debating different approaches to a problem, but at some stage you had to pick a plan of attack and commit to it. In any case, whatever route they went down would change in the process. It was that old military saw about no plan surviving first contact with the enemy. He opened Hanger's door again. Ty'll take the cuffs off you and you can ride up front. But I'll be back there right behind you, and if you try anything it won't be your foot I'll be aiming at. You hear me? Loud and clear, said Hanger. 77 They rolled up to the gate, Ty driving, Hanger riding up alongside him, and locked directly behind him, gun drawn but held low in the footwell so it wouldn't be visible. Ty lowered the window, leaned out and pressed the button on the gate panel. There was a wait and then a man's voice on the intercom. May I help you? Hanger leaned over Ty so he could be heard and presumably seen. Ty's hand came down to his holster, making sure that Hanger couldn't reach for it. Hey man, it's Hanger, I need to speak with you. Sorry, who did you say it was? Locke wasn't sure what he'd been expecting from a man who bought teenage girls from a pimp, but it hadn't been this. He sounded old and frail. If the man matched the voice, this would be a piece of cake. It's Hanger, he repeated, sounding irritated. Sorry, I don't think I know anyone by that name. Hanger sighed. I know you're looking right at us, he said, thumbing a tie in the driver's seat as he leaned a little further across. This here's my buddy. He has a girl he wants to move on, but it's a limited time deal. The freak didn't respond, but a second later the motor controlling the gates whirred into life, and the gates began to open. Ty drive through. Locke studied the place as they drove through up to the house. Behind the wall was a line of trees. Then there were more shrubs. The wall itself folded around the entire property. It was even higher at the rear, maybe 14 or 15 feet rather than the 12 feet at the front. This was clearly a man who either valued his privacy highly, had something to hide, or likely both. Not that walls mattered all that much these days, not when drones were so readily available. They reached the house. Ty turned the car around so that its nose was facing down the driveway, ready for a fast exit if it was needed. Locke made a note to locate the control panel for the gates once they were inside the house. They'd need the gates open on the way out. All three of them got out of the car. Ty walked side by side with Hanger. Locke hung back a little. At the door was a video doorbell, of the type that was now so common. Before they could press the button, the voice was back. Who's he? said the freak, referring to Locke. Just a buddy, said Hanger. He stays outside. Ty glanced back at Locke. Locke nodded and stepped off back to the car. Once they were inside and the freak was occupied, he would take a little tour of the outside and see if he could find another entry point. There was a click. The front door swung open. Ty walked in behind Hanger. The door closed on them, leaving Locke alone. He walked back to the car, figuring he'd stay there while he was likely being watched. Once some time had passed, he'd begin to circle the house and seek out an entry point. 78 Ty followed Hanger into a space that was more casino foyer than entrance hall. There was no sign of the freak. There was no sound of him, either. It was quiet, eerily so. Like the front gates, the front door was obviously remotely operated. Figuring that no one would walk in behind them with Locke standing guard outside, Ty kept his back to the front door as he scoped out the foyer. Ty picked out what he presumed was the home's owner from several large framed posters for magic shows, featuring a name that rang a very distant bell, Dirk Van Amstel. 
they showed an athletic-looking man with a mane of thick blonde hair carrying a whip in one hand, a revolver in the other. He was flanked by a fully grown Bengal tiger that was looming over an apparently terrified young showgirl. A voice called to them from further inside the house. Gentlemen, come on in. Hanger gave Ty an apologetic shrug. He's a little eccentric. Ty followed Hanger through the foyer, through a set of double doors, and into the living room. There was no sign of the freak here either. Ty was starting to get the feeling they were being played, and he didn't like it. He closed up on Hanger so Hanger could hear him without anyone else picking up on what he was about to say. Where do you think he has her stashed, said Ty. I don't know man, it's a big place and he's never given the grand tour. Anytime I've been here, I'm in and out. I'm kind of tight on time, Ty called out. If you're interested in this girl I got, then let's discuss terms. The voice came again, but this time Ty couldn't tell where it was coming from. It seemed to bounce from one part of the house to another and back again, as if it was rolling out from speakers in different rooms. I'm very sorry. I'll be with you momentarily, gentlemen. I do apologize for keeping you waiting, but your visit was somewhat unexpected, so you may have to bear with me. Screw this, thought Ty. He was here to find the girl, not play nice with some weirdo child molester. This place have a basement? he asked Hanger. No idea. Like I said, he never gave me the tour. Let's find out, shall we? Ty motioned for Hanger to walk back out into the entrance foyer. There was a staircase, but it only led up. Ty started opening doors. The first one led into a powder room, all marble and gold taps. He closed it again and walked down to the next door. Behind that door was a billiards room with a full-size table. There was a card table and a couple of old-school arcade video games. One was Ms. Pac-Man, and the other was something to do with a haunted house. Knowing whose house this was, the sight of gave him the creeps. He stepped back out and headed back in the direction of the living room. There was still no sign of the homeowner. Or Kristen for that matter. Leaving Hanger where he was, Ty walked to the end of the room where a pair of glass sliding doors led out to a deck. Beyond that was a large yard with a swimming pool. Ty stopped at the door and turned around so that back to the doors. Reaching back he found the key sitting in the lock and turned it. He grabbed the handle and still with his hand behind his back, pushed the door open a tiny fraction, just enough to be sure that he had unlocked the door. He dug his cell phone out and started to tap out a quick text to lock, letting him know that the rear deck door was open. Just as he was about to hit send, Hanger, who'd picked up a book from the coffee table and had been flicking through the pages, suddenly took off, hobbling as fast as he could towards a door off to one side of the fireplace. Ty sprinted off after him. As he ran, he tripped, banging his knee hard into the corner of a mahogany coffee table. Shrugging off the pain, Ty kept moving. Hanger reached the door, opened it, stumbled through and slammed it closed. Ty arrived a split second late. He grabbed the door handle, turned it and yanked it open. It didn't budge. He guessed it was another guest bathroom, and Hanger had locked it. He could force the door, even shoot through it, but Hanger's purpose had been getting them in here. He'd done that. What mattered was finding the girl, assuming she was here, and this wasn't all a snow job on Hanger's part. Ty decided to circle back round for Hanger and keep searching the house. He tapped send on the text to lock, moved to the other side of the room, opened another door, and stepped into the kitchen. At one end of the kitchen was a small dining area. Beyond that, another set of doors led out onto the same deck. Ty crossed to them and unlocked those doors too. Walking back into the kitchen area, he passed the range and island and opened another door. This one had a set of stairs that led down. Bingo, said Ty drawing his gun as he started down them. 79. Hanger sat with his back to the bathroom door and listened. He was pretty sure that Ty would have kicked the door in now. He'd obviously gone looking for the girl, which was fine by Hanger. He took out the cell phone that they returned to him so he could call the freak and forgotten to take back, and called him again moving away from the door and running water into the sink so no one outside the door would be able to hear him. 
these guys aren't with me. They want the girl, he said, the words rushing out as he braced for a boot or gunshots to come tearing through the door at any second. I would have given you a heads up, but they had a gun on me the whole time. Where are you now? The freak asked. Hanger told him. Okay, will you stay there until I tell you to come out? Okay, but be careful. These guys are crazy, man. I think they're like ex-military or something. Don't worry about me, said the freak. I have home court advantage. 80. Ty stood quietly at the top of the stairs leading down to the basement. He pulled the door closed behind him and took a moment to listen. Bar the background of air conditioning, the only thing he could hear was the rush of blood in his ears. It felt like old times, checking out locations for insurgents back when he was still in the corp. He drew his weapon and started slowly down the stairs. Every few steps he would stop and listen before taking the next few. Something, some inner sixth sense told him that she was down there. Maybe alive, maybe dead, but down there nonetheless. At the bottom of the stairs, there was an open hallway. Off to his left he could see the shimmer of a spa area, complete with hot tub and pool off to one side. There were fake rocks and a waterfall. It gave off a Playboy Mansion vibe that made him feel a little queasy. To Ty's right was a door. It was slightly ajar. He pushed it open with his foot and stepped into a maintenance room. He stepped back out and walked forward to a large mahogany door. Taking a breath, he grabbed the door handle and pushed it down. It opened into a room that was pitch black bar a slice of light from the hallway. Ty scanned it quickly, his eyes taking the space in with a single sweep. It looked like some kind of screening room slash home movie theater, only instead of regular movie seating, there were three beds that faced the screen. A metal trolley sat at the bottom of the middle bed. On the bed a young girl naked, her hands and feet shackled. His hand went to the wall. He found a lighting panel and slid up a couple of dimmer switches. It was Kristen Miller. Gun in hand and one holstered on his hip, the freak walked quickly over to the doors that led out onto the deck and turned the key, securing them from the inside. Next he walked through into the kitchen and locked those doors. No one would be walking in here from the outside. Next, his attention turned to the guest bathroom where Hanger was holed up. He had a decision to make. Hanger had brought these men here, but from what he'd seen so far, it hadn't been Hanger's decision. Kill him or let him live. Decisions, decisions. As she lay motionless on the bed, suddenly Kristen's head twisted to look at Ty. In that moment he knew that the look on her face would never leave him. She was alive. Her movement told him that, but her eyes were dead. Like the heart-pounding journey down the steps, the look on her face also brought him back to a war zone. He'd seen the same expression haunting the faces of terrorized civilians in Iraq. Reaching back he pulled the door closed and holstered his weapon. He held his hands up. Kristen, it's okay, I'm here to get you out of here okay. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to get you some help so you can go home. Slowly so as not to scare even more than she had been, he crossed to the bed. I'm going to take these bindings off you, he said, his eyes staying firmly on her face. Her eyes seemed to find some kind of focus. You're safe now, you understand me, he said. She didn't seem to react. Here, he said, backing up and grabbing a sheet from one of the other beds and draping it over her naked body. You're safe now, he told her. I'm not going to hurt you. Kristen gave the slightest of nods, tears forming in her eyes. Locke stood on the deck and pulled at the door. It didn't budge. He was sure this was the door that Ty had messaged him about. He tried again. It didn't move this time either. His hand felt for a catch or some other release. There wasn't any. He moved down the deck, staring through the glass for any sign of movement from inside. There was another set of doors that led into a kitchen area. He tried these doors. They wouldn't open either. This wasn't good. If Ty had opened them, then someone else had come along after and locked them again, someone inside the house that Ty wasn't aware of. 
Locke stepped back, searching for another way to gain entry. Ty stared at his cell phone screen. No signal, not even so much as a single flickering bar. That figured, thought Ty. The room was likely soundproofed, which would damp down any kind of cell signal. Glancing down at the metal trolley, something caught his eye. He tapped it with his finger, sliding the tiny key to the edge and sweeping it into his palm. If he was unable to get hold of Locke, then his next best move was to get Kristen out of here, even if he had to carry her back up the stairs. He sat down on the bed next to Kristen. He held up the key so she could see it. I'm going to have to touch you to free your hands, okay, he explained. Okay, she said, her voice hoarse from screaming. A few seconds later, she sat up, rubbing her wrists. She stopped to pull the sheet up to her shoulders before setting to work, freeing her ankles. Don't stand up too fast, okay, said Ty. Just take your time. I can't get it, she said, holding up the key as she struggled to free her left ankle. Here, said Ty, let me help you. He waited for her to show she was okay with it. He guessed she'd had a lot of men putting their hands on her without her consent. Even with good intentions, he didn't want to be another one. He bent over. Working the key in was fiddly, and it almost slipped from his hands. It's tricky. Let me try again, she said. He palmed her the key. She took it. This time it worked. She freed one ankle and then the other. The tiny accomplishment seemed to bring something human back into her face. Good job, said Ty as the door opened behind them, and a look of panic swept across Kristen's face as she stared over Ty's shoulder. Ty turned. His hand went down to his weapon a second too late, as he stared down the business end of the rifle. The freak stood in the doorway, the rifle raised to his shoulder, a red dot bouncing around Ty's chest. Behind him stood Hanger. Slide your gun over to me please, said the freak, stepping into the room. The door swung closed behind Hanger, but not all the way. Locke stepped back, took aim and fired a single shot. Pulling down his sleeve he punched through the jagged edge of glass still shivering at the edge of the doorframe, reached in and unlocked the door. He pushed it open and stepped inside, glass crunching under the soles of his shoes. There was no sign of anyone. The whole place was as quiet as a graveyard. Locke stayed close to the walls, moving slowly from room to room searching for Ty. With no other option Ty bent down, placed his gun on the floor and slid it across the floor. The freak told Hanger to pick it up. Now hand it to me, the freak instructed Hanger. Reluctantly, Hanger passed it over. The freak lowered his rifle for a second and made the handgun safe, tucked the ejected magazine into his pocket and kicked the weapon into the corner of the room. The two men may have been united in a common cause, but it was clear to Ty that the freak wasn't about to trust Hanger with a loaded gun. Ty figured that maybe there was a way he could exploit that distrust. Ignoring Hanger entirely, he addressed the freak. I'm here for the girl, said Ty. You let me walk out with her, and we can forget all of this. That drew a laugh from Hanger. Oh yeah? Be quiet, said the freak. I'm thinking. Kill him, Hanger urged. Yeah, I don't think that would be too smart. Cops are on their way, said Ty. No, they ain't, said Hanger. You forget I was right there in the car with you and your buddy while you were talking about whether to call them or not. I called them as soon as I found her, said Ty. That would be quite a trick, said the freak. There's no signal down here. And even if you did, what difference does it make? If you called them, then I'm going to prison. That's what I'm talking about, said Hanger. Let me do it. Where's your friend? The freak asked Ty. Ty shrugged. How would I know? Never mind, we'll get to him in good time, said the freak. Hanger stalked over to where Kristen was perched on the edge of the bed. The freak just watched him, expressionless. Hanger reached down and touched Kristen's face. She recoiled. He grabbed her hair and yanked her head back. Know what, he said, looking back over to the freak. I think this one here is cursed. She's been nothing but trouble since I met her. 
Tai shifted his feet, fists clenched, ready to pick Hanger up and slam him through one of the walls. The freak waved the barrel at Tai. Don't be stupid. Tai took a step back. The vibe in the room had shifted. It was as if Kristen's renewed terror had released something into the air. The look on Hanger's face was one of pure rage, but the freak seemed wrapped, like a switch had been flipped. Tai could see that he was getting off on the whole scene. All Tai knew was that even if he had to take a bullet, there was no way he was going to stand here and watch this. Then he saw Kristen's hand. It was down by her side, fingers bunched up. A shiny scalpel blade protruded from between her thumb and first finger. Locke eased down the steps. He could hear voices. He followed the sound. There was a door. It was closed, but not all the way. There was maybe an inch of a gap where it hadn't been pulled to. He couldn't catch the words, but he could hear Hanger. Locke slowed his breath, listening as hard as he could. He could hear another man's voice. He knew it wasn't Ty, so that left only one other option. Raising his gun, he crept as close as he could to the door. He had no idea of what he would see on the other side. He didn't know the layout. Barring an educated guess, he didn't know who was in there besides Hanger and the freak. Were they armed? He'd have to assume that they were. Once he stepped through the door, he'd have a second, maybe less. He weighed his options. Presumably they'd come out at some point. When they did, he could take them out. He stepped back, looking for somewhere out of immediate view of anyone opening the door. Hanger sat next to Kristen on the bed. She scooted away from him. Oh come on, you're not going to get all shy on me now, are you? said Hanger, letting go of her neck and running his hand down her back. The freak seemed totally entranced. Ty noticed that his finger had moved from the trigger. There was maybe 15 feet between them. It was a lot of distance to cover without taking a bullet, but if there was a distraction. Kristen still had the scalpel down by her side, where Hanger couldn't see it. Come on kid, thought Ty, willing her to use it. Hanger's hand ran lower. Every fiber of Ty's being was screaming for him to intervene, to not let this happen. But if he went for Hanger now, he'd be cut down by the rifle. Hanger's hand kept moving. Kristen crossed her legs. Hanger laughed. Like this is new, he said. Kristen's hand came up lightning fast, punching up towards his face, slashing across his cheek, drawing an immediate spray of blood. Everything now was happening fast. Hanger screamed. His hand flew to his face. Kristen froze, as if she hadn't had a plan beyond the first cut. Hanger stood up and drew back his fist, rings glittering as he took aim at Kristen. Ty pushed off, aiming for the freak. He raised the rifle, his finger moving back to the trigger. As Ty took two steps, the door flew open. A shape appeared, gun punched out. The freak took aim, dead center at Ty's chest. Two shots rang out in quick succession. 81. Locke squeezed out a third shot from his sig. The man holding the rifle was already on the way down, his legs folded under him as he fell forward, blood pouring from the gunshot wounds in his back. Ty's momentum kept him moving. He tripped over the barrel of the rifle and fell on top of the freak. Across the room on the bed, Kristen struggled to free herself from hanger as fists rained down on her. Before Locke could swing around, Ty was up and launching himself full tilt at Hanger as Kristen screamed, blood pouring down from her scalp and into her eyes. Locke took aim, but there was no clean shot. Ty was too close. Hanger reached for something on the bed as Ty tackled him from behind, wrapping his arms around Hanger's leg and dragging him away from Kristen. Hanger's hand came up. There was a glint of steel as he sliced the scalpel down onto the top of Ty's head, opening skin. Ty's hand came up and closed around the back of Hanger's neck. Ty slammed Hanger's head down onto the edge of the bed. He did it again. Then a third time. The scalpel dropped from Hanger's hand as Kristen kept screaming. Ty got to his feet and swung a kick, catching Hanger in the ribs, pushing the oxygen from his lungs. Ignoring the blood pouring from his head, Ty continued his onslaught, huge heavy kicks thumping into Hanger's body. 
Locke crossed the room. Ty was in the red zone. If Locke didn't stop him, then Ty was on the way to beating Hanger to death. Ty Ty shouted Locke. Another kick and a hard stomp down onto Hanger's back, and Ty finally stopped. He looked around at Locke. She doesn't need to see this, said Locke. Get her out of here and call the cops. Ty took a few steps back. Hanger was on the floor, curled up in a ball. Locke grabbed a sheet from another bed and threw it over to Ty. Ty passed it to Kristen. Ty gently helped her back up and onto her feet. He gave her the fresh sheet to drape around her. He stayed behind her as she wobbled uncertainly to the door. As Ty followed her out, he looked back at his partner. I got it, said Locke. Ty walked out, closing the door. Locke surveyed the room, looking for the cameras that were almost certainly embedded in the walls. 82. Kristen sat on the couch, dressed in a robe, as Ty knelt before her. Put your head up like this, he said, dabbing at the cuts across her face from Hanger's rings. This is gonna sting, okay? She looked at him, a wounded animal, unsure of whether she could trust him. Wincing, she closed her eyes as he dabbed alcohol on a deep cut just below one of her eyes. I'm sorry, he said. The sound of a single gunshot from the basement made her jump. Ty looked at her. You don't have to worry about him anymore, said Ty. A few minutes later, Locke appeared. He looked gaunt and hollowed out. He took my gun from me, said Locke. I had to shoot him with the rifle. Ty nodded and went back to tending to Kristen. Cops asked Locke. On their way, said Ty. Locke walked over to the window. He took out his cell phone. Yeah, it's me, he said to Carmen. We found her. 83. The next day. Propped up by pillows, Sooth reached over to click the button on the morphine pump. The machine beeped, indicating that she'd had all the pain relief she was going to get for the time being. That's some weak-ass shit, she said, death staring the morphine pump and wondering if there was a way of tinkering with it so that it was a little more generous. The thought disappeared as she happened to glance up at the small television set mounted in the corner of the room. Frantically, she looked around for the remote control. She shifted around, a sharp jab of pain rippling through her abdomen, as she reached over to her locker and grabbed it. On screen was an old booking photograph of Hanger. It was a few years old, but his was a face she was destined to never forget. She jabbed frantically at the volume control on the remote so she could hear the news report. Gowdy is believed to have been shot by one of two private security operators hired by the victim's family. According to police department sources, Gowdy is believed to have led the two unnamed men to the home of retired Las Vegas entertainer Dirk Van Amstel, where the young girl was being held captive. Sources have linked Gowdy to a substantial number of sex trafficking cases, some including underage girls, and law enforcement are also examining Van Amstel's property for human remains linked to the disappearance of a number of young women in Las Vegas spanning an almost 30-year period. All Sooth could think was he's dead. Finally, he's dead. Back on screen, a news report was winding up. Both private security operators have now been released from custody, and it's believed that given the circumstances, the district attorney will not be looking to bring charges against either of them. Sooth clicked off the television and looked up at the ceiling. She would have thought the news would make her happy, especially after what Hanger had done to her. It hadn't. Sure she felt relief, and she was happy that Kristen had made it out, but the news stirred up other emotions in her. It would take her some time to process all of this. It sounded strange, but Hanger had been one of the few constants in her life. Now he was gone she would have to face life alone. The idea both scared and thrilled her. There was a knock at the door. One of the nurses appeared. She was carrying a huge bunch of flowers. Some guy dropped by with these for you, said the nurse. There's an envelope too. What guy, said Sooth. She couldn't think of anyone who would be visiting her, never mind, bringing flowers. I don't know, he was real tall black guy. 
Good looking too, smiled the nurse, handing Sue the bulging brown envelope. He was very insistent that I give you this. Hey, do you want me to put these in water for you? Sure, said Sooth, opening the envelope. She saw what it was inside and hastily shoved it under the sheet as the nurse found a vase, filled it with water and put the flowers in it. It was only when Sooth was alone again that she took the envelope back out. It was full of hundred-dollar bills. There was easily twenty thousand dollars. There was no accompanying note. No explanation. Just the money. 84. The authorities in Vegas had insisted that they would oversee Kristen Miller's return to her family in Los Angeles. Locke didn't object. He and Ty had done their job. There were people much better equipped than them to deal with the aftermath. After being taken from the house while he and Ty were being questioned, a process that went on for a couple of days, Kristen was taken to hospital to be examined. Her physical injuries were relatively superficial. They would heal. The real damage she had sustained was psychological. Those injuries would take a lot more time to heal, if they ever truly did. Locke still found it hard to comprehend how, in a matter of days, a teenage girl could be plunged into such a nightmare world. He'd asked Adorno about it, as she was escorting him out of the main LVMPD building, on South Martin Luther King Boulevard. Sometimes it takes weeks, sometimes months, but yeah a lot of times it's days, she said. Once a trafficker has found a victim, they want them making money. She paused for a moment. Part of it, like what happened with Kristen, is shock and awe. Traumatize them so much and so fast that they don't have any time to react. People think, well, why don't they just go to the police, but it's not that simple. There's the shame and embarrassment and the thinking that they might not be believed. Before they know it, they're in way over their head. What's going to happen to Sooth? asked Locke. That's not up to me, said Adorno. That's a call for the district attorney to make. She was a part of it, but she was a victim once upon a time too. That's what makes this stuff difficult. Locke's car pulled up. Ty sounded the horn. He'd been released an hour before. That's my ride. You'll understand if I don't thank you, said Adorno. You're lucky to be going home. He didn't know if she meant he was lucky to be alive, or lucky to still be a free man. Not that it mattered. She would have been correct on both counts. Locke gave a curt nod. He started to walk over to the car. When he stopped and looked back, Adorno had already gone back inside. He got in the passenger seat. Let me guess, said Ty. She doesn't ever want to see us in Vegas again. I think that was kind of implied, said Locke. Ty sat there. Locke knew him well enough to know that he had something on his mind. What, said Locke. Please tell me you got this whole pro bono thing out of your system, Ryan. I don't think Carmen's going to have it any other way. Good, said Ty. Because I just took a call from one of my Chinese clients out in Arcadia. His son's gone missing, assumed kidnapped. Triad involvement. Locke stared at him. What did I just say about Carmen? Ty smiled and broke out laughing. I'm just fooling with you. He just bought a place up in Montecito and wants someone to overhaul security at the new house. You're a real asshole sometimes. Only sometimes, said Ty. I must be slipping. He gunned the engine and pulled out onto the boulevard. Let's go home, brother, said Ty as they merged into the late afternoon traffic. About the author To research his books, Sean Black has trained as a bodyguard in the UK and Eastern Europe, spent time inside America's most dangerous supermax prison, Pelican Bay in California, undergone desert survival training in Arizona, and ventured into the tunnels under Las Vegas. A graduate of Oxford University, England, and Columbia University in New York, Sean lives in Dublin, Ireland. When he's not writing, Sean trains in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. In 2019, he became the first amputee in Ireland to be awarded his blue belt. 
He competes regularly, including at the 2022 European Championships in Rome, where he fought able-bodied athletes and took two bronze medals. His Ryan Locke and Byron Tiber thrillers have been translated into Dutch, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish.